Lily for My Enemy, a Lockhart Sweet Regency Romance, written by Laura Rollins, narrated by Catherine Vinclair. To Dad, my love of story began with you. Happy birthday. Chapter 1 Felix Lockhart, Earl of Sutby, cringed. He crossed his legs and momentarily dropped his gaze to hide his grimace. The lady performing Beethoven's Les Adieux smacked each note with a vengeance. Yes, the piece was fast-paced and quite challenging, but did that mean she needed to attack the pianoforte, as though it had insulted her gown? Felix had to uncross his legs almost immediately. His new, overly stiff waistcoat made it hard to remain in any position that wasn't ramrod straight for long. His overly high shirt points were bothering him too, and that smell. Blast, did every woman in the room have to be covered in perfume? Felix returned his gaze to the stage. He knew he'd met the lady performing more than once, and he was quite sure he'd even danced with her at one of the various balls he attended this season. Still, he could not recall her name. Ah, well, at least she stood and bowed at the end of the first movement. Felix wasn't sure he could have taken hearing the last two movements of the piece emotionlessly pounded out. He clapped politely with the rest of the full room. The lady curtsied again and returned to her seat. Felix's gaze stayed on the pianoforte. It was nothing short of a beautiful, well-crafted instrument. Shame none of the ladies here tonight seemed the least bit interested in drawing out the pianoforte's best tones. Another young lady took to the stage and began a piece by Hummel. The opening notes were promising. Felix leaned in a bit. But no, the woman almost immediately degraded into pounding as hard as her predecessor. Felix let out a sigh and leaned back in his chair. What was the point of having a musicale if everyone only played the notes and no one cared about the music? Felix's mouth twisted to the side and his eyes began roving across the room. The music hit several high notes. They ought to have been soft, lyrical. Instead, they were shrill and piercing. Though Felix was watching the audience and not the performer, he still had to fight another cringe. A young lady, sitting two rows in front of Felix and off to his right, also cringed. Her soft pink mouth tightened up, puckering, and below her loose blonde curls, her eyes seemed to squint from the harsh note. Felix suddenly wanted to chuckle. Oh, he could relate to that reaction. The song ended, and again, the audience clapped politely. The hostess moved to the front of the room, thanked everyone for coming, and announced that the evening performances were over. Felix stood, a bit miffed. He had hoped to enjoy some of the music tonight. The audience swirled around him, talking and slowly moving toward the back doors. He shook his head. He shouldn't be so persnickety. What would Penelope say if she knew her oldest son was silently criticizing so many young ladies? She'd give him a dark scowl and tell him not to be such a popinjay. That's what she would do. His gaze moved back to the lovely instrument, now deserted and forgotten by the audience. It had been ages since he'd sat down to play. Accomplishment at the pianoforte was not something most men could claim. Those very few who could, such as himself, didn't claim it in company. For the past several years, ever since father had decided it was time Felix become a man and ready himself to take the family seat in the House of Lords, Felix had had next to no time to play, even in private. Sutby! Felix turned at the greeting. Great. Mr. Comby as if the evening couldn't have got any more tedious. Felix bowed quickly. Good evening. Dressed in mostly grey, with his dark hair set ever so carefully, 
Combi executed an equally shallow bow. I had not expected to see you in town for another month at least. His tone was friendly, but there was a harshness about the edges. Though I suppose just being in town doesn't necessarily guarantee a presence in Parliament. Might be a month more before I see you there regardless. Felix's hand tightened into a fist behind his back. If Combi hadn't noticed his attendance even once these past several weeks. Felix wasn't sure why anyone thought the man bright enough to be changing laws. Furthermore, though Felix may not be a good enough man to suit his father, he nonetheless didn't appreciate Combi hinting that he'd been lax in his responsibilities. And I did not expect to see you anywhere except Parliament. With all the work that you must have in front of you, if you actually believe you can change the tax law, well, I had wondered if you would not be setting up a bedroll in Westminster itself. Combi laughed, though there was no joy and even less sincerity in the sound. Tax reform is coming, Sutby, he said with a clenched smile. His whole face somewhat resembled a grinning baboon. We, in the House of Commons, have more power than you lords like to admit. You keep telling yourself that, Felix said with an equally tight smile. Though he'd never say as much aloud, he couldn't disagree with Combi on that point. For over a century now, the House of Commons had grown in popularity and power. That did not mean, however, that they could pass laws without the House of Lords' consent. And that meant convincing people like his father, the Marquis of Ramport, that changes were necessary. A young lady moved up beside Combi and looped her hand through his arm. Thank you for waiting for me, Combi. Are you ready to go? Felix glanced over at the woman. His eyes widened slightly. It was the same woman who'd cringed at the music along with him. Of course, she didn't know he'd also been cringing, so it wasn't as though she'd done it with him, just at the same time as him. Her lips were an even more beguiling light pink when seen closer up, and her blonde curls were even more lovely. She had an oval face and a long, slender neck and arms. She was tall for a woman, standing no less than an inch shorter than Combi, making her probably only a small hand span shorter than Felix himself. Her gaze met his, and she raised a delicate eyebrow. Sut be, Combi said. Felix blinked once and forced his eyes away, silently berating himself. Staring was bad form, no matter which side of Parliament one sat in. I would like to introduce you to Miss Hunt, daughter of Mr. Charles Hunt. Hunt? Cats. Mr. Hunt was father's most outspoken opponent and a prominent member of Commons. Her father, Mr. Hunt, allowed me to escort her to the musicale tonight. Combi's chest puffed out. The pompous idiot. No doubt Combi was trying to use a connection with Miss Hunt to further his own advancement. His gaze moved back to the woman in question. She offered her hand, and Felix bowed over it politely. A beautiful woman like Miss Hunt didn't deserve to be used as a rung on a political ladder. Miss Hunt, it is an honor. Is it? She asked. I understand that your father has rather declared war on any tax reform. Pardon my boldness, but in today's world, is not such a stance rather more mulish than helpful? Lud, Miss Hunt had a tongue on her. Felix wrapped his hands behind his back. After all, one good lashing deserved another. Pardon my boldness, Miss Hunt, but your father's suggested changes would not only decrease the Crown's ability to keep up roads and parks, but also directly lead to the endangerment of all of England's citizens. Endangerment? Miss Hunt, apparently, was not one to back down. How do you propose to support that claim, pray tell? Crime is on the rise all across the country. There is talk of establishing an organized, trained force to police the streets. 
Such a thing would greatly decrease crime, yet will not be possible if your father and those like him have their way. Combi tisked. I never had you for a browbeater, Sutby. Here you are, the genteel of the group, speaking so to a woman of high breeding. Felix leaned back slightly. Blast it all, Combi was right again. I apologize, Miss Hunt. I'm afraid I've spent rather too much time in Parliament these past few weeks. After so many debates between Lords and Commons, I'm forgetting my manners. Then perhaps, she said with a smile, you should spend less time debating and more time listening. That should help you remember your manners yet again. Manners in Commons? That was a joke. More like he'd find manners yet again among his peers in Lords. Miss Hunt looked at him, eyebrow raised and mouth twisted to the side, as though goading him to say as much. Felix opened his mouth for that express purpose, but stopped himself. Penelope and father would not be pleased with him if they heard he was speaking so to a lady. If there was one thing he'd been raised to never forget, it was that he was the heir apparent. As such, he was never to be anything less than an upstanding gentleman. Instead of returning tit for tat, Felix gave her his most charming smile and bowed elegantly, if a bit arrogantly. No doubt you are right. Standing straight, Felix addressed both annoyingly staunch common supporters. If you will now excuse me, I have an early day tomorrow. You see, someone has to keep the country from falling apart. Not giving either of them time to rebuke, Felix spun on his heel and headed away, toward the distant side of the room. Most of those who had attended tonight's musicale had already left, leaving the room nearly empty and nearly as silent. Felix shook his head. Learn manners from attending commons, indeed. What a notion. Had Miss Hunt ever sat so much as a toe inside Westminster? Probably not. Ladies rarely did. If she had, she'd understand full well that the men elected to the seats in commons, including her own father, were often uncouth and short-sighted. Felix glanced about. He was alone in the room. Everyone, including Combi and Miss Hunt, had left. His gaze moved from the door they'd all exited through to the pianoforte standing forgotten near one wall. His lips pursed tight. What he wouldn't give for ten minutes alone with his music. Nothing relaxed him as playing did. Felix moved over to stand next to the instrument. Granted, he could return home and play there. Ridge Court House had an expensive pianoforte. As of late, though, every time Felix sat down to play, father saw it as a very loud announcement that Felix was free and wanting to be interrupted. Felix played three notes, the opening of a melody he dearly loved. The music pulled on him, as strong as any siren's call. He sat down on the bench, just a few measures, with all the guests having left, or visiting near the house front foyer, no one would hear him. He would play Beethoven's Les Adieux. After hearing it performed such as it had been earlier today, precisely accurate, but heartless, Felix wanted to remind his ears how it ought to sound. He placed both hands on the keys and played. Chapter 2 Miss Jocelyn Hunt pulled her wrap tighter around her shoulders. It was unusually warm for early spring, but that didn't mean it was actually warm. Quite right, quite right. Combi droned on beside her, nodding in furious agreement to another member of Commons. She knew the man only vaguely and had found him no more memorable tonight than the other half-dozen times they'd met. Her lips pulled to the side and she glanced about the front foyer with a sigh. She knew Combi well enough to know his conversation was not going to end any time soon. 
neither gentleman noticed when she stepped away from the conversation. Normally, she relished talk of tax reform and abolishing civil disabilities, but tonight she was feeling quite worn thin. It was most likely due to the letter she'd received from Mama earlier that day. Mama was optimistic in word, but Jocelyn sensed a tone of exhaustion and of worry under the surface of her words. Though Mama's fever would often abate for a day or two, it always returned. How could the woman not be weary? Or perhaps a person truly could get too much of a good thing, and Jocelyn had overfilled her brain for the day. Jocelyn moved further down the hall, which stretched away from the foyer. There were several very well done portraits of the host's ancestors. What could those men have thought about the current state of the country? What, with the first king's insanity and now Prissy at the helm, the monarchy had lost much of the people's trust? Nonetheless, the House of Lords couldn't seem to realize that such was true. Those men held on to the rights of the monarchy and titled gentry to dictate life for all of England's citizens like they were holding on to life itself. She shook her head. For them, it probably felt like they were. Soft notes floated down the hallway and reached her. Someone was playing the pianoforte. But who? Perhaps one of the younger debutantes of the season had been too shy before. But figured with no one about, now they could pretend to be playing before the group. Jocelyn's heart softened. Perhaps, with a little practice, the mystery someone might have the courage to play next time. Jocelyn moved farther down the hall toward the music room. Whomever it was certainly should not feel the least bit shy about performing. The song was Les Adieux. It had been played earlier that evening. Jocelyn had heard the piece enough these last five years that she would never fail to recognize it. Yet, this current performance was nothing like the one she'd heard earlier. This time, the song flowed. The rises and falls worked hand in hand to bring a sense of full-hearted, bittersweet farewell. She didn't want to startle or scare whichever shy debutante was playing now, so Jocelyn slowly turned the knob and opened the music room door, careful not to make any noise. She peeked around the door. Two servants were silently removing the rows of chairs. She looked further into the room, toward the stage. Jocelyn's mouth fell open. Not only was the performer not a woman at all, but it was Lord Sutby, of all people. His brow was creased in concentration. She wasn't surprised. Les Adieux was not an easy piece. That he could play it at all astounded her. Men did not normally apply themselves to such a decidedly feminine activity. But to play something as complicated as this, he must have spent countless hours for years on end at the instrument. The song grew mournful as he transitioned into the second movement. Jocelyn found herself walking over, closer to him and the music. The melody filled the room, pushing aside all awareness of chairs and servants, of floors and walls. Jocelyn stopped beside the pianoforte and closed her eyes. She had not heard it so elegantly played since she and father had come to London, not since they'd left their country home, not since they'd left mother. The music stopped abruptly. Jocelyn opened her eyes and found Lord Sutby staring at her. His hands were suspended an inch above the keys, a wary expression marring his brow. They stared at each other, wordless. Finally, Jocelyn looked away. My mother plays that piece. He didn't respond. She glanced toward him once more. He still watched her with that crease in his forehead. He was probably wondering if she was going to ridicule him for having such a feminine, hidden talent. After their earlier disagreement, she couldn't blame him. 
Her lips ticked up at the thought of their previous conversation. It had been the only part of the evening which she had enjoyed. You play remarkably well. For a man, you mean. His guard was up. She did have a tendency to do that to people. For anyone, Les Adieux is not a simple sonata. No, it isn't. Jocelyn's fingers twisted about each other. This was starting to feel awkward. It means farewell, you know, the song. Beethoven's eulogy to his friend, lost in France during the Revolution. You know the history of it. Apparently, Lord Sutby was far more than merely a mindless puppet. Wouldn't father be shocked? Sutby stood and moved around closer to her. I know it. Gracious, were all members of Lords this intimidating? Or perhaps it was just the fact that, unlike most men, he was tall enough to truly look down at her. My mamma will be pleased to hear that someone else cares about the history of the piece as much as she does. The song has been her favourite since she first heard it several years ago. That surprises me. Why would that surprise you? The piece was lovely and had a sweet message. Sutby folded his arms. If anything, it is a stark reminder of what happens when a country turns its back on those who have protected it for centuries. She lifted an eyebrow. So it's a political statement then? Most assuredly. Well. Jocelyn drew herself up fully. She might have known the heir apparent to a notable seat in Lords would take such a stance. To listen to you, sir, one would think you quite stuffed of hubris. They must have served it beside the punch tonight. That would explain Combe's attendance. It was clear he didn't come for the music. Jocelyn scowled. Staying demure was never something she'd been good at. At least he knows how to speak to a lady. All of Parliament knows how to speak to a lady. But if that's all it takes now to be elected... Sutby shrugged. Who am I to suggest the bar should have been set a bit higher? It seems you won't be able to say all of Parliament once you take your father's seat, though. Jocelyn placed her hands on her hips. The columns are filled with comments about you, Lord Sutby. Calling you the son who won't grow up. The boy who tags behind his father, but isn't ready to fill his shoes. What will lords do when your father hands his seat to you? He didn't respond, but she could see she'd hit a sore spot, for his mouth twisted and he turned slightly red. After all the horrid things he'd said to her about her father, she didn't care two straws. I suppose I should thank you. She continued. Once you do take your father's seat, it will be that much easier for Commons to change this country into a land the people of England can be proud of. Without giving him time to respond, she turned and strode towards the doors, head held high. Chapter 3 I heard last night was a horrid bore, Cassandra said, sitting up tall in the settee beside Felix. Her tight, blonde curls were loose around her shoulders this morning, proof she wasn't expecting any visitors. He only shrugged. I told you not to go, she persisted. And you were right, I should have listened. It wasn't often he agreed with his sister. She was nearly eight years his junior after all, but everything regarding last night had been a far cry from the norm. Most especially, his introduction and consequent conversations with Miss Hunt. Say that again, Cassandra crooned. What? With his mind wrapped up on reliving yet again, his spats with a certain tall, blonde woman, Felix couldn't remember what he and Cassandra had been saying. She turned her scowl on him, sticking out her bottom lip. Say it again. Felix held up his hands, completely at a loss. Say what again? She sighed, which almost sounded like a growl. Brothers. He had no idea what that had been about, but he wasn't going to trudge further into it. He had smarts enough to steer clear, at the very least. 
how was your trip here? She scowled at him for several more moments, then shook her head and leaned back against the settee. Fine. Sheldon and Marianne are settled and happy as larks. Felix nodded his approval. His brother and his new wife had faced a horrible situation and had managed to come out safely on the other side. If anyone deserved to be as happy as larks, they did. The roads were clear enough. But at least Venetia didn't come down with one of her headaches along the road, Felix added. The youngest of the five Lockhart siblings was rather prone to illness. Felix worried about her often. Suppose one of these days a simple fever turned serious. Cassandra sighed more loudly than before. <sighs> I swear she gets fevers just to annoy me. You know that's not true. Cassandra had the decency to look a touch ashamed. Well, it seems that way sometimes. She took a sip of tea. Now, all I have to do is inform you that Quentin has returned to his silly sheep farm, as determined as ever to force that place into making a profit, and you are all caught up on the news. Well, that only took twenty minutes. What are we going to speak of for the rest of the season? Cassandra's smile grew wide. I can think of a lady or two. Ladies? Felix slouched low in his chair and tipped his head back. Cassandra, if you're going to inundate me with more talk of society than I already get every evening, I'm going to go stark mad. We very well can't proceed with our challenge if we aren't going to discuss a lady or two. Our challenge? She shot him a hard stare. Right. The challenge. Soon after Sheldon and Marianne had gotten engaged, Cassandra and Felix had promised to introduce one another to as many of the opposite sex as humanly possible. The challenge was to find the other a spouse before their own was found. I agreed to be introduced to every debutante in town. I never agreed to gossip about them over tea all afternoon long. You say gossip like it's a bad thing. He shook a finger at Cassandra. Words can hurt. He should know. He'd been on the biting end of them only last night. Was the whole town truly asking about how he was failing to fill his father's shoes? Did everyone see him as a pup, incapable of being the noble marquise his forefathers had been? It was humbling and made his stomach sick. I don't recommend we dissect every acquaintance. I hope you don't actually believe me so shallow as to nitpick hair and dresses and polite demure laughs. How about dancing? Felix teased. I would so hate to be married to a woman who couldn't dance most gracefully. Now who's being shallow? Cassandra asked, her tone light and innocent. Felix leaned forward in his chair. And how about you? Tell me all about that list I know you have, dictating everything you want from a husband. Cassandra suddenly went very silent, though she tried to hide her lack of rebuff behind another sip of tea. Hiding wouldn't work on Felix, though. He knew his sister too well. Let me guess, he said. Tall, dark, handsome, filthy rich... I'm sure that's close to the top of your list. Enjoys buying dresses and silk slippers for the woman he loves. Has a good seat. Provides ample material for gossip. Oh, stop that. Felix chuckled. Am I wrong? Cassandra pursed her lips and turned up her nose. Of course you're wrong. All right. Which of those things aren't actually on your list? And I know when you're lying, Cassandra. She only turned back to her tea. Felix laughed even harder this time. Well, it doesn't matter, Cassandra said. Here's how we're going to do things. There's a plan. He was thinking he'd just be sure to introduce her to any gentleman he had high opinions of whenever the opportunity arose. He hadn't exactly seen this as a military exercise. Yes, there's a plan. How do you expect to find a wife if you don't have a plan? Whatever you say, General Lockhart. 
We'll start tonight at the Henderson's Ball. She was serious. She didn't even scowl at him for the General Lockhart remark. This morning, I made several calls, and I already have quite the list of ladies I want you to meet. Last. Don't you worry, she continued. I'll be sure not to introduce you to so many women that you can't dance with them all at least once. That would be poor form. I can't have a brother of mine meeting debutantes and not dancing with them. Are you sure? Because if you introduce me to a lady, and I'm quite certain from the start that she isn't the one, there is no reason to get her hopes up, right? Cassandra slowly swung her head over toward him, eyes wide. She looked thoroughly appalled. Felix Samuel Lockhart? You know perfectly well to do so would be a slight. Of a surety he knew. It was just so fun needling his overly dramatic sister. I'll dance with them all. Gads, had he really just said that? Cassandra was good. She was getting him to commit to all sorts of things he didn't want to do. Excellent. She took another sip of tea, triumph showing on her face. We best get there early then. My list is not short. Fine. They were here. Felix tried to keep a smile on his face and at least seem like he was excited at the prospect of dancing. Every blast it set. Cassandra strode into the ballroom with her arm linked through his. Father and Penelope had stayed behind to talk with some old friends in the hallway. But Cassandra couldn't wait to get started with her evening task. It would seem, and had pushed the two of them on ahead. Venetia, unfortunately, was suffering from another headache and had chosen to stay home. Penelope had wanted to stay home with her youngest, but Cassandra had insisted that she, as a young unmarried woman, needed a matron around and not just a father. Now, first on the list is Lady Helen Alsport, Cassandra said. Felix nodded. Oldest of five daughters. A dowry the size of a veritable fortune. Then it will be Lady Christina Brimsby, fourth daughter of Lord and Lady Sutters. She only made her bows two weeks ago. After that, we'll find Lady Anne Goldsmith, only child, heiress, but prone to fits of vapours. Very good, Cassandra said, her voice full of approval. You aren't as worthless as you make everyone think you are after all. Felix kept his voice flat. What a compliment. What he wouldn't admit, not for the life of him, was that he'd learned most of those things only that afternoon. After spending the better part of two hours convincing himself that Miss Hunt had been wrong and that he was not the centre of more than one column in the paper, Felix had finally given in and just opened the blasted paper, and then yesterday's paper and the one from the day before that, to find out. That was the only reason he happened to know about the woman Cassandra had spoken of. He had also learned, much to his dismay, that Miss Hunt had not been far off the mark. Society, it seemed, was watching him with bated breath, and not much confidence. Stupid title. Stupid, heir-apparent nonsense. If he had been born second or third instead of first, his life would have been so vastly different. Just take his two brothers, Sheldon and Quintin, for example. The only thing in the papers about either of them was Sheldon's recent marriage to Marianne. One article. And that one had been a shining, celebratory expose on the wonders of hard-fought-for love. Good evening, Helen. Cassandra reached out to a young woman wearing pastel green and pressed their cheeks together. I was so hoping I'd see you here tonight. And it had begun. Felix pushed against his smile, trying to anchor it in place. The sooner he forced his mouth to believe that anything less then an unequivocally pleased expression was not acceptable, the better. Lady Helen Alsport curtsied prettily as Cassandra introduced her to Felix. 
He, in turn, bowed as nicely as he could, despite being already bored. As he righted himself, his gaze was tugged towards someone past Lady Elsport's shoulder. Another woman stood not far off, her blonde hair pinned fully atop her head, with only two small curls trailing down the back of her neck. Miss Hunt, she was here. Well, why shouldn't she be? The Hindersons were well known in town and well liked. Undoubtedly, they had invited nearly all of London to tonight's crush. That's what it would be called in tomorrow's paper, which he would not read, despite Miss Hunt's suggestion, a crush, because nearly all of London was present, and if nearly all of London was present, it only stood to reason that Miss Hunt, Cassandra, tugged on his arm. Don't you agree? Felix looked back at his sister and Lady Allsport. He hadn't heard a word they'd been saying. Cassandra caught his eye with a steel look of her own and nodded her head ever so slightly up and down. It was a subtle movement, but for a brother who knew his sister well, a clear command to agree with whatever had just been said. Absolutely, Felix proclaimed without hesitation, without a doubt. Lady Osport pinked quite becomingly and dropped her gaze. Thank you, sir. I did spend quite a bit of time deciding which colour would best suit for tonight. She ran both hands over her skirt. Her dress. They were discussing her dress. Ah, well, what could a man expect at a ball and with a young lady he'd only just met? It's not as though he were at a musicale speaking with a lady who was the daughter of his own father's political foe. Felix's gaze moved up past Lady Allsport. Miss Hunt was looking directly at him. Felix dropped his gaze immediately. He needed to stop thinking about Miss Hunt and be more present with those around him. The orchestra gave the unmistakable notes of a set about to start. Would you care to dance, Lady Allsport? Felix asked, knowing full well he was interrupting his sister, but caring little. He'd managed, yet again, to be completely oblivious to what they were discussing. Lady Allsport smiled, a demure smile if ever he'd seen one. I'd be delighted, Lord Sutby. He extended his arm to her, and she looped her hand through it. Normally, he would have felt bad depriving Cassandra of her conversation. But, he reasoned, this was the whole point of Cassandra's conversation in the first place. He was sure she wouldn't mind. Felix led Lady Allsport to the dance floor and stood across from her. The music began and, though there weren't many moments when they might pass a word, Felix felt he did quite well keeping up the truncated conversation which was expected during such a dance. Lady Allsport was proper. She laughed lightly at all the right times and agreed with everything he said. Felix hated to think ill of the lady. She was only behaving the way society expected her to. But he couldn't help but feel a bit bored around her. If only she had a bit of bite in her opinions, like... No, he would not go there. The dance ended none too soon. Several introductions and equally as many dances later, Felix counted no fewer than seven times that his gaze had found Miss Hunt. No fewer than three times she'd caught him looking at her. He couldn't remember seeing her ever, not once, at a gathering before the musicale the night before. Yet now she seemed to be everywhere. Why was that? After yet another introduction, thank you, Cassandra, Felix led one Lady Gaywood to the dance floor at the beginning of the quadrille. Lady Goldsmith, it seemed, was not in attendance, so Cassandra had to improvise. Felix stood shoulder to shoulder with Lady Gaywood as the quadrille began. In a tight square formation, there wasn't much room on the dance floor. Three other couples rounded out their foursome. Directly across from Lady Gaywood was a gentleman Felix recognised but had never met. Directly across from himself was Miss Hunt. So much for putting her from his mind. The trumpet grew louder and Felix turned and bowed first to Lady Gaywood. 
and then to the lady on his right. Reaching across the square, Felix took hold of Miss Hunt's hand, and they walked by each other, moving to stand where the other had moments ago. Felix was oddly aware of her every step as she moved by him. Taking hold of Lady Gaywood, he turned smoothly and faced Miss Hunt and her partner once more. Again, he reached out and took Miss Hunt's hand, and they moved to pass each other. This time, though, her gaze moved up and met his, a zip of fish on shot across his chest. Standing where he began, Felix did his best to return to ignoring Miss Hunt for the rest of the quadrille. A lot of good it did him. He was forced to hold her hands more than a few times, and was even required to wrap his arm around her back once or twice. No one spoke during the dance, and once it ended, Miss Hunt turned immediately to her partner and began speaking with him. Her tone sounded pleasant, and she smiled most sweetly. Felix wanted to shake his head. That poor, unsuspecting man. He probably had no idea what a vixen he was entertaining. Still, as Felix led Lady Gaywood back to the edge of the dance room, he couldn't help but feel pulled by the deceptively sweet sound of Miss Hunt's voice. Chapter 4 Felix Lockhart strode between the rows of lilies. It smelled good on this side of the hothouse. He was blatantly avoiding the rose section. He had smelled enough rose-scented perfume the past few days to last him a lifetime. He didn't need to waste his breath smelling the actual thing. A dozen of those? He pointed to some bright yellow lilies. For Lady Gaywood. He hoped she liked the color yellow. Cassandra was always saying things like, the color suits her, or someone like her would positively love this shade. What Cassandra was referring to, and how she deduced such a thing, he would never know. As for Felix, he could never tell what colors a woman may like without asking her outright. He pointed out some other flowers for the other woman he danced with at the ball last night. Yes, my lord. The gardener said, bowing over and over again. Right away, my lord. A gentleman always sent flowers to the woman he danced with, but, judging by the nervous way the gardener was acting, it wasn't usually the gentleman himself who came down to the hothouse and chose the flowers. Felix didn't care. He needed to get out of Ridge Court House, even if it was only for a few hours. At this early hour, there weren't many places for a gentleman to go. He'd started with a stroll around town, but it was frigid again this morning, and after turning a corner and seeing the hothouse, he had readily entered. The gardener, arms overflowing with flowers, bowed again. I will get these wrapped up immediately. Excellent, Felix said, feeling a tad silly seeing to a task he'd normally send a servant to do. Once they're ready, I'll be right over to write a note to go along with each one. Yes, my lord. Very good, my lord. With a bow which almost cost one of the lilies its head, the gardener turned and hurried off. Felix slowly spun around, drinking in the warmth and quiet and peace which filled the room. He should come here more often. Hang the strangeness of it all, he liked it here. No one was telling him he would never measure up. No one was introducing him to lady after lady, expecting him to fall madly in love at any moment. Felix bent over a honeysuckle bush and smelled the sweet aroma. Why couldn't women smell of honeysuckle instead of roses? Rose perfume always gave him such a headache. Good morning, Lord Sutby. Felix stood and took a small step back, surprised. Who would possibly be here, of all places? Miss Hunt smiled at him from around the bush, though her smile held a hint of laughter at his expense. Good morning, Miss Hunt. So much for there being no one around, telling him he would never measure up. First that rousing rendition on the piano forte, and now I catch you sniffing flowers. What will society think of you? Felix didn't have it in him this morning. He didn't care to match Miss Hunt in her effort to draw and quarter. He only shook his head, his gaze moving back to the honeysuckle. 
Probably no worse than they already do. Her brow creased and her head tilted to the side in question. Felix felt the need to explain. I read the papers, he said grimly. You were right. He was never one to pompously cry success when he knew he was in the wrong. Only, before he'd checked the gossip columns in the papers, he'd had no idea how wrong he was. Wrong about everything, according to them. Last, he was in a bit of a blue-deviled mood this morning. Miss Hunt took a step closer. Didn't your tutor ever tell you not to believe everything you read? He glanced back at her. Don't tell me you're deserting to the enemy. Her lips quirked to the side. You know, my father has actually used that word more than once in regard to your father. Don't I know it, and I can attest that the lack of affection is mutual. She smiled and dropped her gaze. Well, he wouldn't have guessed she had a demure, slightly coy side to her. Lord Sutby, she pressed on. Don't read the columns any more. The papers can be quite mulish when they believe they're being diverting. Are they full of hubris too, then? She shrugged and gave a dramatic sigh. Ah, <sighs> all of England seems to be feasting themselves full on the treat just now. Why shouldn't they? Seems only fair. Miss Hunt reached out and fingered a honeysuckle. What brings a man of title and high standing to a simple local hothouse this morning? Couldn't trust the common servant you elected to hire to do the work for you? Her eyes sparked a challenge. Felix accepted. Only this time he decided they ought to laugh at their differences instead of spar. Placing both hands on his lapels, Felix puffed his chest out and stuck out his lower lip in an egregious, self-important grimace. He purposefully put an extra puff of air in each and every pea. What? Leave the flower picking to that lowly bit of rubble. Please, unless a man has generations of titles and wealth, he cannot possibly know a petunia from a periwinkle. Miss Hunt laughed. It was light and tinkled like bells. Still, there was a fullness to it, a sincerity that was so often lacking in other ladies' laughs. Felix found he rather liked the sound. He liked it a lot. How about yourself? Felix asked. What brings a lady of wealth and distinction to a lowly hothouse this morning? She turned her gaze back toward the honeysuckle. The look in her eyes changed. They filled with joy and passion. At the same time, her voice dropped, soft enough that Felix barely heard her. I love flowers. It was a short, simple statement. I love flowers. But it rang with as much ardent truth as any feverant declaration. While Felix may have been tempted to tease Cassandra or Venetia, if either of them had said such a thing, the way Miss Hunt had spoken only made Felix want to hear more. Do you have a garden here in London? he asked. Only a very small one. It's protected from most of the winter's cold with a few panes of glass. But it hasn't thrived very well this year, and nothing is in bloom just now. How about your country estate? What kind of a garden does it have? Her eyes lit up, bright and brilliant. I've planted daisies and roses, lilies and foxglove. For the past two years since I've been in London for the season, my maids have had to see to it in the spring. Spring can be an important time for gardening. I hope you've assigned maids with a long lineage of proper flower care to tend your precious blooms. Miss Hunt pursed her lips in a friendly sort of smirk. The important thing is, they are the maids I chose, so I know they'll do a good job. Her smile slipped. Her lips were still turned up, but the joy substantially lessened. Besides, my mother is there right now, so she'll be sure to see that the gardens are well tended. There wasn't a tightness in her tone, as one would suspect if she were not getting along with her mother. Instead, there was a pulling and longing, 
and fearful hope in her voice. Once the season ends, she and I will have months and months to enjoy the blooms. Miss Hunt took a small step back and reached for a rich purple lily, tucked behind the honeysuckle. Except for the lilies, they'll all be gone before I return. Felix thought back quickly over all he'd heard since coming to London, searching for anything about Mr. Hunt's wife. He couldn't remember a single shred of hearsay. Will your mother be joining you here? Perhaps later in the season? he asked. No. The sadness in her expression grew. She is too ill. Ah, well, that explained her sudden melancholy. I hope it is nothing serious. She didn't look up from the flowers. As do I. Felix couldn't ask for more details. It would be wholly improper to pry. But, dash it all, he didn't like the sadness in her looks or tone. He'd found a bit of peace and relief in this simple hothouse. She should too. Then, he said, let me buy you some lilies. She glanced up at him, surprised. Whatever for? He only shrugged. Isn't that what gentlemen do after a ball? Buy flowers for the ladies? But you and I didn't dance last night. It felt like they had, with as often as he'd been aware of her presence, and the tingling awareness that came when he'd touched her hand. Well, those moments stood out in his mind, far greater than any of the times he'd stood up with any other lady. Nonetheless, Felix pushed on, let me buy you some lilies. If you can't enjoy them once you get home, you should have the opportunity to enjoy them now. You don't have to do that, Miss Hunt said. I insist. Furthermore, since you are here, I won't have to guess at which colour suits your fancy. He lifted a hand and motioned toward the many rows of lilies. You may choose anything you want. She lifted a single eyebrow, her eyes sparkling with the challenge. Her lips puckered in the way they had before when they'd argued at the musicale. But if I choose my own flowers, I'm liable to think you didn't care to put in any effort, and that you didn't enjoy not dancing with me at all. Felix smiled. Blast, but she was a troublesome creature. You would rather I pick your flowers? You very well may end up with something you hate. Then again, it was only a not dance that we shared. She turned, her expression lofty, but so obviously fake. It was clear she was fighting her own smile. A true lady of breeding never picks out her own flowers. Felix glanced about the space, his gaze landing on a brilliant yellow lily. He cupped one of the heads in his hand. Then, how about a dozen of these? Miss Hunt sniffed politely and gave him an almost indiscernible shake of her head. Not pick out her own flowers, indeed. Felix moved across the path to another bunch of lilies, white tipped with pink. He thought these would probably suit just about any lady. Miss Hunt shook her head, infinitesimally once more. Felix moved his hand to cup a different lily bloom, this one peach-coloured. Miss Hunt shook her head yet again, then, nose high in the air, she moved down the path, away from Felix, and stopped near a plant of lush foliage. What was the sphinx up to now? Felix moved down the path with her and eyed the flowers by which she'd stopped. Deep burgundy blooms with a chocolate brown centre, the petals sported small black dots and were rimmed with snowy white along the edges. They were stunning. Felix's gaze dropped to the pluck at the base of the plant. Lily Rio Negro, imported from South America. From South America? Felix asked. He could see in her eyes that she was testing him. Oh, these are expensive. She asked, I hadn't noticed. If you'd rather give a lady something else. Though, of course, 
She may wonder if you truly enjoyed not dancing with her the previous night if you only send something in yellow or pink. She blinked most innocently a couple of times. Troublesome creature. Felix called the gardener over. The man hurried up to them, wiping his stained green hands on his thick leather apron. Yes, my lord, he said with a shallow bow. I want two dozen of these. Felix flicked a finger toward the deep red blossoms. Delivered to the hunt's town home immediately. Two dozen, my lord, the gardener asked. Even Miss Hunt's purposefully pious expression wavered a bit. Actually, Felix counted, make it three. There were benefits to being the heir apparent to the Marquis of Ramport. His pockets were deep. Right away, my lord, the gardener said, pulling out his shears. Only the best blooms, Felix continued. Miss Hunt seemed momentarily at a loss for words. Felix moved up closer to her. Good day to you, Miss Hunt. I do believe these lilies make it clear just how much I did enjoy not dancing with you last night. With as lofty an air as she had donned moments ago, Felix strode past her and out of the hothouse. Chapter 5 By the time Jocelyn Hunt returned home, the flowers from Lord Sutby had already arrived. Granted, her drawing room was full of blooms from the various gentlemen who'd asked her to dance the previous evening. But the alluring lilies from Lord Sutby were by far the most eye-catching. One of the maids had already put the flowers in a large vase and situated them in the centre of a wall table. Jocelyn crossed to them and fingered a bloom. They were delicate and oh so fragrant. Jocelyn closed her eyes and breathed them in. Such a rare and stunning beauty. Had Jocelyn received them from any man other than Lord Sutby, she would think the sender was quite taken with her. As the situation was, however, Jocelyn wasn't so delusional as to think these blooms were anything but a symbol of annoyance. Lord Sutby had only brought her these flowers, and so many of them, for the sole purpose of besting her. It was more spiteful than congenial, but somehow equally as entertaining. Felix was the enemy, and he waged an impressively diverting battle. Jocelyn breathed in yet again. The scent was heady, with a strong bite of floral. The door to the drawing room opened with a bang. This time we won't stand for them walking all over us. Her father's gruff voice burst into the room. Jocelyn turned to find Mr. Comby following father step for step. Yes, sir, absolutely, not this time. We'll lean on them, that's what's needed. We'll find the gentlemen who are halting. His gaze landed on Jocelyn, and he stopped mid-sentence. Ah, oh, my darling girl, he crossed to her. How are you this morning? Very well, thank you, sir. Her gaze moved from father to Mr. Comby. Good morning to you, Mr. Comby. He bowed. Miss Hunt. She turned back to her father. Isn't it a bit early to be hounding Mr. Comby about the upcoming vote? Nonsense, father said. Never too early, never too early. Comby will be joining us for luncheon. Was it already midday? She must have gotten home from the hothouse later than she realized. Of course, father, that would be delightful. She offered Mr. Comby a smile to let him know he was most certainly welcome. Mr. Comby, however, was eyeing the large bouquet of dark red lilies. That is quite a stunning arrangement of flowers, he said, something of a question in his tone. Yes, it is, was all Jocelyn offered by way of an answer. She watched him carefully, waiting to see if he would tease back perhaps come at the unspoken question from a different, equally vague angle. If he did, she would respond with a different response, but one just as unhelpful. Instead, Mr. Comby only nodded once and turned to her father. The two gentlemen launched into a deep conversation regarding which of the lords they may meet with one-on-one. -on -one. 
to try and sway their vote. Jocelyn was soon left by the flowers, alone, as the men moved towards the hearth and sat themselves. Well, that was disappointing. Lord Sutby never would have walked away from such a challenge. He would have... No. Jocelyn pursed her lips. Lord Sutby was nothing like Mr. Combe. Sutby wasn't a suitor. He was the enemy. Granted, it was intriguing to watch him try and best her. But it wasn't as though she ever expected him to ask her to dance or come calling some morning. The few conversations they'd shared had been filled with disagreements. Stimulating disagreements, but disagreements nonetheless. She ought to be more careful around him. Jocelyn knew full well her tendency to bait people. It was just so much fun to tease and quarrel. But now that Parliament was in full swing, and several important votes were coming up, if she were to truly lose her tongue, and it were to end up in the papers, or be tossed about among the gossiping hens, it could most certainly undermine her father. That was one thing she would never do. Jocelyn turned her back on the Rio Negro lilies, and moved over to where the men were talking. She sat down on the settee beside her father. Tell me, dear, father said, do you know Lady Brimsby, wife of Lord Brimsby at all? Only slightly, she said. He nodded, finger tapping against his lips. We may need you to find an excuse to speak with her. We are not certain which way her husband leans. Mr. Combe's brow creased. Do you mean, sir, to ask your daughter to learn this for us? Jocelyn struggled to keep her expression polite. She was sitting right here. He didn't need to speak of her as though she wasn't present in the room. I've done it before. Father responded with no small amount of pride in his voice. Jocelyn is the best little spy commons could ever ask for. Jocelyn watched Combe. How would he respond to that? He clearly hadn't thought much of the notion of her learning, from wives and daughters, what her father couldn't learn from the lords themselves. Combe dropped his gaze. Oh, truly? That was all he was going to say? If the man disagreed, he ought to open his mouth and say so. Of course, Jocelyn loved her role in helping her father, and heaven help the man who tried to stop her. But if there was one thing she disliked even more than being told what she should or should not do, it was a person who didn't have an opinion at all. Now, father picked up the conversation. We'd be wise to start with a list of all those who have not vocally made their stance clear. The three of them launched into a deep debate regarding who was likely to vote which way and who may be swayed. They'd already singled out three men Mr. Combe and her father felt they could approach, as well as two women Jocelyn might speak with by the time the butler entered, saying that the luncheon was ready. Though not customary, father had taken a liking to a meal of cold meats. He always insisted on keeping it casual, and, therefore, Combe often accompanied them, so that their discussions need not be interrupted. Father extended his arm for Jocelyn and she took it. They moved toward the door, but just before leaving, Jocelyn caught sight of the large plume of flowers Lord Sutby had sent her. There was something about it sitting atop the far wall table that just didn't feel right. It didn't fit the room as it ought. Is everything all right, my dear? Father asked. Gracious, she was holding them all up. Please excuse me. You two go ahead. I only need to do one thing first, and then I'll join you. Very well, Father said, motioning for Mr. Combe to follow him. They immediately delved into conversation, even as they strode from the room. Alone again in the drawing room, Jocelyn moved over to the wall table and picked up the thick vase. Good heavens, but she couldn't see any of the room while holding the flowers. The foliage was too wide and tall and so thick and full. Jocelyn placed the flowers back down on the table. She'd have to decide their final destination first. Three dozen lilies. Really, what had the silly man been thinking? Still... She couldn't help but smile at the gesture. Jocelyn loved flowers, but she'd missed the lilies the most these past few years, 
since she'd been in town for the season and not at home to see her own bloom. And Sutby had cared. He'd cared and sent her three dozen of the most gorgeous lilies she'd ever seen. No, not cared. She was convinced it was more of a grandstanding offer than anything else. Still, she couldn't deny how much she did love the blooms. It was like someone had given her a bit of her beloved country home here in London. Jocelyn turned about the room. The problem was, Lord Sutby's arrangement was by far the biggest she'd received, and in shoving them up against the wall to one side, the room almost felt like it was going to tip that direction. A brilliant, large foliage like that needed to be the centre of attention. They did not belong on a small side table. The pianoforte. Perfect. Jocelyn picked up the bouquet and moved it to sit atop the instrument. It looked lovely there. Her mind moved back to the night of the musicale, when she'd caught Lord Sutby playing. He'd imbued the song with so much emotion. It made her miss Mamma. Her vision clouded over with tears. She'd not received a letter for three days now. That was the longest she'd gone without something from Mamma this entire season. Lord Sutby's words echoed in her mind. I hope it's not serious. She did too. More than she hoped for anything. She hoped Mamma was all right. Chapter 6 Felix reined in his horse and took in the scope of all that was around him. Trees, tall and majestic. The tripping river, playful and teasing. Beyond them, the shocking blue sky, not a single cloud to be seen. When the sky was like that, a solid shade of cerulean blue which stretched from horizon to horizon. It almost looked as if Felix could reach out and touch it, if only he could get high enough. In the few days since his unexpected detour into the hothouse, and even more unexpected engaging conversation with Miss Hunt, Felix had spent very little time in the heart of town. Though he was staying at Ridgecourt House, he'd ridden out toward the outskirts of town every morning. It had been warmer these past few days, and he was reveling in it. Lud, what he wouldn't give to stay out here all day. Just him and Chestnut, his mount, darting between trees, listening to the river's tall tales, looking up at the clear sky. But no, Felix sighed. No doubt, Father had a long list of things that they had to see to that day. There was Parliament. There were accidental run-ins at White's to orchestrate. Then, of course, Penelope and Cassandra would have the evening booked. Balls, the opera, musicales. It was like this every season. All in attendance had to make up for having been apart during the winter holiday by squeezing all of humanity into first one room and then the next. With another sigh, Felix turned Chestnut back to town and Ridgecourt House. He'd best be about it. Heaven only knew the row he'd caused last year when, one day, he'd chosen to arrive home from his morning ride, four hours later than usual. That, too, had been a beautifully clear day but he wouldn't subject the household to such a frenzy again. Still, Felix took his ride home at half the pace he normally did. The wide roads of London were awake now, which they had not been when he'd ridden out. Shops were open, and various ladies bustled in and out of them. Two men in deep debate passed Felix on his left, not bothering to look up or greet him. Felix turned the corner, just in time to see Miss Hunt, along with two other women, pass into a haberdashery. He'd only caught the briefest glimpse of her, yet it was enough to make him slow his horse. She looked lovely in a light pink dress. She hadn't seen him, and the door was closed behind her, 
before Felix could so much as blink. Felix shook his head. What was it about that woman? What were the odds that he'd see her during his return home this morning? It seemed she was nearly everywhere he went as of late. The thought brought with it a small thrill, one he quickly squashed. Hunt was on the war path. That much had become clear the past few days. He was cornering nearly every seat in Lords, harassing them to accept the tax changes Commons was proposing. Mr. Comby was tailing him everywhere, too. Comby seemed to be forever either with Hunt, or as in the case of the theatre last night, escorting Miss Hunt. Felix had seen the two of them together from his box high above the audience. Remembering the sight of them sitting so close to one another left him feeling oddly unsettled. Felix shook his head and urged his horse forward once more. What was it Mr. Comby had said to Felix a couple of weeks ago? We in the House of Commons have more power than you lords like to admit. Felix fought against grinding his teeth. Comby was correct, and he knew it. It had been decades now since the House of Lords held the undeniable upper hand. Ever since the colonies waged war on Mother England and declared themselves a separate country, the House of Lords had come under more and more scrutiny, followed by more and more dissonance, and finally, less and less control. Felix dismounted and handed his horse over to a stable hand. Miss Hunt was right. They'd all be fools to keep thinking Parliament was just as it had been a generation ago. He strode back into the house, pulling his gloves off. Pardon me, my lord, the butler said with a bow. Lord Ramport requested you join him in the study just as soon as you returned home. No surprise there. Of course. Felix hurried up the stairs and around the corner. Father was sitting at his desk, spectacles balanced on the tip of his nose. Felix stepped in noiselessly and watched him for a bit. Lord Ramport was quite advanced in years now, but he was still as sharp as any young man. Granted, his hair had thinned some and was more salt and pepper now than the sandy blonde it had been in his youth. Still, he had such a distinguished air about him. To speak with Lord Ramport was to know what it meant to temper sharp wit with manners suited to polite society. Felix may never be half as good a man as his father, but he certainly meant to try. You asked for me, father. Lord Ramport looked up. Hunt is at it again. Felix turned his mind away from Miss Hunt, and the thoughts hearing her surname immediately stirred up, and forced himself to stay focused on her father. Who did he corner in whites this time? Lord Harrington. Blast. Harrington was already halfway on board with the tax reformation. One good round of persuasion, and Commons would have themselves another supporter. I'm calling on him this afternoon, Lord Ramport continued. We'll see if I can't unconvince him of every lie Hunt fed him. Good plan. They needed to speak with the man immediately, before his mind was fully turned. However, how about I go? Lord Ramport blinked. You? Did father really think him so incapable? Well, yes, I know Lord Harrington fairly well. Maybe not that well, come to think of it. Well enough. Either way, I'd like to give it a shake. Lord Ramport said nothing but silently leaned back in his chair. Felix understood his father's lack of words. Never once had Felix offered to do something. I feel I can do this, Felix pushed on. Comby, Miss Hunt, they were both right. He couldn't keep pretending that putting off his birthright was the right thing to do. He had been born to do this, as much as he often wished he hadn't been and it was time he stepped up and faced the music, so to speak. He gave his father a stern stare. I can do this. 
he said with more confidence than he felt. All right, then. Lord Ramport still sounded unconvinced. I will send a message ahead, so Lord Harrington knows to expect you. Felix stood, surprisingly excited about his task. Don't bother, I'll see to it myself. It felt good to finally, fully accept the mantle that had always been looming over him. After a few too many years of hiding from his responsibilities, facing them head-on felt like the thrill of charging through a storm instead of slowly growing soaked under a tree. Felix paused at the door. I'm sorry, father, he said suddenly. Sorry? What for? I'm sorry I haven't stepped up as much in previous years. But I want you to know I do take the family title seriously. I'm determined to someday make you proud. Not giving Lord Ramport an opportunity to respond, Felix stepped from the room. The last thing he wanted to hear, well, perhaps someday I will be proud. Not that he expected Father to say so exactly, but he didn't even want to hear it in his tone. Instead, Felix was determined to make his father proud now, and to prove to himself and society that anyone should be pleased to have Felix for a son. With that goal firmly in mind, Felix rang for a manservant to deliver a message to Lord Harrington. Hunt and all of Commons needed to watch out. Felix was only just beginning. Chapter 7 A letter from Miss Hunt, miss. Finally, Jocelyn quickly scooped up the letter atop the silver tray and, not bothering to leave the breakfast table, pulled it open. My dearest Jocelyn, the weather is beginning to warm at last. Yesterday, I had my favourite settee, you know the one, taken and placed out of doors near the gardens. I sat out there for a full hour. For a full hour, Mamma had written. No doubt she'd meant a full hour before her cough had started up again and she'd been forced to return indoors. Around Jocelyn, the servants cleared breakfast. Normally she returned to her bedchambers, or at the very least to the drawing room, before opening Mamma's letters. But it had been nearly a week this time, and Jocelyn couldn't wait even that long before reading it. The flowers you so love are gorgeous right now. The lilies are all opening, and the daffodils bob their heads during the evening breeze. Jocelyn's sight began to blur, and she had to blink several times to keep the tears at bay. Gracious, but she missed Bridge Cross. She'd spent nearly her entire childhood there. Though the house in town she currently resided in belonged every bit as much to her family as the estate, the country had always felt like home. The doctor says I am a bit improved. Jocelyn let out a sigh of relief. However, I am still unable to travel. That was fine. Jocelyn had reconciled herself to Mamma, not being able to join her in town this season. She missed Mamma something fierce, but she recognised her want for Mamma's companionship was selfish right now. Mamma needed to stay home where she could get better. I am so sorry, my sweet girl. I have been praying for strength enough to come to you. But such does not seem to be God's will. So instead, I will write you as often as I can, and think about you all the rest of time. Jocelyn blinked back yet more tears. I miss you, my dearest girl. I hope you are having a gay time in London. Since I cannot be there to give you sage motherly advice, I will have to content myself with sending such as I can through this letter. 
Do not allow your head to be turned by just any man. You have a quick mind and quite the propensity for politics. Do not allow yourself to become attached to someone who does not see that in you or does not appreciate it. Furthermore, I strongly encourage you to find a man who sides with your father on most points, or at least with the House of Commons in general. Jocelyn easily sensed the light-hearted teasing her mother meant to convey. She could almost hear mother's voice saying the words aloud, and imagined a playful smile on her lips. However, Jocelyn couldn't deny how quickly her mother's admonishment brought to mind the image of one man in particular, not Comby, who with all this talk of suitors and the like, probably should come to mind, but Lord Sutby, his tall form and sandy hair. Most of all, his blue eyes and the way they danced when he puffed out his chest at the hothouse a couple of weeks ago and pretended to be a popinjay. Anything less, and we're liable to have an all-out war to rival the one with the Americans. Each and every time your future husband is in the same room as your father. La, what politics can do to a family. Yes, indeed. Father and Lord Sutby in the same house all holiday long. Gracious, that would cause quite the row. Oh, heavens! Jocelyn squeezed her eyes shut tight. Had she just imagined Lord Sutby as her future husband? She must need some air or something. Jocelyn shook her head and opened her eyes. The room around her was completely empty. No servants, no breakfast dishes, no buffet along the wall. Yes, that was it. Too many hours in the same house, mulling over the same tax reform issues and speaking to, and only of, the same individuals, over and over again. Jocelyn needed a change of scene. If she was, even during what must be a moment of insanity, seeing herself back home with Lord Sutby, of all people, as her future husband, she was in dire need of something, with yet another shake of her head, wishing she could forever forget that one stray image Mamma's letter had elicited, Jocelyn stood and decided she would read the rest of the letter in the drawing room. Jocelyn sat herself atop the window seat on the eastmost wall. With morning sunlight streaming in, it was a most welcome nook. Jocelyn pulled her feet up onto the cushion and rested her shoulder against the window. The rest of Mamma's letter was simple. News from the neighbourhood. The vicar's wife was pregnant again, and Lady Verton had done up an old hat of hers so drastically that not even her husband had recognised it as the one she'd worn for years. It was full of those small things that individually did not seem to be very important, but when rolled up in one felt so much like home. Jocelyn re-read the letter, this time keeping her mind firmly on the words and not at all on the images of what might be some day. At least Mamma seemed well. It was a very optimistic letter on the whole, and it left Jocelyn feeling more positive about her Mamma's condition than she'd felt all week. There you are! Jocelyn startled at the strong, demanding female voice, which suddenly broke into the stillness of the drawing room. Come and give your aunt a kiss hello. Jocelyn peeked around the curtains which half hid the window seat. Aunt Emily? Sure enough, Lady Salter stood. In the centre of the drawing room, dressed head to toe in dark plum, with a single large feather coming from her headdress. She waved both hands, signalling Jocelyn to walk toward her. Come, come! Jocelyn stood and hurried over to her aunt, throwing her arms around the woman. Oh, Aunt Emily, I did not know to expect you. Lady Salter's hug matched her nature as a woman. It was executed precisely and finished almost immediately. Now then, 
she said, stepping back and looking over Jocelyn. Let me have a look at you. Lady Salter began walking in a tight circle about Jocelyn, not trying in the least to hide that she was sizing her niece up. What brings you to London? Jocelyn asked, trying to be proper and face her aunt the entire time she spoke, which was quite difficult since Lady Salter insisted on circling around her, like a bird circling its prey. Your mother, bless her heart, cannot come to London this season. You've heard. Of course I've heard. Lady Salter stopped her circling and tisked to herself silently. Whatever she'd hoped to find in Jocelyn, she apparently hadn't found. My silly brother thought he could act as an adequate chaperone for you while in London, but really the man ought to know better. A lady who has come out needs a matron to watch after her, and to see to it she makes the most advantageous match possible. Jocelyn felt her cheeks growing a tad warm. I'm in no rush to find a match, Aunt Emily. Truth was, though last year had been her first season, she didn't feel a need to rush to the church this year either. Nonsense, Lady Salter said. Your sister is married and quite happily situated. Your younger brother won't be on the market until he's established himself several years from now. That makes now your time to shine. It's like you said, Jocelyn countered, though she was fairly certain pressing her point would do her no good. James won't be ready for several years, which means I have plenty of time to find the right man. Lady Salter tisked some more. With that attitude, you'll be an old spinster before you know it. Jocelyn was not yet one and twenty. Surely she had plenty of time before anyone considered her an old spinster. Now, Lady Salter moved past Jocelyn and sat herself down. Let us begin. What do you have planned for this evening? Have you chosen a suitable dress? Who are the young men you are currently keeping an eye on? Listening to Aunt Emily's list, Jocelyn already felt overwhelmed. Well, I had plans to attend the Sutterton's ball this evening, and I was thinking I would wear my blue taffeta. Lady Salter nodded, lips pursed tight. Light blue? No unmarried niece of mine will be seen in cobalt or navy. Yes, quite a lovely shade of light blue. Now, what about possible suitors? Who are their families? What are their standings and holdings? Gracious, Jocelyn had never considered her marriage options in quite so harsh a way. Lady Sorter clearly wasn't going to beat about the bush on this one. Mr. Comby has paid me more attention than any other man. He comes from a good family and is set to inherit a sizable estate. He agrees with father on all things political. Good, that's important. Your father needs you to marry an ally to further his career. Equally as important, your father is one of your greatest assets. To the right man, a connection with this family will only be a boon. Jocelyn tried not to fidget under Lady Salter's blunt statement. Instead, she continued to list a few more men, whom she'd danced with on numerous occasions. More than one had asked her to take a ride with them through Hyde Park. Lady Salter nodded repeatedly throughout. It seems the pool of possible suitors is not lacking this year. We will work that to our advantage. Anyone else? Jocelyn's mind jumped to Lord Sutby as it had while reading Mama's letter that morning. His smile, and the way he relentlessly teased her back. The way he bought her flowers because her mother was ailing. The way he made fun of himself at times. Jocelyn slowly shook her head. He surely didn't see her as a possible match. She, likewise, couldn't think of him as a possible suitor. Such a match between them would be as Lady Salter was quick to bluntly point out. Detrimental to both families. He would do nothing to help father's career or his desire to improve England. She would do nothing to help Lord Sutby standing in Lords, which she didn't exactly want to do anyway, since he was so staunchly against everything she believed in. Father may be the head of her family, the one who spoke out in public and at Westminster, but she agreed with him wholeheartedly. Though she would never hold a seat in Commons, her support would never leave it. Very well. 
Aunt Emily said. You have given me plenty to work with. Never fear, now that I am here, you will have at least one marriage proposal by the end of the month. You can count on that. By the end of the month? Lady Salter's statement erased every other thought from Jocelyn's mind. That is very kind. Ingrained breeding told Jocelyn that that was the right thing to say, though she certainly didn't feel the woman was doing her any favours. But as I already said, her words turned a touch forceful. Good breeding or not, Jocelyn would not be walked over. I am in no rush. When the right man comes along, I'll know, and then I'll wed. I have no desire to do so before that time. Lady Salter's face puckered at Jocelyn's stern tone. That may have been well enough last year, but now your time is up. Her voice was as steely as Jocelyn had ever heard. You will wed, and soon. It is already decided. What? Decided by whom? Lady Salter could not be serious. Jocelyn had no reason to rush into a marriage. What had gotten into her aunt's head? Before Jocelyn could say anything, Lady Salter stood. Now, go get ready for the ball. I expect nothing short of perfect elegance. Tonight, I want to meet all the men you listed and make my own opinions of each. She clapped her hands together. Hurry off now. Your maid has much to do to get you presentable by tonight. Chapter 8 Felix Lockhart, Earl of Sutby and heir apparent to the Marquis of Ramport, had done it. He'd won back Harrington's vote. It had taken most of the afternoon, and he'd even had to skip out on the Southerton's ball the previous evening because of it. But it had been more than worth it. Felix could now report back to his father that not only could they count on Harrington voting against Commons, but he had the potential to be a staunch ally against tax reform. All thanks to Felix. The sky above him was clouded over, but on a morning like this, what did it matter? Though he wasn't trying to do so, Felix was pretty sure his chest was puffed out, and why shouldn't it be? He'd just done something not just any man could have done. The streets of London were quite calm. Not many were up and about at this early hour. There was another benefit to having had to skip out on the previous night's ball. He'd been abed well before four in the morning, which is when he'd heard Cassandra had finally returned. He shook his head. Cassandra certainly knew how to enjoy every breath in London. He imagined she was quite put out with him for not attending the ball with her. She'd gone on and on all morning about the new list of ladies she'd planned to introduce him to. When he'd hinted he might not make it home in time to attend, she'd insisted she'd never be able to introduce him to his future wife if he never attended any social functions. Furthermore, they'd made an agreement, and why was Felix backing out already? In the end, she'd surely see the reason for his need to remain focused on Harrington, and would no doubt be proud of him when she awoke and learned of his grand success. Nonetheless, Felix had awoken that morning to a note Cassandra had scribbled after her return home from the ball and before she went to sleep. Apparently, even absent from the dance, Cassandra had made sure Felix was not forgotten. She had apologised to no less than a dozen women for him, claiming that he'd had the most ardent desire to stand up with each and every one of them, and only the most pressing of matters of state had kept him away. Felix paused in front of the little hothouse he'd visited a couple of times this past month. Cassandra's letter had charged him with seeing to it that an all dozen women received flowers from him. He didn't exactly understand why he was suddenly responsible for sending all those women flowers when there was a good chance that if he had attended the ball, he wouldn't have danced with half of them. Still, a morning stroll to the hothouse was a small price to pay for having escaped dancing all night. The gardener hurried over immediately 
appearing less surprised than in times past, but no less eager to please. Felix liked the man. He seemed a hard-working, honest sort of chap. Together, they strolled by rows and rows of blooms, Felix frequently needing to consult the letter from Cassandra to remember whom he owed bouquets. Next time there was a large social gathering, he'd stay focused on introducing Cassandra to as many men as possible. Perhaps that would keep her occupied enough to leave him well enough alone. Felix, with the gardener at his elbow, making note of all Felix wanted, stepped around a large bush with white flowers. There, sitting atop a narrow bench with her head bent low, was Miss Hunt. She wore a simple pink morning dress, and her hair was curled and half down. Two days ago, Cassandra had mentioned Miss Hunt to Penelope. When Penelope had been unsure who Cassandra meant, Felix's sister had said her Christian name was Jocelyn. He liked the name. She looked like a Jocelyn. Refined, regal, but not stuffy or overly self-important. Just elegant in her own unimposing way. Felix's gaze quickly moved back to his list. There were only two women left he hadn't picked flowers out for. As quick as he could, he listed off a few things for the remaining two and set the gardener off to see to all of his orders. Alone, Felix moved toward Miss Hunt. She didn't look up as he approached. What a shocking find to see you here this morning, he said. Good morning, Lord Sutby. Her tone was formal, stiff. Felix's head tipped to the side. That was not the Jocelyn he knew. She sounded polite, not that she wasn't always polite as any young lady ought to be. But this time she sounded, well, exactly like all the other young ladies he knew. That was one thing Jocelyn had never been. Felix dropped to the bench beside her. It wasn't long and he was forced to sit quite close to her. He hoped she didn't mind it too terribly, as he knew she didn't exactly think highly of him. Is it a good morning? he asked. She glanced over at him and he caught sight of her face for the first time. Her brow was set low and her lips were doing that pucker while thinking hard thing again. The pink in her dress brought out the pink in them too. She seemed upset. Her shoulders sagged as well. So perhaps she was just tired from a late night. Had she been at the Sutterton's ball as well? Gotten home as late as Cassandra? That would certainly explain a lot. Without saying anything, her gaze returned to the hothouse floor. Well, if Felix could win over Harrington, he certainly could cheer up Jocelyn. He was a dab hand at this point. Don't tell me all the men were coxcombs last night and didn't think to stand up with you. He kept his tone full of jest, so that she wouldn't misunderstand his intention. She let out a sigh. <sighs> quite the opposite, in fact. Oh, so she'd stood up quite a lot then, had she? Felix ignored the tightening of his chest, and that small voice that said he should have gone last night as well. Then he might have been one of the, supposedly many, men who'd taken a turn about with her. Yes, he most certainly would ignore that thought and stay unaffected. Were none of them handsome enough to suit? Jocelyn sat up straight, a teasing smile finally playing across her lips. They were all so handsome. Her voice turned upward in mock distress. How is a lady to know whom to bestow her good graces upon? Felix chuckled softly as Jocelyn only grew all the more dramatic, placing the back of her hand against her forehead. Oh, woe is me, for I do not know if my life's happiness is better settled upon one with dark hair or one with a graceful air while dancing. She reached her other gloved hand out, straight in front of her. They all beseech me for my hand, and I, ignorant and brainless young woman, must certainly pin all my hopes on my aunt and trust her to know what is best for me. My, 
but she added quite a bit of bite to the word aunt. Has your aunt come to visit then? Jocelyn dropped all pretense and turned about, so she could face him more fully. Yes, she has, much to my surprise. Worse still, she's declared herself in charge of my season. She had my maid redo my hair three times last night, before she allowed me to attend the ball. Felix's gaze moved to the locks, falling gentle down over her shoulder. Sounds painful. Jocelyn slowly closed her eyes. Believe me, it was. He couldn't deny how lovely she looked now. Perhaps she ought to just wear her hair down next time there was a ball. Of course, a woman never would wear her hair down to a ball. In that moment, Felix was glad. He was fairly sure that if the other men of the ton ever saw Jocelyn as she was now, she would not be allowed to rest for a single set all night long. I just don't understand it. Jocelyn continued, Lady Salter has never shown much interest in either my sister's or my season's. Why now? Why this sudden determination that I should... She ended with a shake of her head, which had the pleasant effect of sending a couple of the lovely curls bouncing. Felix forced his gaze away from her completely. Jocelyn was far too pretty this time of the morning. He faced forward, folding his arms. Sudden determination to do what? Nothing of consequence. It didn't sound like nothing of consequence. Jocelyn faced him. I've fretted away enough time trying to piece together why my aunt has suddenly come to commandeer my life. I vote we speak of other things. You vote we speak of other things? Well then. Felix puffed his chest out. If you're from Commons and I from Lords, I feel it my honour-bound duty. He drew out a short pause. To disagree. As elegant as any pompous highbrow, Felix crossed one knee over the other. Why do you think your aunt has come to commandeer your life just now? His own hand at dramatic antics had the effect he'd been looking for. Jocelyn laughed. Gats, but that sound had echoed about his mind since the first time he'd heard it. Hearing it again now, well, it was every bit as lovely as he remembered. Felix took to patting his pockets over and over. Hang it all, but I've forgotten my quizzing glass. One cannot have a proper disagreement without one. Felix laughed more. It's a good thing you don't have a quizzing glass. With the mood I'm in this morning, I'm not sure I wouldn't do something terribly unladylike. That sounded intriguing. Such as? he prompted. She eyed him with a flat stare. Such as snatch it from your hand and smack you in the face with it. Felix tipped his head back and laughed hard. Don't you think I could? She asked with a tinge of frustration in her tone. I absolutely believe you would, Felix countered. That's what makes it so diverting. I can just see myself shocked into falling off the bench and landing in the petunias behind us. Long arms and legs flailing in the air. Crying out, she hit me, she hit me. They both dissolved into giggles and chuckles. For several minutes, neither of them could say anything. They were laughing so hard. Eventually, they sighed as one and were silent. At least she was smiling now. It was all Felix wanted. He thought about saying, yet again, that he was sorry her aunt had come and upend her season. But he felt she was serious about not wanting to talk about it. He would honour her wish to be diverted and speak of other things. I had a very interesting day yesterday, he began. She turned to him, and he was more than a little pleased to see the spark of interest in her eyes. Felix dove into a detailed description of his conversation with Harrington. Oh, how the man had hemmed and hawed and countered, with this point and then that. However, despite all the man's wish-washy thinking, Felix had stopped him at every turn, 
and made the man see the foolishness of... Felix suddenly remembered exactly who it was he was speaking to. He glanced over at Jocelyn. Her lips were naught but a taut line. Her eyes, which had sparked with interest before, now were full of fire. Brimstone was probably not far behind, because she looked as though she was wishing him to perdition. Ah, blast. Jocelyn folded her arms tightly against her chest and huffed, even as she turned away from Felix. Foolish, indeed. Is that what you call listening to the other side? I didn't mean it like that. Then how did you mean it? She speared him with a look that clearly told him she expected an answer. It also told him that if he answered wrong, he would be most sorry for it. I only meant that... This was ridiculous. He hadn't done anything wrong. More so, he was proud that he had persuaded Harrington to vote with the rest of Lords. He didn't need to justify such to anyone. Be reasonable. While taxing people less sounds good in theory, doing so comes with very real consequences. We all appreciate well-kept roads and beautiful parks, but they cost money to maintain. Be reasonable. She stood, swirling around and facing him fully, her pink skirt billowing out as though in warning of the storm about to break. Be reasonable. All right, so now that she'd repeated him twice, Felix did see the error in using such a phrase when speaking with an opinionated woman such as Miss Hunt. He lifted his hands up in submission. I was just repeating what I told Harrington. Ah, so listening to Commons is unreasonable now, is it? I'd never said it was. You just did. True, but only in a roundabout way, and it certainly wasn't what he meant. I believe it is more reasonable to keep taxes as they are. Of course you do. She muttered sotto voce. Blinking a few times, she glanced down. Hang it all, was she crying? Felix stood up and moved a step closer to her. She took an equally sized step back. While there weren't any tears rolling down her cheeks, he was certain she'd seen the beginnings of tears forming along her lashes. Please excuse me, Lord Sutby, she said with a shallow curtsy. But I am sure my aunt will be wanting me home. Good day to you. She turned and hurried off. Felix watched her leave, not sure if she'd welcome him calling her back. Cats, he shouldn't have allowed himself to start arguing with her again, especially not on a morning when he knew she was upset already. Felix took his time returning to Ridgecourt House. Every word of their conversation, both the joyous and the regretful, playing over and over in his mind. While he'd left home that morning feeling dandy, now, he only felt like a cad. Chapter 9 This didn't make sense. Lady Salter had been undeniably bent on seeing Jocelyn married by the end of the season. Neither father nor mamma had ever put such pressure on her, and Jocelyn couldn't figure out why they were allowing her aunt to do so now. Father certainly wasn't a man who was ignorant of what took place in his own home, nor was he one to bow to anyone, sister or no. Jocelyn reached the top of the stairs and paused atop the landing. There had to be something at play that she wasn't aware of. Was Father's current situation so tedious that he needed a strong, supporting son-in-law? Though Jocelyn had always been vocal about supporting her father, she didn't think he'd ever truly use her to further the party's ends. Hands on hips, she strummed her fingertips against her stomach. Something wasn't adding up and there was nothing for it but to get to the bottom of the situation. She strode forward and rapped on the study door. Enter, her father said in his deep, commanding voice. Jocelyn reached for the door handle. She shouldn't be so nervous to just ask him about it. They'd always talked openly about any subject ever since she was a young girl. 
Father didn't believe in smoothing over any topic, uncomfortable or no, just because she was female. Still, there was something in her gut that told her she wasn't going to like what she was about to hear. Jocelyn squared her jaw, opened the door and stepped inside. Mr. Comby sat across from Father in a wide chair. If anyone were to see him such as he was, they would have clearly known it was a chair he sat in often. He slumped against one side quite comfortably. Jocelyn was even beginning to suspect he was wearing spots into the chair, which fit his frame exactly for his ever-constant presence there. Good evening, Jocelyn, Father said with a smile. We were just discussing the latest news from the continent. Care to join us? For several days now, she'd had her hair ripped from its roots, been squeezed into one tight-fitting dress after another, and had been shoved in front of more bachelors than she could count. No, she didn't want to discuss the news from the continent. If you will excuse me, sir, she said, straining against her own desire to speak more tensely. I would like to speak with you. Her eyes jumped to Mr. Comby and back again. Alone. Father's brow creased in confusion. Certainly he wasn't so unaware as all that. He must know the reason she wished to speak with him. Father turned toward Mr. Comby. If you will pardon us, Comby, I believe my daughter needs me. Of course. Comby stood, giving her a broad smile. I do hope I will be seeing you tonight at the Brimsby supper party. I believe you shall. Jocelyn gave him a polite curtsy as he passed. Well, Father said, what can I do for you, Pumpkin? Jocelyn waited until Mr. Comby was well out the door and no doubt far enough away to not overhear anything. Why has my aunt come to stay with us, truly? She didn't want any runaround about Lady Salter being family and having not seen her in several years. Though it may all be true, those certainly were not the reasons she'd come now. Father sighed, his easy-going expression falling. He motioned with a hand for her to sit. The fear of what she was about to learn crept across Jocelyn's skin. She sat and waited silently. Your Aunt Emily has come to see to it that you make a favourable match. Jocelyn had figured that much out within moments of Lady Salter passing their threshold. Yes, but I don't understand why, and I don't understand the sudden rush. Father's eyes grew sad. Oh no. Jocelyn's hand came up to her mouth. Only one thing made Father look so forlorn. Is it Mother? Father nodded. A sudden weight pulled on Jocelyn's arms and stomach. She couldn't have stood if she'd wanted to. How bad is it? Father stood and moved around the desk, taking the chair Mr. Comby had been in and moving it close to her. He rested his hand atop hers. She's taken a turn for the worse. Mr. Wynton isn't sure why or what to do about it, but he's dropped more than one hint that, well, his voice caught. Jocelyn knew. The doctor dropped more than one hint that she might never get better, that they might not have much time left with her at all. Hot tears rolled down her cheeks. How soon? Father shook his head. No way to be certain. There's still a good chance she'll get better. We have to pray that she will. No. Jocelyn shook her head. I mean, how soon are we going to return home? He watched her carefully. We aren't returning to Bridge Cross. Jocelyn felt her mouth drop open. Not returning. Of course they would return. She wasn't going to waste what could be the last months of her mother's life in London, of all places. Sweetie. Father's hand on hers tightened slightly. No. She shook her head vehemently. I want to go to her. I want to be there with her. Father's hand left hers. Tears blurred too much of her vision for her to see exactly what Father was doing. But she heard the rustle of first fabric and then paper. He pressed a letter against her hand. I think you should read this. He dropped a handkerchief into her lap and leaned back. 
Jocelyn wiped her eyes with the handkerchief and turned the letter over. It was her mother's handwriting. She opened it. The folds were worn from being opened, folded, and opened time and again. The date on the top told her that mother had written this only two weeks ago. Still, father kept it with him and had clearly read it often. The knowledge made her scared to know the contents. Drawing in a deep breath, Jocelyn focused her gaze on the elegant script before her. Sweet Antony, you have heard from Dr. Wynne, I am sure. Please don't fret. I am not as bad off as he makes me out to be. Still, I felt the need to tell you something. To express some of the stirrings which have not left my heart. Since you and my darling girl left for London, let me start with a request. Then I will offer my reason. Do not allow Jocelyn to return before the season ends. Please, this is very important to me. Jocelyn blinked several times. Mama didn't want her there. She rubbed at her eyes with the handkerchief again to keep them clear enough to see the words. No doubt, if you tell her Dr. Wynne's prognosis, she will demand to return immediately. Yes, yes she would. Any daughter who loved her mother half as much as Jocelyn loved Mama would do no less. For that reason, I ask that you not tell her. Jocelyn felt hurt, truly hurt. Mama wanted the prognosis hidden from her. Do not misunderstand me, my love. Right now, I desperately wish you and she were both here by my side. But I cannot deny there is one thing I want more. I want to see my darling girl married and happily situated. Christina has been married for quite some time now, and I know she will be all right. James will always have you to show him how to be a man, and how to make a name for himself and carry on with honor. But my sweet baby girl, Jocelyn, I worry about. She is strong-willed and even more strongly opinionated. She will not accept just any man's proposal. Moreover, not just any man will make her happy and allow her to shine as she was always meant to do. I feel I cannot rest until I know she, too, will be all right. I need to see her settled, and happily so. To that end, I ask, nay, I beseech you, darling, that you not allow Jocelyn to return from London until the season's close. See to it that she meets as many upstanding, honorable bachelors as possible. See to it she enjoys herself and is free to fall in love. More than anything, this is what I want right now. It is the deepest desire of my heart. Until we meet again, my love, yours forever, M. Jocelyn slowly lowered the letter. She didn't know what to say. She didn't know what to think. For Mama to have written thusly, she must truly be sick, even more so than Jocelyn had feared in her most unsure moments. At the same time, Jocelyn knew she couldn't deny her mother what she wanted most. Jocelyn breathed in deeply and then out. We're staying in London. Yes, I'm sorry, Pumpkin, father said, his tone gentle. As soon as I read that letter, I wrote to your aunt asking her to help me find you, husband. He dropped his head with a gentle shake. I know I'm no good helping you with such things. Jocelyn's gaze returned to the letter. So this is what Lady Salter had meant when she said Jocelyn was out of time. It wasn't so much that Jocelyn was growing old, but that she didn't have time to waste if she wanted her mamma to see her united with a man in God's church. Jocelyn squeezed her eyes shut. Sweetie, 
Father patted her arm. Don't fret so. All will work out. Who knows? Perhaps glad news of you becoming engaged may well be enough to pull her from her fever permanently and heal your mother altogether. Jocelyn let out a halting, half-sob, half-laugh. Mama was never one whose health changed over something as fickle as good news. Father leaned forward and kissed her on the top of her head. I'm sorry if Lady Salter has been a bit of a bulldog. She's always liked your mother, and I think she's just trying to help in the only way she can. Jocelyn could understand the feeling of helplessness. Watching someone you cared about slowly get worse and worse as the days went along, never able to do anything, was the worst sort of torture. And now... Jocelyn looked up at her father and gave him the best smile she could, although she knew it looked forced. It's all right. This is what Mama wants. I'll do my best for her. He returned her forced smile with a bittersweet one of his own. I know you will, my dear. He gave her another kiss on the head and stood. I think I will leave you be for a bit. Thank you. She didn't feel quite strong enough at the moment to make it to her bedchamber, but being alone was what she wanted. The door shut with a soft click behind father. Jocelyn could do no more than stare at Mama's letter, rereading portions. She wanted to be alone, give herself time to wrap her mind around her new situation. But deep inside her heart, she feared that soon, very soon, she would be utterly alone. Without a mother to write letters to, moved to the home of a husband who would undoubtedly be little more than a stranger, with no father nearby. What would she do then? Chapter 10 this was it. Jocelyn stepped from the carriage, poised and calm. Lady Salter, who had already alighted, turned and looped her arm through Jocelyn's. We will start with your Mr. Comby. He will be in attendance tonight, correct? I believe so, Jocelyn said, though her words sounded frightfully far away. Don't worry, Emily, Father said as he stepped down behind Jocelyn. Comby will be here. This may have been what Mama wanted, and Jocelyn would do anything for Mama, but her head wouldn't stop spinning. She ran a hand across her stomach. Had her lady's maid tightened her corset too much this evening? She would be mortified if she truly fainted, no matter that such an act was seen as ladylike among the ton. Then again, if she did faint, perhaps Lady Salter would be pleased enough to leave her alone for a few moments. They entered the wide front doors to an elegant house. Jocelyn saw many a face she recognized. It certainly seemed like tonight's supper party would be a success. Their host must be thrilled. There were several notable individuals in attendance. As she glanced about the room, Jocelyn's gaze landed on the tall form of Sutby. He was here. She felt her shoulders drop ever so slightly for some reason. Knowing he was present calmed her nerves. He turned her direction and immediately their eyes locked. The tip of his lips turned up in a mischievous smile, then tipping his nose up in a perfect imitation of a man who thought himself above all else. He looked away and returned to his conversation with two older gentlemen. All the while, his hand reached inside his vest pocket and he pulled out something small and connected by a chain. A quizzing glass. Oh, good heavens, he had actually brought a quizzing glass. With a flick of his wrist, he began swinging it around in a small circle, all while standing in the first stare of fashion, and looking to all the world like a man quite full of, well, quite full of hubris. Jocelyn laughed, then quickly placed a hand against her mouth to try and muffle the sound. She glanced his way again, 
and another giggle burst from her. Gracious girl, what is it? Lady Salter said with a scowl. Nothing, aunt, only... She looked over again, which was a mistake because it only made it that much harder to stop laughing. Father watched her with a question on his brow. Then his gaze moved the same direction hers had a moment ago. She knew the moment his eyes landed on Sutby, for his entire face dropped into a scowl. That stopped her not-so-silent laugh. I didn't know he would be here tonight, Father said in a flat tone. Really, Antony, Lady Salter said. So he turned a few votes away from your tax reform, let it all go, and promise me there will be no talk of politics tonight. We are not here for you. Father's mouth worked back and forth for a moment before he finally spoke. Well, I can't promise there will be no talk of politics. His gaze moved back to Jocelyn, the scowl fully gone now. I'm not sure I'm capable of the feat. Isn't that right, sweetheart? He gave Jocelyn a smile. Don't ask me. I have even less faith in your ability to stay away from politics than you do. She said it to keep the mood light, but the truth of her own statement hit her. Father and Sutby couldn't even stand in the same room together, without one of them getting their hackles up. She would do well to remember that. Come on now, dear, Lady Salter said, patting Jocelyn's hand. Find for me this combi. So Jocelyn did. She introduced Lady Salter to Comby, then to Mr. Harrison, then to Mr. Brooks. Each gentleman stated that it was their privilege and honour to meet her aunt. Yet, all the while, Jocelyn was fully aware of Lord Sutby's movements around the room. He spoke with some gentlemen she happened to know also held seats in Lord's. Then he moved about and spoke with several ladies, one lady in particular stayed on his arm nearly the entire time. At first, Jocelyn felt the sharp bite of jealousy. The woman was certainly beautiful. Her curls were perfect, and she wasn't awkwardly tall as Jocelyn herself was. But then, at one point, when Jocelyn was introducing Lady Salter to Sir Frederickson, she overheard Sutby point to the too perfect blonde on his arm and say, and may I introduce you to my sister, Lady Cassandra Lockhart. All the tension inside her left in a grand whoosh. What it left behind was nearly as unsettling, though. She had been jealous of another woman, simply because that woman had been on Sutby's arm. Jocelyn's gaze moved to her father, standing just to her left. Gracious, if father only knew... If father even guessed, what would he say? What would Mamma say? Troubled and somewhat rooted to the spot, Jocelyn hesitated when Sir Frederickson offered to point out in more detail the brilliance of a painting on the far wall. She watched as her father, Lady Salter, and Sir Frederickson all moved that direction. Sutby was off to her right. She could feel his eyes on her. It was a mistake. She knew it before she even began, but still, she looked his way. His steady gaze proved he was giving her more than a passing glance. He watched her thoughtfully. As their eyes met, he mouthed the silent words, Are you all right? Jocelyn took a deep breath, pasted on a polite smile and nodded that she was. Turning away from Sutby, she quickly caught up to her family and Sir Frederickson. Notice the green among the ocean waves, Fredrickson was saying. It creates such movement. Do you not agree, Miss Hunt? Yes, she hurriedly agreed. Hopefully no one had noticed her hesitancy to join the group. I have ridden a small sailboat such as the one depicted many a time, Fredrickson continued. The white-capped waves here do jog more than one memory of those times. Jocelyn nodded politely though her mind kept wandering back to a very different sort of man. It was rather a shame she and Sutpy couldn't sit and talk here, as they had many times in the local hothouse. He would understand the twisting emotions, tugging inside her. No doubt he'd help her laugh and realise her situation wasn't so dire as she believed. He did that for her, 
helped her to take a step back and breathe. He also valued her opinions and listened to her closely. How many of the gentlemen she'd introduced to Lady Salter thus far tonight did half of that for her? Her eyes moved about the room. Not one. Even Comby, who was never anything less than respectful and proper, lacked the wit Sutby so well employed to make her laugh. Miss Hunt. Fredrickson's use of her name brought her attention back to those immediately around her. Do take a step closer and tell me if those waves aren't the most lifelike you have ever seen on canvas. She obliged. The painting was beautiful. It certainly left her wishing she could leave London and head for Bath immediately. But a greater part of her wished to sit with Sutby and unburden herself, tell him the details of her mother's illness and all that was now entailed for her. A tendril of heat crossed over her cheeks. No, she could not tell him that she was being pushed into marriage. That would be as embarrassing as fainting before the gathering. Worse still, he may begin to believe that she'd only sat and talked with him in the past because she was seeking a proposal from him. What a bungle that would prove to be. Not that she hadn't thoroughly enjoyed their past conversations, so much that she'd often forget that their last meeting had ended on such a sour note. Even when they disagreed, she still found his company invigorating and found herself ever hopeful that there would be more conversations to come. But to admit as much only made her uncomfortable. With her father being who he was and Sutby's father being who he was, well, it didn't take much ciphering to know furthering their conversations wouldn't add up to anything less than a complete debacle. I did not know you were quite so enthralled with art, Miss Hunt. She turned. Only now realizing she was still staring at the sailboat atop the ocean waves. Fredrickson was smiling at her as though he'd just led a duckling to water for the first time. Yes, Lady Salter said with far more encouragement in her tone than Jocelyn was pleased to hear. My niece is often quite taken with art. Thank you so much for showing this piece to us. The next quarter of an hour until supper was served, Jocelyn sat between Lady Salter and Sir Fredrickson, fencing comment after comment regarding art. She didn't allow herself another glance in Sutby's direction. It was because of him, after all, that she had inadvertently given Fredrickson the wrong impression. Jocelyn mentally shook her head at herself. Even being in the same room as Sutby upended her and led to trouble. She would do well to keep her distance from him. Despite the fact that she and Sutby could converse easily, even if they managed to find common ground between them, Issues on which they could see eye to eye, their families never would. Their morning meetings in the hothouse had been naught but fraternizing with the enemy, and enemies they would always be. Chapter 11 Felix lifted the spoon to his lips using the necessity of bending over to get the soup in his mouth without spilling it down his jacket, as an excuse to glance down the long table toward Jocelyn again. She smiled and carried on what appeared to be a mostly gay conversation, with both men sitting to either side of her. But they weren't why Felix's gaze was pulled in that direction. Though to the casual observer, Jocelyn seemed quite happy. Felix caught the lack of spark in her eyes the weight which seemed to have perched atop her shoulders, and the lack of teasing in her comments. He didn't think for a moment that she was still upset over his thoughtless comments. Several days previous, he'd been a coxcomb. But Jocelyn wasn't one to brood endlessly. Besides, though he didn't know what was troubling her, she didn't seem offended, but worried and weighed down. Somebody kicked him from under the table. Felix looked across the way at Cassandra, sitting directly opposite himself. Don't you agree? She said most innocently. Too innocently, to be exact. Cassandra spoke again to the young woman sitting to Felix's left. I must say that that shade of lavender you are wearing is really most becoming. I wouldn't at all be shocked to learn it has become the new height of fashion for the season. 
The lady on Felix's left blushed sweetly and ducked her head. Thank you, Lady Cassandra. While the young lady was looking down, Cassandra shot Felix a look, which clearly denoted she was expecting him to say something. I could not agree more, he hastily added. Quite a lovely shade, and... Gads, what was a man supposed to say about a woman's dress? I like the pearl necklace you've worn with it. They both are quite lovely. She fluttered her lashes at him and smiled demurely. Well, he didn't seem to have botched that up too badly if she simpered and swooned over such a compliment. Thank you, Lord Sutby, she said. I have wanted to speak with you. Had she? Felix tried not to let his surprise show too much. What had the lady's name been? Miss... Miss... He knew he knew it. Miss Glenhurst? That was it. Miss Rebecca Glenhurst. What about Miss Glenhurst? He felt better conversing with her now that he could remember her name. Well, I heard tell of your excellent dealings with Lord Harrington. Oh, that... Felix leaned back in his chair as a manservant removed his soup bowl, and another one replaced it with the fish course. I hadn't realized anyone took note of our conversation. Of course, Jocelyn had taken note, after he'd run his mouth off to her about it. Miss Glenhurst laughed lightly, a polite, well-practiced laugh. All of London was shocked that he turned his vote yet again. No one could rest until they learned it was thanks to you. Felix's traitorous eyes jumped to Jocelyn for a moment, though he felt certain she wasn't close enough to hear their conversation. It was nothing, just two men having a discussion. Truth was, he hadn't felt as confident in his dealings with Harrington since he'd told Jocelyn of them. I think it was really quite grand, Miss Glenhurst said. And why should she say any different? It had been a grand thing to do. It had been the right thing to do. Thank you, Felix said sincerely. The conversation flowed to a different topic, though Cassandra seemed quite pleased with Miss Rebecca's estimation of Felix. All pleasure Felix gained from the conversation, however, was more than wiped out less than an hour after supper. After the men finished their port, Felix made his way around the drawing room, speaking with lady after lady both those that Cassandra foisted upon him and those that sought him out themselves. Worse still, despite what the papers said about him being too much of a pup to fill his father's shoes, he chanced to overhear more than one matron whisper to him about being the heir apparent in reverential tones or about him having quite deep pockets in eager voices. Could not, just once, Someone care that he was a person, separate from his title and his inheritance. It seemed that if he were to ever meet such a person, it would not be in the drawing room after supper. It was clearly time he resumed his end of his and Cassandra's little challenge. Standing near the back of the room, Felix found a man he knew tolerably well. They'd shared a handful of conversations and, on the whole, the man had proven sharp and observant. Come with me, Felix said, pulling his sister closer to him as they made their way through the gathered crowd. Lord Nigel Southcott, I would like to make you known to my sister, Lady Cassandra Lockhart. Cassandra curtsied prettily as Southcott bowed. Then she commented on the guests about them. It was the same comment she'd used the past five conversations. The man certainly fit the description of tall dark and handsome. He was equal to Felix's own height, though far more broad. It was clear, too, that his girth came from active employ, and not from sitting about all day at card tables. No doubt, the man could wrestle a bull and win, if he ever so chose. That being said, Felix didn't exactly believe Cassandra and Southcott would make a match of it. She was far too prone to chattiness and ordering people about. He seemed far more prone to quiet corners and avoiding crowds in general. Still, he took a small half-step away from Cassandra and Southcott. If Cassandra was distracted enough in meeting someone new, 
Perhaps she'd stop acting as Attila the Hun, and he could have a moment of peace. Felix chanced another small step away. Neither seemed aware of his retreat, continuing their conversation without hesitation. Felix turned away from them fully and sighed his relief. Miss Glenhurst sidled up next to him almost immediately. Do you enjoy hunting, sir? So much for a moment of peace. No more than any other man. It was true. Even more true was that he was not enjoying their conversation, no matter that it had only just begun. I've heard your family has quite the hunting lodge just south of Scotland. Do you spend most of your autumns there? Felix forced himself to appear pleasant. Honestly, he didn't dislike Miss Glenhurst. He was only out of sorts just now. Still, that didn't justify him being curt with her. She seemed quite a sweet sort of thing. Yes, my family does have a lodge up that way, and it is quite a nice place to stay. Being heir to a marquise must be quite thrilling. That was it. Felix felt himself snap. Of course, the only thing she saw when she looked at him was heir to a marquise, as though it were written in the darkest ink across his blasted face. He could hear his teeth grind as he continued to force his smile in place. If you will excuse me, Miss Glenhurst. It was nearly unforgivably rude to leave her standing there so, but Felix was certain whatever was doomed to come out of his mouth if he stayed would have been far worse. Felix moved through the crowd, not making eye contact with anyone, and crossed through the open doors onto a back terrace. At least out here he could breathe. Felix slowed his pace and moved up to the thigh-high stone wall that separated the terrace and the rose garden beyond. Too bad there wasn't pianoforte out here. He could dearly use something to calm him down. The spring air was warming, steadily, day by day. It wasn't cold now as it had been when he'd first arrived in London for the season, but it was still a nice respite from the growing ever warmer drawing room he'd left behind. The sound of a twig snapping brought Felix's gaze up, and he stared more carefully out into the garden. The sun had long since set, and there weren't many tall candelabras set about the back lawn to light it. Nonetheless, he could make out a single, tall figure gracefully moving between the rose bushes. Jocelyn. Felix didn't even try and stop the smile that seeing her brought. Well, if he couldn't sit down to the pianoforte just now, a rousing spat with Jocelyn would no doubt be just as good. He watched her for a moment, aware that a true gentleman never observed a lady unawares, but not wanting to break into her reverie all the same. She always looked so at peace in a garden. Perhaps it was just her love for flowers showing through. Perhaps it was just that she was every bit as lovely as the blooms around her. Lud, when had he become so maudlin? Felix shook his head at himself. Come to vote which flowers stay and which are not good enough and must go. He spoke loud enough that she would for certain hear him, but soft enough not to be overheard by anyone still in the drawing room. Jocelyn whirled around, and immediately her eyes sparked with the challenge. She eyed him, hands behind her back, and slowly sauntered over to the low wall. Cats, but a man couldn't take his eyes off a woman when she walked like that. The ground on the other side of the wall was at least two feet lower than the terrace itself. Once she reached it, she had to look up quite far to speak with Felix. Perhaps... But do you not agree that it is a better method than blindly assuming that the rose bushes which have been here the longest must be best? I suspect you'd have all the new ones ripped out. Of course the old roses are the best, Felix said, leaning forward and resting his forearms against the wall. The movement brought their heads closer together. Want to help me? We'll go for the upstarts first. She angled her chin up at him. Some of us upstarts rather like our place in the garden. Some of us old bushes aren't all that bad. Her voice dropped low. I'd never said you were. 
Awareness of how very close they stood pricked against Felix's lips. A sudden, powerful urge to reach out and touch Jocelyn surged through him. What would it feel like to run his fingers through her hair? It was half down again tonight. A little casual for such a large supper party, but, oh, so becoming on her. Felix dropped his gaze and focused on his hands, keeping them firmly atop the wall where they belonged. You seemed a little upset tonight, he said. At supper, I mean. Not just now. You always look quite at peace among flowers. Holy heavens above, he was rambling. He never rambled. Felix knew he was by no means the most awe-inspiring specimen of masculinity in London but he had never been prone to tongue-twisted bumbling. Jocelyn tipped her head to the side, a not-quite-happy smile across her pink lips, her very distracting pink lips. I always find peace in the garden. He could smell the blossoms on her, all the different flowers she'd brushed up against and fingered moments ago, before he'd interrupted her. Do you need peace right now? Her bottom lip quivered ever so slightly, and her eyes immediately filled with tears. Gats, she was more than a little upset, more than just worried. Felix stood up straight and, pushing off the low wall, jumped over it, landing on the soft grass beside her. She blinked at him, clearly a bit surprised even as he stretched his elbow out to her. Then, come... We will find you all the peace you need. Jocelyn looped her arm through his elbow, and they walked silently toward the small rose garden. I don't want to talk about it, she said eventually. Then I won't ask. They strolled down one walkway, turned right at the fork, and strolled wordlessly down another. Even without her saying anything, Felix could feel the garden working its magic on Jocelyn. After a few minutes, her shoulders lifted a bit. A few minutes later, a soft, seemingly unconscious smile eased the tension across her face. Felix held true to his word and didn't ask what she was seeking refuge from. She stopped now and then and, bending over, smelled some of the blossoms. I do love the smell of roses, she said eventually. She wrapped a gentle hand around the head of an orange bloom, guiding it to her nose. These are particularly sweet. Felix shook his head. I hate the smell of roses. She stood up straight. You what? He only shrugged. I happen to have it on very good authority, she said, poking his chest with a finger, that you, Lord Sutby, like flowers. I do like flowers, he said, wrapping his hand around her poking finger and slipping it back around his arm once more. I just don't like the smell of roses. I've sniffed enough of the stuff in ballrooms and at supper parties to last me a lifetime. That's not real roses, though. That's only rose perfume. Perfume that smells like roses, and I've had enough. She pulled him over to a tall bush, with deep red blossoms. Smell these. They're roses. I won't like them. Trust me. Felix shot her a wary glance, but bent down anyway. He'd likely do anything that she asked. The smell, at first, was exactly like the biting, overwhelming, unwelcomed scent he'd smelled in all the ballrooms of London. But then, as he drew the scent in yet further... It turned sweeter. There was an underlying complexity he'd never noticed before. He leaned back, more than a little surprised. Jocelyn was watching him closely, her expression clearly showing she understood exactly what he'd just experienced. That's nothing like perfume. I know. She tugged on his arm. Now smell the orange ones. They're some of my favorite. Blood. Different roses smelled differently. Who would have known? For a while, they moved from rosebush to rosebush, commenting on which were their favorites and why. 
Felix even came around to admitting, eventually, and after much persuasion, that while he still hated rose-scented perfume, and would until the day he died, he did enjoy the smell of roses. So, what brought you out to the terrace? Were there no votes to be swayed indoors? He liked that the fiery bite in her words had returned. No, I've already swayed all the gentlemen present to my way of thinking, he said with an overly inflated air. Her smile broke through, brighter than before, but not so far as to be laughing. Not quite there yet. It was just as well. Felix wasn't ready to stop trying. One victory and it's all gone to your head. Yes, quite so. He nodded in his most lofty manner. Quite so. He chuckled at his own expense and then placed a hand atop hers. Actually, my sister Cassandra is bent on finding me a wife by the end of the season. Jocelyn's eyes widened. You don't say. Then her lips quirked up. I don't always agree with what those in the House of Lords do. But you seem a horrible bore to be forced on all their daughters. Great. So much for finding reprieve here in the garden. How would you feel if everyone you met saw you as only a way to either get what they want in Lords or secure their future as a marchioness? Jocelyn nodded, sincerely this time. That would be terrible. It was. Felix was most fed up with it. You know, just once, I'd love to have a day or a week as no one other than Felix Lockhart. I'm so tired of being the heir apparent. I am so tired of not being able to just be me. Jocelyn stopped in the middle of the walk and faced him. Tell me, what do you wish they could see? He knew she would understand. I like playing the pianoforte and reading. Not very Marquise-like things, but still, there you have it. What else? Spicy food? He paced first one way and then the other. Have you ever tried Spanish rice or Mexican chocolate? We had a cook for a while from Spain, and she would make the most amazing food. Granted, you felt like your mouth was on fire the entire meal, but it was incredible. You're right. I don't think most of the matrons here are going to care about those things. Felix let out an exasperated breath and threw his hands in the air. No, they won't. I guess you'd better just go in there and tell them all I'm a... What did you call me? A horrible bore? She blinked, all faux innocence. I was taught in church to always tell the truth. Troublesome woman, Felix said, closing some of the distance between them. A bit of her sauciness slipped into her looks. What do you care if I do think you're a horrible bore? He looped an arm around her waist and pulled her up closer to him, dropping his face so that their foreheads almost met. Then I would have to subject you to the same rigorous pontification I used in the infamous Harrington vote-changing scandal. Oh, please, sir, she begged, her eyes dropping momentarily to his lips and back up again. Anything but that. Oh, yes, she most certainly was a troublesome woman. Felix! The call came from the terrace, now several yards away. Where are you, Felix? Cassandra blasted it all. Felix released Jocelyn and took a small step back, putting respectable distance between them. Your sister? Jocelyn asked. Was she disappointed he'd had to put a small amount of distance between them? He hoped she was. He was? Felix nodded. No doubt she's found yet another woman whom she is certain will make the perfect next marchioness of Ramport. Jocelyn was all mock solemnity. I will pray for the woman. Troublesome and more troublesome. Now hurry along, little heir. You're being summoned. Felix chuckled and strode down the path. Then he stopped and spun around to face her. 
Do you suppose you'll be finding peace in the hothouse again tomorrow morning? Jocelyn didn't seem as weighed down now as she had been before, but some of the sadness returned to her voice. I believe I shall. Good, he said. I believe I shall be owing half of England flowers for some such reason or another. Tomorrow morning, then? she asked. Was it only his wishful thinking? Or did she sound the smallest bit excited at the proposition? He gave her a firm nod. Tomorrow. Chapter 12 He'd nearly kissed her. Gads, but he'd very nearly kissed Miss Hunt, the daughter of Mr. Hunt, the man he fought with in Parliament every time he attended, to watch the proceedings. He must have gone mad. The season had finally gotten to him and he was around the bend, headed for Bedlam, utterly gone. Felix paused before a large daisy bush. The white petals with their yellow centers seemed so innocent and naive. If only life could be like that. Simple. Straightforward. A chap meets a woman. Likes the woman. Asks the woman to dance. Never has to worry about what the woman's father would say if he saw them together. Blast it all. He was an earl and the heir apparent to a marquise. He, of all people, should not be having this problem. Felix could not think of a single other woman whose father would be upset if he paid his daughter some attention. Quite the contrary, to be precise. From the other side of the hothouse, a deep masculine voice echoed about the lilies. Probably the gardener. Felix moved that direction. Jocelyn had said she'd be here this morning. He'd expected her well before now. Of all the times they'd met here like this, she'd never arrived this late into the morning. He wouldn't blame her if she'd overslept. Last night's supper party turned out to be as late as it was tedious. He still couldn't shake the niggling unease of being in the same room with Jocelyn and not being able to openly speak with her or loop her hand through his arm. Do not worry, he'll come around. Now that was his Jocelyn. He knew her voice, her intonation, and that little bit of a lilt she used. Whenever she was trying to encourage him, he knew it far too well. Felix hurried around a corner, ignoring the fact that he was rushing after her, like a besotted fool chasing the bell of the ball. More like an ugly, decidedly below her station besotted fool chasing the bell of the ball. For, though Felix was far above Jocelyn in terms of old money and station, he knew full well he would be unwanted if ever her family knew of his true feelings. There she was, walking tall and dignified as always, except she wasn't alone and she wasn't speaking with the gardener. More than that, she had her hand looped through the man's arm. Who the blazes was he? And how dare the interloper interfere with his and Jocelyn's time in the hothouse? Felix took a side path, one that would take him parallel to Jocelyn and her mystery man, while still keeping a few flowers between them. Felix wasn't sure what he planned to do when he met the unknown gentleman but he felt certain it would be better for that man if there were some flowers between him and Felix. Just before stepping forward and into easy viewing of both Jocelyn and the man, Felix held back and slowed his pace. Combi and I will try again this afternoon, the man said. Don't worry, we'll change his mind. Hunt, why hadn't he recognized the man at first sight? Granted, Hunt was bent over his cane more heavily than usual, and he wasn't dressed in the first stare of fashion such as he normally was. I have full confidence you will, Jocelyn said, patting her father's arm. She glanced about the hothouse, her eyes passing over where Felix stood. She did a double take, her eyes locking with his. Felix smiled and made to lift a hand though he wasn't sure if he was simply waving good morning to her or full-on asking to join her and Hunt for a turn about the hothouse. Either way, Jocelyn subtly shook her head no and waved him back behind her and her father's field of view. 
Ah, so there would be no accidental meeting with Hunt and his lovely daughter. No, of all the places in London to see you again, Miss Hunt, I had not imagined I would run into you here. Then again, hiding the truth would only lead to more problems. It always had with his nursemaid when he and his brothers tried to filch biscuits between meals. Yet, either way, it didn't matter, for Jocelyn clearly did not want him to approach either her or her father just now. Rooted to the spot, Felix stood still as the hunts moved on. Jocelyn said something, he couldn't hear what this time, and led her father toward the small white bench he and Jocelyn always shared. Another wave of disappointment rushed through him. Hunt was her father. So it wasn't so terribly bad. But heaven help any other gentleman who sat there with Jocelyn. If it had been Combi, for example. Felix would have ignored Jocelyn's insistence that he stay away, march right up to the man, and toss him from the hothouse personally. Hunt sat, saying something to Jocelyn. She, however, did not sit but patted her father on the shoulder, and then turned and hurried off. She disappeared between rows of blooms, and Felix lost sight of her. Hunt, now alone, slumped heavily and, with elbows against his knees, buried his head in his hands. He seemed a man thoroughly at his wit's end. Felix honestly felt bad for the man, though they had most decidedly opposite opinions on which laws ought to be passed. Felix believed Hunt to be a good man. Upstanding, hard-working, certainly good to his family. That went a long way in Felix's book. A hand took hold of his arm and tugged him backward. Felix spun round. How had Jocelyn gotten behind him? What are you- She held a finger to her lips, silencing his question. Her hair was placed fully back in a low chignon and she wore the light pink dress he'd seen her in before. Did she have any idea how becoming she was in pink? Jocelyn pulled him back several steps, until they were secreted behind the large honeysuckle bush. Jocelyn peeked out from behind the bush, clearly checking on her father, and then moved up close to Felix. He can't see us together this morning. She was so close, nearly as close as when he'd held her last night. It would be so easy to reach out and wrap his arm around her waist again. Even just the thought of doing so felt like the easiest and most natural thing in all the world. Felix, I'm serious. Ah, blast it all. He let out a frustrated breath. Oh, why not? We've done nothing untoward. I'm sure your father and I could manage at least one conversation without it coming to blows. Not this morning. He couldn't. Her voice shook as she spoke, and tears formed on her bottom lashes. Felix reached out, taking hold of both her arms gently. Jocelyn, what happened? When we returned home last night. Her voice was thick as she spoke barely above a whisper. There was a letter waiting for us from Mama. She looked down, taking a fortifying breath. She's turned worse. Much worse. Oh, Jocelyn. He wrapped his arms fully around her and pulled her up close to him, her head resting against his chest. I am so sorry. She didn't pull away from the embrace, but leaned against him. I want to go home. Of course you do. The question was, why didn't they? If Penelope fell ill, he'd ride all night if that's what it took to get to his stepmother's bedside. I don't want to stay here, she said. I know, but I have to. You do? He would have thought her father more understanding than all that. In previous years, Mrs. Hunt had always joined her husband during the season. More than that, not a year went by, it seemed, that the papers were not scandalized at least once, when it was rumored about that Hunt had either kissed his wife in public or ignored all the other matrons at Almax, and stood up solely with Mrs. Hunt. Mama wants us to stay, Jocelyn said, not lifting her head off his chest. But please don't 
press me for details. Well, if she wasn't up to answering questions, he'd respect that. No matter that it was killing him to not understand why the whole Hunt household didn't up and leave within the hour. Felix hugged her closer. At least there was something he could do for her. She must be missing home terribly. Father's thrown himself into his work like I've never seen before. He's always been a bit of a bulldog. You know, I think I heard that somewhere. She laughed softly. <laughs> yes, well, his old self looked nearly negligent compared to who he's been as of late. Every waking moment is either spent speaking to or speaking of this member or that. Even I am starting to tire of hearing of tax reform. I had not thought such a thing was possible. I hadn't either. Slowly, she pulled back. Felix handed her a handkerchief, and she rubbed it against either cheek. Did she seem a little better now? He hoped she truly had regained a little colour in her cheeks, that he wasn't only imagining it. I'd best get back before father thinks anything is amiss. You would begrudge you a friend on a morning such as this? Of course not, but he would begrudge me time with a member of Lord's. I don't actually hold my seat of yet, Felix countered. Only my father does. I'm just an arrogant pup for now. He wanted her to smile, but instead her brow creased. Come now, Felix said. He isn't still upset because Harrington changed his vote. Her lips pursed tightly, and Felix had a hard time tearing his eyes away from them. Can you honestly say that's all you've done to stop the House of Commons' proposed changes? No. No, he could not. For weeks now, he'd been actively working to do what he felt was best for the country, and that meant not losing the funds, which would be so necessary to instigate an organised police force and better protect England's citizens. Felix didn't say anything. He knew it wasn't necessary. Jocelyn reached out and placed a hand on his chest. The touch sent jolts of heat through him. We are friends, she said. Well, that called the jolts of heat somewhat. Friends. It both encouraged him and disappointed him. Jocelyn continued. But if ever our associating was made known to the ton, it would not end well. She was right. If word of their friendship was spread through society, he could easily guess what would happen. Hunt would lose significant sway in Parliament. Jocelyn would probably be made to look like a fool. He would come out the most unscathed, but he would still look like a jackanapes who used a man's daughter against him. Felix remembered the way Hunt had slumped atop the bench. The man was grieving for a wife he couldn't be near. Felix wouldn't put him or his family through a political scandal as well. Jocelyn took another step backward. Have a good day, Felix. Before she could leave, Felix reached out and took hold of her hand. We are friends, though, right? Her small smile did his heart a world of good. Of course we are. She paused for a moment. Reluctant to leave him, perhaps? He could only hope such was true. I told my father I was asking the gardener after sending flowers to Mama. If I'm not back soon, he will come find me. Felix almost wished the man would. Then they could get his and Jocelyn's acquaintance out in the open. But no, they'd been through that already. Is your estate close enough to send hothouse flowers? Oh, no. The country estate is near Northumberland. Truly. His family had a hunting lodge up that way. A bit of a travel for blooms, isn't it? Jocelyn nodded sadly. But I would like to ask the gardener if he knows of any hothouses closer to Mama, where I might send word. I think that is an excellent idea. Furthermore, Mrs. Hunt wasn't the only one who seemed to be in need of flowers this morning. You know, I believe we not danced again last night and I feel duty-bound to send you flowers. She didn't argue, so he pressed on. I was debating between sending you some white lilies. They look quite radiant this morning. 
or some pink ones to match your lovely dress. That is a hard decision. At least her tone was lighter now. He didn't like the idea of her leaving. While she was still weighed down with worries over her mother, her father, and her acquaintance with him. Yes, quite more than an arrogant pup like myself can handle. Then might I recommend you take a turn toward the east wall of the hothouse? She lifted an eyebrow and pursed her lips. Trouble yet again. Blast, but a man could far too easily grow used to such sass. And what might I find along the east wall? You'll know it when you see it. Jocelyn gave his hand a quick squeeze before releasing it. I do not believe Father will be joining my morning stroll tomorrow. She turned and hurried off. Felix stayed behind the honeysuckle, giving her time to put some distance between them. He hated knowing an association with him would not be seen favorably by her family, knowing it would be seen in an even worse light by society as a whole. Felix spun around and headed the opposite direction Jocelyn had taken. He made his way quickly towards the east wall. He had been completely serious about sending Jocelyn flowers. It wasn't much, but he hoped it would cheer her at least a little. Felix pulled to a stop. There, between a small tree and a row of daffodils reaching the end of their blooms, was a small group of lilies. These were, without question, the ones Jocelyn had been referring to. While the centers were snowy white and covered in tiny, dark pink spots, the outer half of each petal was light pink, nearly the exact shade of Jocelyn's dress. The flower was the perfect solution to his erroneous white lilies or pink dilemma, a lily which was both. After waiting until Jocelyn and her father had left, being sure to keep out of sight where he wouldn't upset Hunt, Felix quickly found the gardener. He told the man to send every single white and pink lily he had. Felix may never be more than a secret friend, but even a secret friend could send flowers, and Felix chose to take advantage of that option to the fullest extent possible. Chapter 13 The facts are undeniable, Felix said as he strode out of the doors of White's and onto the street. Crime in England, especially London, has been on a steady rise since the French Revolution. Lord Cuntington's head bubbled back and forth, from one side to the other. Felix paused at the street. Only a fool would think that the issue will reverse itself. Compton laced his fingers together and rested them atop his ample stomach. That's a bit of foul-weather talk, son. I'm not convinced it's as bad as all that. Do you allow your wife and daughters to walk the streets of London at night? No, of course not. Any part of London? What about your house in Bath? Can they go into town without a male escort? That's hardly proof. Even if there weren't vagabonds and highwaymen, a lady of breeding ought not to go out alone. Felix wasn't going to back down. They needed Compton's vote. Every parish has reported a rise in crime, all across England, including the ones under the care of your estate in Bath. True, true, Compton nodded. Felix slapped the man on the shoulder. Just think on that when the vote comes up. Compton was known for playing it close to the vest. He rarely told others if he planned to back Commons or not before a vote and Felix didn't want to drive the man away by asking for a clear answer now. Compton lifted a hand, shaking a round finger at Felix. You are a very persuasive young man. In fact... A small boy darted out from behind them and snatched something from Compton's waistcoat pocket, before darting down the alley again. It was all so fast, the boy was back out of sight before Felix could blink. Still... He made a mental note of the direction the boy took. If that urchin thought he could get away with thieving Felix's companion, he was sorely mistaken. My coin pouch! Compton cried out. That devil stole my coin pouch! The irony was not lost on Felix. 
Then think on that when the vote comes up next. With another pat on the man's shoulder, Felix turned and ran after the boy. He rounded the corner of the building and began weaving between alleys. The boy was fast, but Felix's strides were far longer, and he soon had him in his sights again. The boy ducked around a corner. Felix hurried up to the intersection and peeked around the edge of the building. The boy was standing not far away, tucked up behind some boxes, watching. The little imp was seeing if he was being followed. Clever. Felix stayed hidden behind the building. After a full five minutes, the boy must have decided that he wasn't being followed, for he stepped out into the alleyway and pulled out Compton's leather purse. The boy, covered from head to toe in smudged dirt, smiled as coins clinked between his fingers. Who did this child think he was? Stealing another man's property just to drool over it in some alleyway? Felix leaned forward, ready to sprint, but then paused. The moment he stepped around the corner of this building, the boy would see him and be off like a rabbit again. Felix was fast, but he'd rather not chase the boy across the entire length of London. He would be better off using his brains and sneak up on the boy when he wasn't expecting it. The boy looked up, and Felix crouched closer to the building's wall. The boy looked up the alley one way and then another. Seemingly content that he was unobserved, he turned and walked away. Felix gave the boy a few strides and then followed after him. The boy turned right, then left, then another left. Never once did the little imp pause or hesitate. He was headed somewhere predetermined. Where does a thief go after he takes a man's purse? Probably to spend the ill-gotten gold. Felix would have to find a way to get up close to the boy before he spent it all, or there wouldn't be any point. The sounds around Felix changed as they entered a different part of London. The speech around him degraded, and there was more than one sailor song, sung in drunken glee, flowing out of the pubs on either side of the street. The boy opened a rusty gate and moved up a very narrow alleyway. Felix slipped through the gate before it had time to clang shut. Either side of the alley was lined with doors. Most were propped open with a rock or thick stick. There were baby cries and women's voices bouncing about the place. And the smell. Gads! Felix resisted the urge to cover his nose with his handkerchief. The boy slipped into one of the doors on the right, about halfway down the alley. With the boy being out of sight, Felix rushed forward, situating himself just outside the door. Mother, mother! The boy's voice floated out of the open door with clarity. Look what I got! Celebrate while you can. Felix shook his head. The boy's joy wasn't going to last. The only question was, did he walk in and denounce this rascal to his mother? Or just quietly ask to see the boy, give him a good talking to, and once the boy gave up the coins, tell his mother it was nothing at all. The boy was no doubt just young and prone to mischief. Felix didn't want to come off as too heavy-handed. A second voice floated out the door. Get here, boy. Though it was clearly a woman's voice, it was still deep and rough. Look, look how much there is. The boy was so excited, it almost made Felix regret that he needed to take the money back. There was the unmistakable sound of a slap, and a hard one at that. The clink of coins bouncing across the floor came next. Then the soft sob of a child. Gats, did the boy's own mother strike him? Felix stood and peeked in through the door. Penelope would be horrified if she knew what he was up to. But Felix needed to know what was going on. The boy was an imp, no doubt, but not a villainous one. He was only young and misguided. The boy was crouched on the floor, holding his cheek in both hands. The woman, whose nose and eyes looked too much like the boy to make her anything but his mother, lay on a hole-ridden couch. One glance at the tattered, black lace of her revealing dress, and Felix knew how she spent her time at night. Pick them all up! She ordered the boy, her red-stained lips curled. Be sure you don't miss none. 
The boy nodded furiously and began to quickly scoop up the various coins laying across the floor. Felix felt sick. The boy's cheek was bright red, and he looked near to crying. Go get Mama some rum. Fast light now. She barked out, lying back against the couch. The boy nodded, looking over the room, likely for any lost coins, before he hurried over to the door. Felix backstepped and ducked behind an old barrel. The boy, no longer watching for any would-be tales, ran past Felix without a second glance. Felix watched him go, no longer interested in retaking the stolen gold. He only watched the gate swing open at the boy's push. That poor boy. What he originally thought was little more than a boyish prank gone too far. He could now see was the boy's only means of eating. Would that boy be eating tonight? Or would his mother drink away all the money before then? What a fool Felix had been. Felix couldn't seem to move from the spot as he watched the gate, slowly, grindingly, swing shut once more. Chapter 14 Jocelyn, arm linked through Felix's, bent down and smelled a gold flame honeysuckle. She loved the sweetness of it. With a peaceful sigh, she stood up straight and glanced over at her companion. Felix's gaze was unseeing as he stared off at something in the distance. He was quite handsome like that, deep in thought with a touch of brooding mixed in. Jocelyn hid her sigh. She could no longer deny that he'd become far more than an acquaintance. More than someone she simply enjoyed wrangling with. You're very quiet this morning, she said. Over the past few weeks, since that night walking through Brimsby's Rose Garden and their secretive meeting behind the honeysuckle the day after, they had hardly missed a morning together, walking about the simple hothouse. He'd asked after her mamma several times. Mamma was the same, very ill, but no worse. However, he hadn't pressed her on why she and her father hadn't returned home. For that, she was grateful. Felix slowly shook his head, his gaze drawing no nearer to the present. She tugged on his arm and led him toward the small bench, which was quickly becoming one of her favourite places in all London. Felix followed her without a word. That night in the Rose Garden had forced Jocelyn to recognise the truth. She was growing quite attached to Felix Lockhart, the Earl of Sutby, which meant she was growing attached to a man whom she could never be with. To a man who, more likely than not, would never consider her as someone with whom he might form an attachment. The realisation filled her with a sad sort of restlessness. Jocelyn sat and Felix joined her. He looked weighed down, uncertain. For all of Felix's pomp, Jocelyn suspected that he was actually quite unsure of himself. Are you thinking about the boy again? Two weeks ago, Felix had told her about the street urchin whom stolen Lord Compton's purse, and of everything Felix had seen after that. He'd told her the details the following morning and then revisited the event the morning after that, and then yet again several times hence. There was nothing you could have done except walk away and let him keep the money, which you did. Felix's eyes slowly closed. I just see his little red face all the time. I know. Jocelyn's arm was still looped through his, and she placed her hand atop his arm as well. Felix ran both hands down his face, and let out a frustrated growl. I hate this. I hate going to balls and elegant supper parties, when I know that little boy is likely starving. He isn't the only one, either. No, I'm sure he isn't. Felix turned on the bench so that he faced her more fully. The movement placed their hands closer together, and Felix wrapped his around hers. It isn't like I was ignorant to such things before. I've seen starving, dirty children. I've seen bawdy women on the street. He held up the hand, not holding hers. I know I ought not to say so in polite conversation. She nodded that she understood. Truth was, his willingness to say to her what was not commonly accepted 
in polite conversation, was one of the things she liked so much about him. Jocelyn firmly believed she had no part in the progress toward a better England, if she was going to take offence over honest, if boorish, statements. I knew all of this before, Felix continued. It's not as though the things I saw were in any way shocking to me. It was just that you were still shocked. His head slowly moved up and down. Does that make me the worst sort of popinjay? Of course not. She squeezed his hand. It felt amazing that he was holding her hand, and she had to repeatedly remind herself that it didn't mean anything, that he was only upset. Still, it sent her heart racing. It's far different to see these things which, before, you had only been told of. You know, for the most of the time I was tailing the lad. I kept thinking of things my brothers and I did growing up. It's not like I never stole biscuits out from under Cook's nose, or rolled about in the mud. For some reason, I kept seeing that boy as being like me. Then, when I saw his home, cats. Felix shook his head again. You could help him, you know, Jocelyn said slowly. Him and boys like him. I don't know how. Your Lord Sutby. That title comes with a lot of sway. Earl is just a courtesy title. But you are the heir apparent to a Marquise. There is still a lot you can do that not many others could. I understand your frustration that others often only see your title and your family line. But that doesn't mean you couldn't use your title to make changes. Maybe someday. I mean now. Have you heard the news about Lady Helen Allsport? His brow creased. No. She got engaged two nights ago. Felix lifted an eyebrow. He clearly didn't see what that had to do with him or his unwanted title. She's engaged to a man, a Lord Beaver, who first made her acquaintance and asked her to dance a couple of months ago at the Henderson's Ball. Felix lifted a hand, palm up, still at a loss. You danced with her at that ball. And? Men could be so daft sometimes. Like it or not, you are the heir apparent to a marquise and currently an earl. As such, other men take note of who you dance with and often seek out your dance partners later on in the evening. I was speaking with Lady Helen's mother yesterday, and she was convinced the only reason Lord Beaver ever considered her daughter was because you danced with her first. Far short of being pleased with himself, Felix huffed as though unconvinced. I danced with her. That's hardly something to be proud of. You changed the course of Lady Helen's season. Because of you, she is marrying a man of means and respectability. He scoffed. She would have anyway. You don't know that. The Allsports have fallen on hard times as of late. Women and men of the turn marry all the time. I don't think... Stop discrediting this. You have shaped that woman's entire future. Don't you see? Where Lady Helen lives, if she's allowed to visit her family, if she is safe and has a roof over her head, you've had a very strong influence on all of that. Truth was, whenever Jocelyn stopped to think of how every moment of every day for the rest of her life, would be based on who she agreed to marry. It made her feel faint. Felix was staring off into the distance again. She hoped he was still listening. For better, I might add, she said softly. Silence. She could see him thinking, see the thoughts swirling around behind his blue eyes. Do you really think I can? he asked. Do you really think I can make a difference, as a Marquise? Of that, she had no doubt. Of course I do. That's all I want. I want to make my father proud. I want to uphold the family name and titles with honour. I want to leave this earth, having made a difference while I was here. You will. A man like him, thoughtful and easy to like, 
placed in a position of power in the House of Lords, there was little Felix would not be able to accomplish. You will make the House of Commons rule the day you were born, she said with a smirk. At least, now that you are better at listening, you will. Oh, ho, oh, and what's that supposed to mean? Felix, you grew up one way, with money and security, but many did not. It's easy for you to see how best to help others of the peerage, because their lives and struggles are similar to your own. But to help those who have grown up differently than you, you're going to have to listen closely to understand what they need. Felix watched her closely. There was a small glint in his eyes, and Jocelyn was fully aware of every inch of herself. Her hand in his, her other hand on her lap, the way her hair rested against her cheek, their knees almost touching near the centre of the bench. She was so fully aware, because she felt quite certain he was aware. Her cheeks heated and she glanced down. I'm only saying, you do have the title. Why not make some good come from it? Felix didn't say anything, but he was smiling. Jocelyn tried not to shift about uncomfortably on the bench. She didn't like being stared at so, and yet, she also very much liked that it was Felix who stared. I understand now, he finally said, his voice low enough that it caused a zip of energy to course through her. Why they say to never fraternize with the enemy. Oh, why is that? She asked. You run the risk of learning just how smart the enemy truly is. She gave him a smug smile. It was grand knowing he would understand the look for what it was. Not a serious proclamation of her own importance, but a simple tease. Well, those of us on the enemy's side are quite smart. I'm beginning to see that. His eyes grew wide. Blood, I'd nearly forgot. He pulled a small wrapped package from his jacket pocket. That bought you something. Truly. She sat up straighter. There were few things Jocelyn liked more than a present. But what would Felix, of all people, be giving her? He held out the small package, and she picked it up with both hands. It was barely the size of her palm, and wrapped in brown, with a simple twine keeping the paper in place. What is this for? You'll understand when you open it. She didn't need any more of an invitation than that. She tugged on the twine and the bow gave way. Twisting the package about gently, she removed the brown paper fully, revealing a small, light blue box. She slid the lid open. A pile of sugared nuts was nested inside. Oh, she said happily, I love sweet meats. Just have a glass of milk on hand before you try eating these, Felix said with a grin. Milk? Perhaps you are in need of glasses, Sutby. I'm a bit old for a glass of milk. She lifted her chin up. I haven't slept in the nursery for weeks now. He chuckled. It was nice to see him coming out of his melancholy. Milk does a better job at soothing your tongue than tea. Now she understood. These are spicy, then. Quite. The nod of his head emphasized the single word. I can't wait to try them. Thank you. It was very sweet of him. What touched her most, however, was not just that he'd given her something, but that he'd given her something that was special to him, a little piece of him that no one else got to see. I really am excited to taste them. Just remember what I said about the milk. I will. They sat there in silence for a bit, and a sad thought struck Jocelyn. What's wrong? Felix asked. It was nice being with someone who could read her moods almost as easily as she could. Mama had always said her face was quite expressive. But in Jocelyn's experience, that didn't always translate into those around her, understanding how she was feeling. I was just thinking that it's rather too bad we can't enjoy these sweetmeats together. I see your point. 
he said with a bit of a nervous laugh. I could call on you some morning, but I rather like my face the way it looks now. As opposed to what? How it would look after your father broke my nose and blackened my eye. He would do nothing of the kind. At least, she hoped father wouldn't do such a thing. There were times, though, when father came home piping mad from Westminster. If Felix tried to visit at such a time as that, Jocelyn wasn't at all convinced it wouldn't come to blows. She placed the lid back on the small blue box and glanced over at Felix. He was watching her closely again, and he sat very still. Miss Aunt, his voice was soft, hesitant. Would you do me the honor of allowing me to call on you? Though she'd been asked that same question many times, no man had ever asked it of her in such an uncertain tone. Jocelyn opened her mouth to respond, and then paused. Oh, how she wished she could say yes. What would it be like if Felix could call on her openly, speak with her at parties, and dance with her at balls? Glorious! That's what it would be. Simply glorious. I don't believe that would be possible. The words seemed to scrape against her tongue. His brow creased. He was clearly hurt by her refusal. She reached out to him. Felix, please, you must understand. Father would be furious. My aunt, even more so. Only yesterday evening, Lady Salter had gone on and on regarding Jocelyn's need to make a match that would further her father's political career. Her sister's marriage had helped somewhat, and James's efforts would be a boon once he was of age. But the time for tax reform was now, and that meant the whole family was looking more and more to Jocelyn to make a profitable match and push father's influence upward. I am an honorable man of good standing, Felix said, his tone not defensive, but pleading. I am not a cad. Certainly, even your father realizes as much. But you hold a prominent seat in Lords. Does that really matter so much? It does to my father. His election to Commons is everything. It's who he is. It's what provides us with our quality of life. And it's the only reason my sister made such a reputable match. It's the only reason James is able to attend university now. Without his position of power in Commons, I'm not sure what he would be. I'm not trying to take that from him. The rest of Commons would not listen to him, would not follow him if... if we made a match. Heavens, but it was bold of her to state what she only believed his intentions to be. He'd never stated even half so much aloud. But if he wasn't interested in making a match... He wouldn't be asking to call on her, right? She met his eyes, willing him to not pull back, not say she'd read too much into his request. Felix leaned in, cupping his hand around her cheek. Commons has far too much respect for your father as it stands. I have to believe that wouldn't be the case. You don't know that. He didn't say he hadn't meant they could make a match of it. But he hadn't said they could, either. Blast. If only he'd come right out and say something. Her heart was beating so hard he could probably hear it. His hand against her cheek was warm, and the tingling against her face told her she was blushing. We can make this work, he said, not pulling back. I promise you we can. I wish we could. Then let's try it. Allow me to call on you and we'll go from there. It sounded so simple when he said it that way. Still, every time she tried to imagine Felix knocking at the front door of her townhouse, all she could see after that was Father yelling and Lady Salter sending Jocelyn to her room. Worst of all, Mama would be so disappointed. I'm sorry, she whispered. His hand dropped and he stood. Jocelyn's heart ached partially from pounding so hard, but even more so from the feel of him moving away. She could almost feel the waves of agitation rolling off of him. His shoulders were tense, 
and he tapped the fingers of his right hand against his thigh. He could get quite bulldogged himself when a cause was important to him. She loved that about Felix. What was she thinking? Felix meant a great deal to her, and he clearly was willing to brave the consequences with her. She'd never been one to stand down from a fight. She'd gotten her fire from her father, Mama always said. Perhaps, she said, perhaps if I spoke with father first, I could mention to him that you and I have had a couple of conversations at various parties and the like, and... She wasn't sure where to go from there. Jocelyn stood as well. I'm sure I'll think of something more to say. Felix wrapped an arm around her waist and pulled her close. You could always claim you mean to indoctrinate me with the ways of commons and render me completely useless to lords. Giving him her most saucy smile, she looped her arms around his neck. Her fingers worked their way through the hair, along the back of his neck, as though of their own accord. Claim to. That, my lord, has been the plan from the beginning. He chuckled low as his head bent down. His lips brushed against hers, soft, tentative, more question than declaration. It was a light kiss, but still it lingered. She could almost taste his uncertainty, but also his hope. Such emotions were easy to recognize, for they mirrored her own. Felix broke the connection, but didn't pull away. Please do not wait long to speak with your father. Chapter 15 Jocelyn willed her hand to move at a normal pace as she lifted a fork and placed the last bite of eggs into her mouth. Though father didn't know it yet, immediately after breakfast she was going to see him in his study. After speaking with Felix yesterday, after kissing Felix yesterday, Jocelyn was determined to not let time slip by, even if she didn't yet feel up to the task at hand. But never mind that. She'd never shirked a difficult conversation before, and she wasn't going to now. She'd given herself one day, yesterday, to figure out the best method to broach the subject. Jocelyn rested her fork near her half-empty plate. First off, father was usually in better humour in the mornings, before he read the daily paper and got bogged down with the news of the day. Second, she wasn't above buttering him up a bit. She'd learned as a young girl that a kiss on the cheek could go a long way to getting what she wanted. Lastly, when it all came down to it, father appreciated bluntness. She would lay it out honestly and succinctly. No beating about the bush, no hinting or implying. She and Felix had formed a connection, one that they were both eager to pursue further. To that purpose, Felix wished to call on her some morning, and they both wished for father's blessing in that. Oh, gracious. But just thinking of saying so much to father made her stomach roll. Jocelyn placed a hand against her waist. Perhaps she should have skipped breakfast this morning. Well, there was no point waiting any longer. Father would be in his study by now, and if she didn't hurry, she'd be competing with his morning paper, and that would only complicate things. She would speak with father and then hurry over to the hothouse and see if Felix was still there. She'd no doubt he'd be waiting for her this morning, but she wanted to speak with father before seeing him again. Standing, Jocelyn kept her chin up and a calm smile pasted on her lips. The lips Felix had kissed, the memory, each and every time, brought with it the same rush she'd felt in the moment. Jocelyn hadn't thought much about kissing Felix before then, yet when his lips had met hers, she'd known she wanted it. She'd wanted the kiss to keep going, wanted it to deepen and last. The study door had never looked so big before. Jocelyn's brow dropped. She was being ridiculous. Felix was an upstanding man. He was well respected and had always been nothing short of a gentleman to her. Above all, she cared for him, most deeply. Surely father wouldn't let politics ruin this for her, would he? Either way, she was about to find out. Jocelyn rapped lightly on the door. Enter. Father sounded distracted. 
What was he busy with this morning? If someone in Parliament was causing a row and setting her father on edge, that wouldn't help her cause any. Jocelyn opened the door and stepped inside. Father was seated at his desk, head bent low over a sheet of paper. It wasn't the newspaper, though, so that was good. Reading the headlines usually put him in a bit of a sour mood. For an hour or two afterward, Jocelyn moved up closer and saw that it was a letter. Father glanced up and then did a double take when he saw her. Sweetheart, good morning. Good morning, Papa. He set the letter down, stood and moved around the desk to her. I've a letter from your mamma this morning. Jocelyn's heart both sank and fluttered. Is she? Just fine. Father broke in. He must have seen the worry on her face or heard it in her tone, for he placed his hands on her shoulders and gave her a reassuring smile. She is no worse, and as of the day she wrote this letter, experiencing something of a reprieve. Tension rushed from Jocelyn. That is a blessing. Father nodded. It most certainly is. Now, what can I do for you? The thought of what she needed to say next brought renewed apprehension that even good news from her mamma couldn't sway. I'd need to speak with you on something rather important. His smile straightened, and he eyed her intently. She apparently didn't need to worry about his thoughts being split between her and something else. She clearly had his full attention. Father moved back around and sat at his desk, motioning for Jocelyn to take the seat across from him. He waited quietly for her to continue. Jocelyn folded her hands together, but couldn't get herself to relax against the large, masculine chair in which she sat. She opened her mouth, but still hesitated. This shouldn't be so hard. She'd practiced multiple times yesterday. She would start with saying how Mama and he wanted her to find a suitable match. Then she'd move on to how Felix was an upstanding gentleman and that everyone believed so. Jocelyn? Father watched her, elbows against the tabletop. She closed her eyes and let the first thing she could get out fly from her mouth. I would love him, Papa. Oh, drat. That was not what was supposed to come out first. She never even thought such a thing. Except, now that she'd said it, she knew it was the truth. He slowly leaned back. So slow, in fact that she watched him lean back, back, back until he was fully resting against the chair. Love whom? His words were stiff, cold. There was a loud knock at the study door. Jocelyn silently thanked the heavens for the brief reprieve. Not now, father called and immediately turned back to her. Jocelyn? His tone held as much warning as it did question. Remember the whole point was for me to find a match. And he is a wonderful gentleman, honest and kind. You would like him if you only gave him a chance. The knock sounded from the door a second time. Jocelyn glanced that way. It was quite unlike a manservant to knock yet again. After being told now was a bad time. Father ignored the knock altogether. The man's name. It wasn't a question, but a demand. All I ask is that you put politics aside for one moment. Father's brows shot sky high. Yes, it was a nigh-on impossible request, but if Father could only stop thinking of Felix as a future member of Lords, even for a moment, he'd realize Felix was a highly suitable match. The study door opened and Combi hurried into the room. Have you seen it? He asked without so much as a greeting first. Father stared at her, not acknowledging Combi in the least. Combi, for his part, didn't acknowledge that he wasn't being acknowledged. Instead, he pushed a copy of the morning newspaper across the desk, towards Hunt. Commons will be in an uproar, no doubt. Lords, too. The words Commons and Lords dragged Hunt's attention to Combi. Combi glanced over, and, seeing Jocelyn, his eyes widened. So you have seen it then? Jocelyn's skin pricked. Whatever was in the paper, she had the sinking feeling it related to her. That, most certainly, could not be a good thing. 
Father took hold of the paper and tugged it close to him. Jocelyn waited patiently. She wanted to reach out and grab it, but knew better. Father's face turned red, and then, much to Jocelyn's surprise, he turned and scowled at her. Do you care to explain yourself? Father's tone had never sounded so angry. Yes, she'd seen him get upset at Parliament, even raise his voice when debating with other men. But never, not even as a little girl, had he heard his malice turned on her like it was now. What was in the paper? Chapter 16 Felix paced across the room until he stood inches from the library wall. Spinning on his heel, he paced back the way he'd come. Jocelyn had not been at the hothouse this morning. He'd waited for over two hours. Was she upset he'd kissed her? He actually hadn't asked her permission first. He should have. Their relationship was tenuous at best, and he'd gone and made a mull of it by kissing her without asking. What a dunderhead nincompoop he was. Or maybe Jocelyn had spoken with Hunt and he'd forbidden her to see Felix again. Or maybe they'd talked and Jocelyn had changed her mind about even wanting Felix to court her. Felix respected Hunt. He was a smart man and certainly tenacious. He respected Hunt all the more, for he had helped to raise an intelligent and equally tenacious daughter. Felix didn't expect the man to welcome him with open arms, but surely he wouldn't let Felix's future title and seat in Lords stand in the way of his daughter's happiness. Felix thought back over what he knew of Hunt. Everything seemed to centre around the man, persuading Lords to listen to Commons and see things their way. Stop him and Jocelyn because of Parliament? Yes, yes he would. Felix pushed off the wall and, turning, continued to pace. Sit down, Felix, you're wearing a hole in the rug. His sister's voice brought him to a quick stop. Cassandra, when did you walk in here? She looked up at him from the settee, the society column in her hands and one brow lifted. I was here before you even walked in. Ah, he probably ought to feel sheepish for having been so unaware as all that. But he was too upended thinking about Jocelyn for any other emotion to register. His leg bounced in place as his doubts built up. Cassandra eyed him closely. What's got you all twisted up? He waved away her question and returned to pacing. He ought to be able to do something. Anything would be better than filling the library with footsteps which took him nowhere. Well, I am quite sure you aren't distraught over having failed me so horribly. In what way have I failed you? His tone was tight. He wasn't in the mood for his sister's teasing. You introduced me to no more than half a dozen gentlemen all season. How is a lady to make an advantageous match with so few options? Oh, that. I apologize. Hopefully that would be enough. And she'd leave him alone now. Felix needed to see Jocelyn. Make sure she hadn't changed her mind regarding him. Where would he ever find another woman like her? Jocelyn had helped open his mind to so many things. He thought about problems differently because of her. He faced them differently. He wanted her and no one else. Is it a lady? Whatever gave you that idea? Felix's tone sounded strange to his ear. Too rushed and too forced. Cassandra laughed lightly. <laughs> oh, you have it bad. I do not have it bad, whatever it is. Though he knew fully well what it Cassandra referred to. Felix glanced up at the ceiling and let out a slow breath. Cassandra was right. He did have it bad and he needed to calm down. He was being ridiculous. It had only been one day since Jocelyn agreed to speak with her father. No doubt... She wanted to do so before seeing Felix again. It was the logical explanation, and Jocelyn was certainly logical. Felix tried to relax his shoulders, and still the anxious twitching which seemed to fill both legs. Everything was fine. But his stomach didn't agree, 
something was off. Only he didn't know what he was expecting to go wrong. Making his way back toward the chair closest to Cassandra, Felix forced himself to sit. Though the moment he did, his leg began bouncing in place. Well, at least he wasn't pacing now. He'd have an easy conversation with Cassandra and stop worrying about Jocelyn and Hunt. When Jocelyn was ready to speak with Felix again, he had no doubt she'd find him. Felix turned toward Cassandra, ready to ask her what she planned to wear to that night's opera. Perhaps he could even find another gentleman or two who were honorable and clever enough to warrant an introduction to his sister. However, Cassandra's carefree smile was gone. She stared at the newspaper with her mouth hanging. She'd even gone a bit pale. His earlier question of gowns and introductions died on his lips. Cassandra? She glanced up at him, then narrowed a glare his way. You wouldn't. Tell me you would never have done such a thing. What was she talking about? The knuckles across her hands were growing white. She was holding the papers so tightly. Cassandra shook her head. They say London changes people, but I never thought you capable of such a thing as this. Were the papers talking about him again? Felix quickly thought back to every conversation he'd had the past few weeks. He'd spoken with gentlemen at Westminster and several times at White's, but none of those had even led to raised voices. There had been parties and picnics and balls, but he hadn't bothered paying any young lady special attention. He'd been too busy wishing he was spending the time with Jocelyn. Well, Cassandra pressed, say something. Say what? Felix sputtered. I have no idea what you're talking about. You should. Why should he know? It had to be something in the paper that had upset her. Felix reached over and tore it from her hands. The paper ripped loudly down the middle. Felix! Cassandra cried. He didn't care. The blasted paper was clearly the cause of her consternation. If ripping it to shreds would prove a plausible solution, he'd gladly do so. It would no doubt be cathartic to himself as well. First, though, he needed to figure out what the paper said that was so unsettling. The source of Cassandra's distress wasn't hard to find. In the center of the page was a larger-than-normal political caricature. The image included the make of an ugly man and an even more ugly lady. The man's chest was puffed out, and he was wearing a sash which simply read, Lords. The lady was drawn to have a hideously long face and limbs. She crouched near the man's feet, looking up at him with large eyes, in which two hearts were drawn. Instead of wearing a sash, the lady held a sash in her hand, looking very much as though she'd only just removed it. The sash read, Commons. Felix's heart sank. This wasn't what he thought it was, was it? He looked closer. The man's hair was cut just as his own was. His nose was large, and his chest even more egregiously enlarged. But it was him. Now that he looked at it over again, there was no doubt the man was him. Worse yet, the lady was Jocelyn. The artist had done her no favors, elongating her slender form to stick-like proportions. There were a few more words scrawled across the top and beneath the figure's feet. But Felix didn't need to see more. The intent was clear. They had been found out, and now the paper was making it appear as though Felix had been playing with Jocelyn's heart in a cruel tactic to undermine Commons. He was painted as a jackanapes, Jocelyn painted as a fool. This had to be why she hadn't met him in the hothouse that morning. Would she ever be willing to speak with him again? What an idiot he'd been. Of course, she would face the brunt of this. He never should have continued to seek her out. Now she was paying for his stupidity. Felix stood, crumpling the paper and ripping it fully in two. How dare they treat Jocelyn thusly. Folding the paper in on itself, he ripped it again. He'd find out who first drew such a thing and run the man from town. That's what he'd do. Another rip and small pieces of the paper fluttered down toward his feet. He ripped it one last time and flung the entire thing to the floor. Hang the stupid papers.
He needed to see Jocelyn. Needed to make sure she was all right. Felix was vaguely aware that Cassandra was watching him, far more silently than he'd ever imagined her capable of during such a scandal. But he didn't care what she thought just now. A scandal. Blasted all. He'd somehow led Jocelyn right into this mess. It was his fault. He would have to find some way of fixing it. Excuse me, my lord. A manservant said, bowing. What? Felix barked. Lord Ramport is requesting you to join him in his book room. Father. Of course father knew by now. Such a thing as this was going to be known by every member of the ton before supper. It wasn't likely to blow over any time soon, either. Felix twisted his lips to the side. He truly needed to see Jocelyn. Tell him I will be there in an hour's time. There is something I must see to first. Begging your pardon, the manservant didn't leave as Felix had hoped. But his lordship was rather insistent on you joining him immediately. Felix's fist opened and closed repeatedly. He had to speak with his father. That couldn't be avoided. But there certainly wouldn't be anything they could do right now to avoid the scandal. Nothing that couldn't be postponed by an hour, surely. Cassandra's gentle hand rested against his shoulder. You can't go see her, Felix. Her voice was soft, but firm. He didn't even bother puzzling out how she knew exactly what he'd been thinking. He just accepted it. I have to. Doing so will only make matters worse. I don't care what the ton thinks of me. Worse for her, Cassandra said. Now go speak with father. He'll know what's best to do. Cassandra was right. Again. Openly visiting Jocelyn would only fuel the rumours and drag her name through yet more mud. No matter what, he wouldn't do that. Slowly he nodded and moved toward the library door. Father's bookroom was only three doors down, Yet walking there felt remarkably similar to how he, as a boy, had imagined walking the plank of a pirate ship would feel. Felix didn't bother knocking, but pushed the door open. Father. He greeted the man behind the desk. Felix had a few friends at university refer to meeting with their fathers as facing the devil in his den. Felix had never felt that way when needing to speak with his own father. Until just now. Now, facing the devil in his den, most accurately described the heavy mood of the room and even heavier glower on his father's face. Chapter 17 How had they been found out? Jocelyn stared at the paper in her hands. As bad as her initial glance over had proven the caricature to be, a more detailed study made her feel sick. The details the artist knew, the lilies in the background, their favourite bench resting just behind Felix. The dress the lady in the picture wore looked shockingly like the light pink one Felix so obviously loved. How had he known all these things? Who had he paid to spy on her and Felix? Most mornings, she'd not even been aware there was anyone else in the hothouse, besides them and the gardener. Would he have done this? Spilled all he'd seen in hopes of earning a few coin? He'd never struck her as an untrustworthy sort, but then again, what did she really know about him? I believe, Hunt said, drawing the words out slowly. You had something you wished to say to me. Well, the Marquis of Ramport said, his voice booming through the bookroom as he shook a copy of the paper in a tight fist. Care to explain yourself? Felix lowered himself down into the chair across from his father. I meant her no harm, sir. You meant her no harm, before or after you used her to undermine Hunt. Though Felix knew his father to be wrong, the statement still cut through him. Ramport didn't allow him time to respond. I, I th 
thought I raised you to be better than this. You told me you were ready to step up and lead the family. Now you go and do something like this. More shaking of the paper. Stop looking at that. He wanted to lean over the desk and rip the blasted paper from his father's hand. Just as he had torn it from Cassandra. He'd tear up each and every copy out of every grip in all of London if he could. Tear them, shred them, burn them. But he couldn't. And even if he could, it wouldn't stop anything. The news was out, and that was something he could never rescind. You have to understand, he tried. We first met at a musical at the beginning of the year. We only had one brief conversation, and in all honesty, it wasn't a very pleasant one. It was strange thinking about that first row. He saw her so differently now. It was hard to reconcile that first conversation with who they were now. After that, we saw each other again in a hothouse three streets over. It was all quite unintentional, I can assure you. I wheedled him in a bit, I suppose. Jocelyn admitted he had been quite insufferable at the musicale, but then he wasn't that next morning. Instead of being pompous and rude, he only laughed at himself, and then he sent me that massive bouquet of burgundy lilies. Those were from him, Comby said. Jocelyn had nearly forgotten the man was in the room, and he remembered the flowers. She hadn't thought he'd been all that bothered with another man sending her such stunning flowers at the time. Still, she didn't like how Comby was eyeing her now, with disappointment and distrust. Worse than that, he looked at her like she was a mess to clean up, one he didn't feel he had the time to bother with. Jocelyn lifted her chin. Yes, those were from him. He only huffed and folded his arms across his chest. She wasn't proud of hurting him, only, he didn't look as though his heart was hurt, just his pride. And she most certainly didn't have the time right now for dealing with something as fragile as a man's pride. She fought the urge to scowl at Comby, and they called women delicate. Clearly, whomever first decided such had never had to dance around a man's bruised ego. Felix wouldn't have folded so easily. He would have either gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with her or simply laughed at himself. Moreover, this time round, she wasn't going to chide herself for thinking well of Felix, even seeing him more favorably than any other man of her acquaintance. Yes, he was the best man she knew, and yes, she would admit that to herself and anyone else who wanted to know. There was no mistaking it. Jocelyn was the most fascinating and intelligent woman he knew. It just hadn't started that way. It's not as though we planned it all, Felix continued. His father had been content to listen quietly so far, and Felix wanted to speak his entire side before Ramport decided the time for listening was over. She can get so blastedly opinionated... It's rather a miracle we kept finding things to talk about. Then we started laughing together. Next, we actually started agreeing. I'm not even sure how it all went from that first meeting to this. He motioned to the paper as his thoughts jumped yet again to the soft kiss he'd shared with Jocelyn. What he wouldn't give to relive that moment. But here we are. His voice trailed off. There wasn't much more to say, really. He'd fallen for her, heaven help them all, but he had. He glanced up at Ramport. His father was not smiling. There was no softness, no understanding, only disappointment. How far? Ramport finally said, his voice breaking. Excuse me, sir? This time, Ramport's voice boomed. How far have you taken things with Miss Hunt? Felix rocked back in his chair slightly. Was his own father seriously accusing him of compromising Jocelyn? Truly, if any other man had hinted at such things, Felix would have planted his fists in the man's face. As it was his own father, such was clearly out of the question. Still, the question stung, so much so he couldn't seem to speak. 
His own father thought him capable of such a thing. These past several weeks he'd thought his father was pleased with all he'd done, and was possibly even growing proud of Felix. Apparently, he'd only imagined as much. Well, Ramport demanded. I kissed her, Felix muttered. Speak up like a man, Felix. Felix's jaw slammed shut, and the resounding knock echoed about his head. Anger bubbled hot inside his chest, and he stood, leaning over Ramport's desk. I kissed her, sir, and that is all. Each word came out clipped and harsh. I have been nothing but gentlemanly toward her. We met as friends, and yes, I have now developed deeper feelings for her. I want to call on her. I wish to court her openly. He took in a deep breath, and it rushed out with his final words, with or without your permission. Spinning about, he headed toward the door. Come back here, Ramport called. No son of mine will leave such a mess of his own making for others to clean up. Head high, Jocelyn turned back to her father. Do you not think, sir, that this conversation would be better continued in private? Father was clearly thinking over all he'd just learned. He'd taken up his deep in thought posture. Chin in his hand and elbow against his armrest, sir," Comby said, a hint of belligerence in his tone. "Forgive my bluntness, but this is not a family matter. This affects all of Commons." They waited, she and Comby watching Hunt, waiting for his verdict. Jocelyn could understand why Comby would call this a matter for all of Commons. She wasn't blind to the fact that this would affect them all. At the same time, she felt this conversation truly should be only between her and her own father. Stay, Comby," father said at length. Once we have heard the whole of the story, I will want your thoughts when we discuss what is best to be done next. Comby shot her a triumphant glance before pulling a chair over. He angled it away from her, however, and sat almost directly beside Hunt. Now, Hunt turned his attention back to Jocelyn. Has Sutby ever, even once, tried to persuade you to his way of thinking? Jocelyn wasn't sure how to answer that. We've spoken on a variety of topics, and we haven't agreed on several of them. But has he pushed you, urged you to speak his opinions to others in Commons? Comby spoke up before Jocelyn could. It would be so like a member of Lords to use a woman to undermine his opponents. Jocelyn could not stop the huff of frustration that Comby's statement elicited. That was never Felix's intention. Comby's brow lifted at the sound of her using Sutby's Christian name. She continued on, ignoring him. We spoke as you taught me to do, Father, as two intelligent individuals who care about a great many topics. Surely her own father did not think her so naive as to be turned by a moor. Surely he of all people thought more of her than that. I believe your statement earlier, Hunt said. From before Comby joined us, makes your standing in this matter quite clear. Therefore, let us turn our discussion to solutions. Was that it? She wasn't going to have to belabor why she cared for Felix. Jocelyn felt a touch relieved, yet also dismissed. The main point is to prove to society that you are not, in fact, Sutby's puppet. And, Comby added, speaking directly to Hunt, that you, sir, are not his unknowing puppet by association. Precisely, Hunt nodded. Jocelyn sunk further into her chair. Her heart sinking even further than that, she'd hurt her father, possibly even materially wounded his chances. At making a change in England, he'd lost political grounds thanks to her. All she'd ever wanted to do was help, and now she'd gone and done the exact opposite. First thing we need to know, Hunt said, standing and ringing for a servant, is where Sutby will be tonight. Tonight. Jocelyn broke back into the conversation. Whatever for? 
Because, her father said, wherever he is going to be, that's where we will be too. Felix released the book room's door handle. His father was right. He'd made a mess. He would clean it up. He turned back around. What do you propose? Tonight you will attend the opera as planned, Ramport said, his voice less loud but no less firm. You will turn out in the first stare of fashion. You will speak to all of our acquaintances, both gaily and unaffected by this nasty bit of business. When people ask you about the caricature, you will laugh it off. Make it clear you aren't the least bit bothered by such an outright lie. And then you will change the subject. You will stay out late, be seen by as many people as possible while having a grand time. And then you will return home and tomorrow you will start the real work. Felix could see the wisdom in the plan. If he could convince most of London that the papers had it all wrong, even possibly go so far as to make the others feel a bit silly for having believed something so ridiculous, then everything should blow over. But would Jocelyn feel silly for having believed he truly cared for her? He wasn't sure which would be worse for her. To be spoken of unkindly throughout all of London, or to be made to feel that he had played her for a fool. Sir, he tried, are you certain there isn't any other way? Rambord's gaze pinned Felix down. You will not speak to Miss Hunt. You will not address her, nor in any way acknowledge an acquaintance with her. Not tonight, nor ever in the future. You most certainly are to never accidentally see her, in the hothouse or anywhere else. I will not be unkind to her. Good, because you showing any sign of having a tender for her, or even a passing connection, would be the most unkind thing you could do right now. It would be fuel for the fire. Ramport sighed, and for the first time, his tone softened. If you care for this woman at all, Felix, you will walk away from her and pray you have not ruined her reputation beyond the point of saving. Yes, sir. Father was right. Any kind of communication between him and Jocelyn right now would only serve to further destroy her reputation. Head hanging low, Felix turned and left the book room. I have it on good authority that Sutby will be attending the opera tonight, Comby said. Excellent. Hunt turned to Jocelyn. You'll be there as well. Tell your lady's maid you want to look exceptionally lovely tonight. Wear your best dress. We'll speak with all our most lofty acquaintances and appear completely unaffected. We will proudly show you off to all and sundry, and prove that there is nothing to this insane caricature. She would be there, in the same room as Felix. Jocelyn both wanted desperately to see him, and at the same time didn't know if she could face him with dozens of onlookers about. Are you sure that's wise? Comby asked. Suppose Sutby wishes to make matters worse. If he were to try and speak with Miss Hunt, it could be disastrous. Hunt nodded. It's true, Jocelyn has more to lose than Sutby. But if the man has any shred of decency left in him, he will leave us alone. What do you think, Jocelyn? Can we trust him to be a gentleman tonight and let us regain some of our standing? Jocelyn's head was swimming. She would be in the same room as Felix, and all those around them would know they'd been meeting secretly. Yes, Jocelyn's voice was small, but she was certain on this one thing. I could trust Felix to act the gentleman in any situation. Her firm declaration seemed to both please and trouble her father. It seemed they were, both of them, swimming in a strange mix of various emotions, all of which were unpleasant. You must understand, Hunt continued. You may not speak to Sutby. Do not glance at him. Most certainly do not smile at him. You will ignore him. Turn your nose up at him if he draws near. Then possibly, just possibly, we can come out of this 
with a shred of dignity still intact. Chapter 18 Felix knew the night was going to be hard. He'd anticipated the agony of having to sit casually in his family's box while more eyes glanced his way than he'd ever been scrutinized by before. The whispers, too, he'd anticipated. But this, oh, devil hang it all, this was much worse than anything he could have imagined. No one in the whole blasted theatre seemed the least bit interested in what was happening on stage. Instead, every head in the house seemed to be on a perpetual hinge, swinging from him to Jocelyn, back to him, back to Jocelyn. More than a small part of his brain understood why she was here tonight. As a woman, she had far more to lose than he did in this whole cursed debacle. Yet, here she was, attending the same opera as he. In doing so, she and the Hunt family were sending a clear message to the ton. Jocelyn would not be backing down. She wasn't going to slip into the background and hide from rumours. She wasn't going to accept society's condemnation by staying silent. Jocelyn Hunt was not going to let this ruin her. He had expected nothing less. She was fiery when snubbed and passionate about those things she cared for. He had no doubt she would come out of this well-respected. That didn't ease the guilt churning inside his stomach, however. No doubt, for tonight she was enduring as much humiliating scrutiny as he was. Knowing he was the sole cause of her extreme discomfort, it was enough to make a man wonder if he would ever be anything more than a blackguard and a cad. His valet had taken extra time tonight, getting Felix's cravat just so and being sure not a single wayward wrinkle marred his appearance. It appeared Jocelyn had taken similar actions. Her dress, cream with lavender flounces along the skirt, was stunning on her. Her hair, too, was up with the loveliest cascade of curls down her neck. She probably smelled like flowers again tonight. He couldn't remember a time when she didn't. Though, which flowers she had been lingering about her changed from day to day, depending on which ones she'd been arranging or admiring. The lilies were all but gone for the year. Would he ever be able to see a lily without thinking of Jocelyn? Penelope, sitting to his right, coughed slightly and bumped her shoulder against his. Don't look at Jocelyn. Right. That was part of tonight's objective. He needed to show society that he and Jocelyn weren't, in any way, attached to one another. Blast, but even thinking the idea felt so horridly wrong that it made his stomach roll yet more. He forced his gaze away from Jocelyn and back to the stage. Felix rested his elbow against the armrest and planted his head in his hand. Perhaps if he held his own head just so, he could keep his eyes away from her. Was she all right? More than anything, Felix had wanted to call on her and ascertain how Jocelyn was holding up. He knew she was strong, but he wanted to be sure for himself. She certainly looked all right tonight, but he wasn't allowed to even walk by her, let alone speak with her so he'd only caught glimpses of her from between the crowds. With this on top of her mother's ailing health, how would she not want to run and hide? Penelope's elbow smashed into his, forcing his own elbow off the armrest unexpectedly. His arm, and with it his head, dropped. Felix pulled himself back upright. He had been looking at Jocelyn again. Blast! He folded his arms and scowled at the stage. It is nearly intermission. Penelope's tone was kind and understanding. She'd been far more sympathetic to his plight than father had been. When that time comes, would you be so kind as to fetch me a drink? I'm afraid it's rather stuffy in here tonight. Of course. Felix nodded absently. She was only sending him to give him a task, no doubt in hopes it might keep him out of trouble. If only he could be diverted by stuffy rooms and his stepmother's need for a drink, he could still feel Jocelyn's presence in the opera house, even when he wasn't looking at her. He could feel her there, all the while knowing she was much too far away for him to reach out and take her hand. They could be standing directly beside each other, 
and she would still be too far away. Blessedly, intermission did arrive. Felix leapt from his seat. Would you care for anything, Cassandra? He asked, already making his way past their seats. She nodded that she would also like a drink. I think I'll join you, Father said, rising. That's all right, sir. Felix tried to keep his words loose, but they came out tense anyway. I am quite capable of securing two drinks for the ladies on my own. He strode out of the box before Father could argue otherwise. He needed some time away from them all. Father's disappointed stare, Cassandra's troubled and simultaneously accusatory silence. Penelope's understanding tone was more easily endured, yet it had begun to border on pity. Gads, but he hated this. Nearly every individual Felix passed took one look at him, diverted their eyes, and then began whispering as soon as he'd passed. Felix ground his teeth. This was exactly what he was trying to smother. He needed to smile more, at least appear like he was having a pleasant evening. Felix passed a couple of men he knew. He forced himself to clap one of the chaps on the back and stop for a brief chat. After that, he moved on to a small group of ladies, whom he'd had a casual acquaintance with. He complimented their attire and asked over their general health. When one of the ladies hinted, not so subtly, at the newspaper caricature, Felix did just as he ought. He laughed jovially with a, Those reporters, I am quite convinced now that they just make up whatever they feel will be most diverting and print that. He didn't deny having a close acquaintance with Jocelyn, and thankfully no one pressed the point. Nonetheless, every one of the half-dozen conversations down the long hall tugged at Felix. Felix moved up beside the long table serving drinks. He'd forgotten to ask his father if he'd like a drink. Perhaps he should bring one just to be safe. Then again, if he got back to the box with only two and father mentioned he also wanted a drink, perhaps Felix could take a second trip out here and miss part of the second half of the opera. But no... He had hated sitting in the opera box while everyone was staring at him. He, unable to stare at the one woman he truly wanted to see. But this? This was even worse. Felix scooped up a third drink just to be safe. He wasn't thirsty himself. And after delivering these, he could return to being on silent display in the family box. While Felix forced himself to nod and smile at those he passed, he didn't stop to talk to anyone as he headed back towards the stairs and hallway. I couldn't stop laughing for half the day. I've never seen a woman so hideous. Felix's footsteps slowed. I can't imagine any man ever seeking a connection with a lady so, so spindly. The small group of young men laughed. Felix knew he should keep walking. He should hold his head, smile and leave. Instead... He remained rooted to the spot. I've never met the lady before, one of the young men said. You must point her out to me. They were young, barely out of Eton, no doubt. Young and pompous and far below Felix's notice, which were all good reasons to just turn and walk away. No, oh, oh, wait until you see her. I swear the caricature is quite true to life. Walk away. Walk away. Instead, he turned slowly on one heel and moved up close to the threesome. Not noticing him, they made another disparaging remark, then another even worse than the first few. Felix's face burned and his teeth remained clenched tight. You know, I'm fairly sure I saw the lady this evening, <laughs> right over... The young man turned, his outstretched finger grazing over Felix's chest. The three young men instantly grew silent. Felix wanted to throttle each and every one of them, but his goal tonight was to show he was unaffected. More than that, his hands were full of drinks. It was just as well because if they weren't currently circled around glass cups, they no doubt would have been circled around these men's collars. I do believe, Felix said slowly and clearly, you have enjoyed enough of the opera for one night. Perhaps it is better if you retire now. 
Two of the men nodded and even appeared to be somewhat ashamed. The other man, the one who had spoken first, clearly didn't know what was best for him. Thanks, bloke, he said, pocketing his hands and grinning like an imbecile. But I think I'd rather stay around, see how it all ends. The young man wasn't speaking of the opera performance. Felix moved up so that he stood inches away. The young man had to tilt his head quite far back to still look at Felix. It ends with young pups remembering that all ladies deserve respect. The young man's smirk only grew. Does it now? Felix leaned in. Either that, or it ends with an earl and future marquise calling on each of your fathers and hinting rather strongly that purse strings be tightened until you young boys can act like men. That drained the color from the young man's face. There you are, my dear. Penelope's voice broke through, even as she looped an arm through his. The whole space around him had grown silent. While people had glanced at him surreptitiously before, they openly stared at him now. Felix rocked back as Penelope pried one of the drinks from his hand. Thank you so much, she said, sipping daintily from the glass. I was feeling quite overheated. Cassandra moved up close to Felix's other side. Introduce me to your friends, won't you? Introduce Cassandra to these cads? Certainly not. Felix pinned each of the young men with another glare. I would gladly, he said, his tone making it clear he felt quite the opposite. Only these men were just leaving. With a brief nod, the three young men turned and hurried off. With any luck, they wouldn't forget tonight any time soon, and would watch their tongue when they next spoke of a lady. So much for convincing society you aren't affected. Cassandra said sotto voce. Come on, Penelope said, pulling Felix back toward the family box. Let us go try and enjoy the end of the performance. Felix let them tug him toward the stairs. Around them, people were quickly returning to their huddled groups, pretending they hadn't overheard Felix's words, pretending they weren't going to whisper about it over and over again all night long. Jocelyn was watching him. Her gaze grabbed hold of his, and Felix couldn't look away. Her face seemed impassive, but the corner of her lips tipped up ever so slightly, and there was something in her eyes. A myriad of emotions, really. Gratitude and longing, but also hurt and worry. Felix was no better than the three young men he chased away. He was the reason they were in this situation at all. Felix! Penelope's soft voice brought him back. Please, we need to keep walking. She was right. Most people around them were back to pretending not to be aware of what he was doing. So he took a small risk and gave Jocelyn a small nod. With any luck, she'd understand that he was sorry, but that he would also stand up for her any time, anywhere. Then he forced his gaze away and began walking once more. Mr. Hunt! Someone in the crowd called out in a voice that was far from elegant. Excuse me, but do you know where I might find Mr. Hunt? There was an urgency to the man's voice. Felix pulled to a stop, forcing Penelope and Cassandra to stop as well. He finally caught sight of who was quickly weaving through the crowd. His clothing matched his coarse tone. What would such a man be doing here? What was so urgent that he could not wait until Hunt returned home for the night? A few people pointed the manservant the correct direction. Henry, Hunt called out loudly. Why are you here and not at Bridgecross? He was from Bridgecross. Felix remembered Jocelyn saying that was the name of her family's country estate in Northumberland. The manservant had come all that distance. That explained the spattered dirt along his breeches and shirt. The manservant hurried over to Hunt. Begging your pardon, sir, he held out a missive. This could not wait. Hunt, a heavy scowl across his brow, snatched the letter from the manservant and quickly opened it. Jocelyn moved up beside her father, reading along with him. She took a loud enough breath that even Felix could hear it as her hand flew to her mouth. Hunt muttered something Felix could not hear, 
then began barking at the manservant. Get my carriage brought around immediately. The crowd seemed to open, as though it were a biblical red sea, as Hunt and Jocelyn hurried toward the door and out into the night. Felix stared at the doors, even after they'd closed soundly behind the Hunt family. There was only one thing that could cause a manservant to ride hard all the way from Northumberland. Mrs. Hunt must have taken a turn for the worse, much worse, judging by Hunt and Jocelyn's reactions. Oh dear, Penelope said. That clearly wasn't good news. Felix shook his head. No, it wasn't good news at all. Chapter 19 Jocelyn strode through the garden of Bridgecross, the garden of her home. She stopped near an orange lily and placed her nose just over the petals. Though she inhaled deeply, she hardly smelled the brilliant bloom. She'd hardly smelled any of the flowers since returning home two weeks ago. The night at the opera had been horrid, and then it had turned into a nightmare when Henry had burst in and handed them the doctor's note. Mother had suddenly grown far more ill. The doctor was not sure how much time she had left, but he was confident it was not more than a day or two. She and father had left that very night, ordering their things sent along behind them. They hadn't spared the horses, nor stopped to sleep until they arrived. Those hours, bumping along, drifting in and out of sleep atop the hard bench. Sometimes, nose pressed against the window other times, willing the land around them to move by faster. They were horrid. She and her father hardly said a word to one another the entire trip. But they both knew the truth. They were only praying to arrive before Mamma left. That missive had found them in the opera two weeks ago, and still Mamma struggled between life and death. She was as pale as her sheets and often unconscious, but she lived on. Jocelyn moved past the orange lilies to a collection of yellow ones. She and father had nothing much to do but sit with Mamma for those few fleeting moments each day when she awoke, and hover nearby while she slept, hoping, praying, pleading that she would be spared yet. Pardon me, miss. Jocelyn turned to find one of the maids of the house standing a few paces off. Is it Mamma? Is she awake? Or worse? No, miss, only Mr. Hunt is wishing for your presence. It was both a disappointment and a relief. I will be along presently. The maid curtsied and hurried off. How long would they be forced to endure this? Jocelyn felt stretched thin from worry and apprehension. She gave the untended garden one last passing glance, and then hurried into the house. Are you insane? Harrington stared at him across their small table at White's, as though Felix had suddenly grown a large bushy tail and elongated ears. Are you suggesting I roll over? It wasn't as though Harrington had never rolled over before. No, of course not, Felix stated firmly, eyeing the other gentlemen walking by, willing none of them to stop and interrupt this delicate conversation. All I'm asking for is a show of goodwill. If Harrington advocated that lords spend a little more time listening to commons, well, it might heal some of the ill will between the two sides of Westminster. Harrington rocked back slightly, folding his arms against his ample chest. It won't get her back. Blast. Felix had hoped to go at least one conversation without someone bringing Jocelyn up. Or reminding him of the fact that they could never be together. Or telling him yet again that Jocelyn had left and had no plans to return to London this season. It was as though life had turned into one never-ending ball, where the musicians only played a single song, and he was forever stuck dancing to it. He blew out a long, slow breath, praying for calm. Biting Harrington's head off wasn't going to help his case. This isn't about Miss Hunt. It was. Felix knew deep down that it most certainly was about Jocelyn. 
If he could get the two sides of Westminster to stop trying to throttle each other, maybe, just maybe, Hunt would consider allowing Felix to court his daughter. But even if he never could court Jocelyn, he still hoped to help the two sides see more eye to eye. The House of Lords and the House of Commons didn't have to be enemies as he'd once assumed. We don't always agree, Felix said. But that doesn't mean we don't all want the same thing, a safe future for those who will come after us. But not everyone lives the life you and I have. And that means we need to listen to understand. Harrington's eyes narrowed. You haven't even come into your seat in Lords yet. Why do you care so much? Felix shrugged, hoping the man wouldn't realize just how much Felix already cared about Westminster. Let's just say I was raised as such. Harrington huffed. Well, I'll see what I can do. That's all I ask. Three hours later, Felix's back was tense and his head hurt from politely persisting all afternoon. He'd met with no less than five different members of Lords. Though none of them had openly agreed to truly listen to Commons, he did feel as though they were making progress. At least they were considering listening. Little by little, step by step, that was the best way to accomplish things, right? Felix stepped into the hothouse. The smell and feel of heated, moist air hit him. Every bit of this place reminded him of Jocelyn. Gads, but he missed her. Running a hand down his face, Felix moved deeper into the building. He'd learned that she had, in fact, returned to her family's country estate far up north, and that he was right in guessing the reason. Her mother had taken a sudden turn for the worse. There was nothing else to learn, however. If Hunt was in communication with his peers in Commons, none of them were willing to talk about it what he wouldn't give to be able to help Mrs. Hunt. He'd never met the woman, but, for Jocelyn's sake, he desperately wished he could do something. Felix knew enough of Hunt to know the man most certainly had employed the best physician around, one Dr. Wynne. So what was there left for Felix to do? Nothing, that's what, and it rankled him. Still, there was one thing he could do, Hopefully this would bring some peace to the Hunt household. At a time like this, they deserved it. The gardener hurried over and bowed low. How may I serve you, my lord? I think you know why I'm here. Felix used his best master of the house voice, the one that booned and warned of worse. Along with a future title, this, too, had been instilled in Felix since he was but a boy. The gardener bowed again, even lower this time. I do, my lord. Um, begging your lordship's pardon, but may I be frank? Felix lifted a brow. Continue. The caricature in the paper, my lord. I had nothing to do with it. Then how do you explain the bench and flowers in the image? How do you explain why Jocelyn was drawn in her pink dress? Felix had seen much of Jocelyn this season and she'd only ever worn that pink dress here, in the hothouse. Did she still wear it now, while at home? Or had the caricature ruined the morning gown for her? Felix hated the thought of Jocelyn never wearing it again. It became her so well. Yes, my lord, I saw the same. I, like you, believed the caricature was based on the time you were both here. As he spoke, the gardener seemed to grow more sure of himself, more confident. But I was not the one who first summoned the artist. There's been a young boy about as late, stealing blooms and whatever else he can lay his hands on. You think he's the one to blame? Begging your lordship's pardon? The gardener stood up fully. Yes, I do. The urchins on the street are often more clever than they're given credit for. If he saw the two of you here and was able to piece out who you both were, I don't doubt he would have pressed on until he figured out how to make a bit of coin off the situation. A small boy would make sense, someone who could hide behind a bush and slip about the hothouse without being seen. What is your name? Felix asked. Bamber, your lordship. Well, Bamber, has the boy been around lately? 
That he has, the gardener said with a nod. Made off with a dozen of my best orange roses only last morning. And that is undermining my business by selling my own product to gentlemen and ladies before I gets the chance. I think it's time you and I see to it that both our problems are solved for good. Felix started walking, moving down an overly familiar path. Each echo of his footfall seemed to pound in the reminder that Jocelyn would not be joining him today, or any day, ever again. Bamber fell into step beside him. You have a plan? That I do, Felix said, passing the bench he and Jocelyn shared so many times. It didn't look good, empty as it was. After that, though, I also have one other matter of which I wish to speak to you. Chapter 20 Felix Lockhart was typically attired in a manner befitting an earl and future marquise, which meant what he was currently wearing, a hole-ridden shirt, breeches which itched terribly, and heavy leather gloves, was nothing akin to that which he was accustomed. He stooped, hunched over, and worked more of the darker, smelly dirt into the ground about the roses. If father ever learned he'd spent the morning dungeing in a hothouse, he'd probably swear Felix was heading straight for Bedlam. Penelope would insist he spend the rest of the week at home in bed. Cassandra would laugh until she cried, and then probably spread the story far and wide. And that is why none of his family knew. It was why Felix had slipped out of the house without a word to them, his valet, or the housekeeper. It was why, Felix hoped, his actions today would not be splashed across the papers tomorrow morning. Though, with the way this season had gone thus far, there was every chance it would. Bamba moved up beside Felix, dumping more of the dung over the rose's roots. I think I've spotted the urchin. Felix's back tensed. Where? Well, he kept his voice whisper soft. Near the tools. Get around behind him and chase him this way. He'll not come down this path if he knows someone's here. I'll hide behind the honeysuckle bush. Bamba nodded and then moved off. Felix appreciated that the man continued on as if unaware he was about to be robbed. Still, couldn't he move any faster? Felix stood and moved down the path toward the honeysuckle. They needed to get the boy before he disappeared into the streets of London again. Blood, if Bamba scared the boy and the urchin didn't run toward Felix, there was a good chance he'd never return to this hothouse again. Then there would be no chance of finding him. The smell of the sweet flowers brought Jocelyn's face to mind. Felix pressed himself up against the foliage. Small sticks pressed back, poking him in the shoulder. One even managed to get him in the neck. Scampering footfalls made Felix freeze. Those were not the heavy steps of a grown man, but the light, frantic run of someone young and light. Felix leaned forward ever so slightly and pulled on a couple of leaves, granting himself a better view. A young boy, dirty from head to toe, dashed down the stone-paved walkway, a rusty trowel in his hand. The boy hesitated, peering back over his shoulder, no doubt trying to ascertain if he was being pursued or not. Felix leapt from behind the bush and wrapped an arm around the boy, pinning the lad's arms to his sides. The boy kicked and screamed, using far coarser language than Felix ever had in his entire life. Settle down, son, Felix said. The lad lifted the trowel in his hand and smacked it hard against Felix's knee. Pain burst up and down his leg. Felix clamped his jaw shut and tightened his grip on the urchin. Nice try, Felix said, even as his leg threatened to give out from the pain. But you've been caught, and now it's time you answer to those you've wronged. The boy said something again though Felix was having a hard time understanding the gutter speech. Did the lad know English at all? Bamba ran up, but slowed as he caught sight of Felix's firm grip on the urchin. The gardener folded his large arms around his firm chest. That's enough, boy. Felix was surprised at Bamba's loud voice. The man would have made an excellent marquise had the heavens seen fit. How did the papers know about me and Miss Hunt? Felix demanded. The lad kept his head down and said nothing. You best tell the truth, Bamba said. The lad still didn't look up. 
This governor said to follow ye. He paid me three coin. Then I told him what I saw. Then he said I had to tell this other governor, one with a large canvas and brushes. I didn't know what they was up to, honest. The lad settled down a small bit as he spoke. The boy was only being used, probably by someone in Commons who wanted Felix discredited. Who paid you? Felix pressed. Who was the gentleman who asked you to follow me? The lad lifted a single shoulder. He never said his name. He didn't. Felix kept a firm grip on his arm as he slowly turned him around. It was a dead end then. Without a name, they'd never know exactly who. Holy heavens above! This lad was the same boy who'd taken Lord Compton's coin. The same boy Felix had followed home. What were the odds? The lad jumped left, almost breaking free of Felix's grasp. Felix tightened his grip just in time, then shook his head as the boy struggled yet again. In his shock, he'd almost lost the lad, but not this time. This time, he wasn't going to stumble away, unable to understand what he was seeing. This time, he wasn't going to hang his head and wish he could do more. This time, he was going to do more. Felix pried the trowel from the boy's hand and gave it back to Bamber. If you will excuse us. Felix said, even as the boy began to kick and squirm once more. But I believe this lad and I have an appointment with the magistrate. The lad's eyes grew wide, and he began fighting all the harder. Felix's grip was set, though, and he wasn't going anywhere. Very well, my lordship, Bamber said with a curt bow, and I'll see to that other matter we discussed post haste. The magistrate. Whom Felix had first met several months prior, when helping Sheldon protect his wife, was currently residing in London for the season, and was more than happy to meet with Felix, unexpected though his call was. Moreover, the magistrate immediately agreed with Felix, and pronounced the lad in his debt, and required the boy work for Felix, until the debt was paid off. A letter was dispatched to the boy's mother, informing her of the new situation. And letting her know where to go and who to ask for at the house if she wished to visit, Felix hoped the woman would come visit her son now and then, though he doubted she would. The lad, who only gave them the name Eli when questioned, had calmed down a bit after being pronounced Felix's servant until Felix deemed otherwise. Still, Felix didn't let go of the boy until they were in his stables. Finally. Once the groomsman had a good grip on Eli, Felix relinquished his hold. He spread his hand out and then slowly closed it. He had quite the cramp from holding onto Eli for so long. Eli scowled up at him but said nothing. All right, Eli, Felix began. Though his anger and frustration had long since died off, he needed to keep up the appearance of being furious if this was going to work. From now on, you work for me. You will be here in this stable every morning, where the groomsman will put you to work. You'll receive no more than three meals a day, and I expect you to sleep soundly in the bed they give you every night. The boy's scowl seemed to melt, replaced by a confused tilt of the head. You'll work hard and be expected to learn much. There will always be other stable boys about, but don't assume you're here to make friends. The boy shook his head. No. Though Felix could see the thoughts spinning inside his mind, Felix could never punish such a child for what he'd done to Jocelyn and himself. But if the boy thought Felix was stupid enough to punish him by giving him employment, food, and boys his own age, well, the lad just might stick around. Felix addressed the groomsman. Eli is expected to work as hard as any of the other stable boys. By the end of the year, he is to know his letters and be able to write. It wasn't the punishment Felix had first envisioned when he decided to hunt down the individual who outed him and Jocelyn, but one look at the young boy—why, one of the holes in his shirt clearly showed through to his chest, where his ribs were quite pronounced. Felix knew this was the right course of action. Leaving Eli in the groomsman's hands, literally. Felix made his way to the back door. With a little more luck, he'd be able to slip in and clean up before his family was the wiser. More than ever, he wished he could see Jocelyn and tell her of this morning's adventure. If only he could solve things between them as easily 
as he had caught Eli. Chapter 21 Jocelyn moved slowly down the hallway. Her slippered steps were muffled by the long rug. Father's deep reading voice carried out of Mama's room and past Jocelyn. She couldn't make out the exact words, but the rise and fall of his tone was even, rhythmic. He must have been reading poetry. Jocelyn's chest tightened. Mama loved poetry. Was she all right? Three weeks ago, when they'd first returned home, Jocelyn would have assumed that father, reading aloud, meant Mama was awake. But just over the past few days, father had taken up reading aloud even when Mama was lost in sleep. Jocelyn suspected that secretly, father hoped his voice would calm and ease Mama's suffering, even if she wasn't conscious of it. She stopped beside the partially open door, finally able to discern father's lilting tail. Rich with a sprinkling of fair musk rose blooms, and such too is the grandeur of the dooms. It was Keats, his poem recounting how things of beauty never truly die, at least not in the heart. Most of London had dismissed the poem when first published a few years earlier, but it had always been one of Mama's favourites. We have imagined for the might dead all lovely tales that we have heard or read. Jocelyn pushed into the room, joining her father in reciting the last couple of lines. An endless fountain of immortal drink pouring onto us from the heaven's brink. Father looked up from the book in his hands. Good evening, my dear. Jocelyn reached out and pushed a strand of hair across Mama's forehead. Mama's skin was hot to the touch. How is she faring? Jocelyn always hated asking that question, but she always did nonetheless. Father, large bags under his eyes, sighed and slumped more heavily in the chair beside his wife. She is not tossing and turning as she was two days ago, but her fever still has not broken. Jocelyn nodded, but there seemed nothing left to say. Together they watched Mama in silence. A maid bustled into the room behind Jocelyn, set a tray of tea beside Father, and then stoked the fire before slipping out. Have you been staying caught up in the news from London? Jocelyn slowly shook her head. Moving felt harder these days, as though her full frame had increased in weight. Her dresses still fit as before. So she knew she wasn't actually gaining weight, but it was still harder to do simple things such as walk, shake her head, climb the stairs. Sometimes she couldn't even seem to gather the energy needed to stand. Father tugged a paper out from under the tea tray. He flipped through a few pages and then laid it on the bed beside Mama. It seems your Sutby has been causing quite a stir in Westminster. Hearing Felix's name made her heart do a strange, painful flip. Jocelyn picked up the paper, but couldn't seem to force her eyes to read. He's been seen speaking with nearly every seat in Lord's. What about? It was so easy to picture Felix burning and ready to make changes happen, conquering this lord and that at White's or Almax. The papers can't seem to agree on that point. Father continued, picking up a cup of tea. Jocelyn was glad he was eating something. She hadn't been blind to the fact that his appetite had waned since returning home. Some say that he's bent on organising a policing force. Others say he's wanting to raise taxes. Father took a sip. Some are so ridiculous as to hypothesise that Sutby wants to dissolve Lords and Commons and combine the two in some new governing form. Jocelyn couldn't stop the derisive laugh that such an idea pulled from her. He's not that insane. Father was watching her closely. She could feel his gaze on her face. He probably was hoping to discern how she felt about Felix. Now that she'd been parted from him for nearly a month, the dull ache which had moved about the hollow estate with her these past weeks beat against her chest. Oh, how she missed Felix. She missed speaking to him of important and equally unimportant things. 
She missed the way they could stroll together, silent and completely comfortable. She missed her arm through his and the way he smiled and the way he pretended to be pompous. Jocelyn, my sweet. She coughed and tugged on the paper, silencing her father's unwanted sympathy. She didn't want to hear it. Not right now. Not when her emotions were so close to the surface as is. Her eyes finally focused, and she was able to read a few lines. It seems this one believes he is hoping to oust his own father and take his seat in Lords prematurely. Father gave her an understanding smile and leaned back in his seat, resting the almost full teacup back on the tray. That is from one of the less reputable sources, but yes, some of the papers are reporting as much. Of course they would. Why not assume the worst for Felix? They'd never done anything less in the past. They should leave him alone. She tossed the paper back onto the bed. There was a knock at the door and father called for whomever it was to enter. The butler came in and turned to face not her father, but Jocelyn. Pardon me, miss, but a package for you has just arrived and the man says he needs to know where you want it placed. A package? For her? Who would send her something? Have the man leave it in the drawing room and I'll be down soon. Excuse me, miss, but I do not believe the drawing room is the right place for this particular item. Perhaps you'd best come and see to it yourself. Jocelyn glanced over at her father, but he only stared back at her with an equally questioning raised brow. The package was clearly not from him. Bending down, Jocelyn gave Mama a quick kiss on her forehead and then followed the butler out of Mama's room. The front door was still open and Jocelyn could make out that a man was standing outside, hat in his hands. She didn't recognize him, but she could see very little of him. Crossing the front foyer, she pulled the door open fully. The gardener. It was the gardener from the hothouse in London. Whatever was he doing here? Just the sight of him brought back so many memories. Wait, was Felix here too? Jocelyn looked quickly about, but all she could see was the gardener, a wagon, and a bench which looked like it had just been unloaded. Her eyes went back to the bench. It was her bench, hers and Felix's, the one they had shared so many times. Without a word, Jocelyn moved toward the bench, running the tips of her fingers over the rough wood. Begging your pardon, miss, the gardener said, a clear smile in his tone. But someone felt certain you would like to have this. Oh, he quickly drew out a letter from his vest pocket. And this is to go with it. Jocelyn took the letter. Her name was scrawled across the front. She'd never seen Felix's handwriting before, but who else could it be from? Thank you. Don't thank me. I'm only doing as I've been paid to. Though his words were platonic, his voice was bright and happy. Just tell me where you want the bench and I'll see to it. Then I'll be on my way. Yes, no doubt he had quite a trip ahead of him. London was several days' journey from here. You came all the way from London just to deliver this to me. His lordship said he trusted no one but me and that I was to deliver it myself. No doubts in the hopes to keep the papers from finding out. Apparently, Felix trusted that the gardener wasn't the one who doubted them. If Felix trusted the gardener, then she should as well. Jocelyn kept a tight hold on Felix's letter. She was quite anxious to read it, but felt she should let the gardener place the bench and be on his way first. She instructed him to put it near the lilies. It felt like the right place for the bench. With a nod and a smile, the gardener climbed back into his wagon and was soon gone. Jocelyn hurried over to her bench. She still could not believe that Felix had gone to such trouble to do something so thoughtful for her, and sat down. It was just as she remembered it. No doubt, no one would ever understand why she cared for such a beaten-up, weathered bench. But it did mean quite a bit to her. Nonetheless, it wasn't nearly as nice as having Felix beside her. She tore the letter open. It wasn't exactly proper for a man to write to a woman with whom he had no understanding. But this was Felix. Understanding or no, 
She missed him far too much to do anything less than read it as quickly as she could. Dearest Jocelyn, I'm not really sure what to say. You'd think an entitled popinjay such as myself would at least know what to say in a simple letter. But I am at a loss. I have found the culprit. You'll never guess who he was. Remember that young urchin, the one I tailed a few months back? He's the one who first told the papers of our frequent hothouse meetings. I brought him up on charges, and that gave me the opening necessary to require he work for me. The boy will now get three meals a day, learn an occupation, and be surrounded by boys and men who will teach him how to contribute to society. He told me his name is Eli. Strange turn of events, is it not? I digress. I suppose I ought to explain your strange present. You told me once you love gifts, and I felt at a time such as this, you needed something more now than ever. Flowers would not travel so great a distance well, and sweet meats didn't seem to be enough. So I brought you our bench. I hope you like it, Felix. Jocelyn read it over several times. Still, it raised as many questions as it answered. How had he found out about Eli? Did he realize how pleased she was that he'd found a way to help the little boy? The ending half brought as many questions as the first. He called the bench, our bench. That was the way she'd always thought of it, too. But he never said he missed her, not in so many words. Was this a goodbye present? A, thanks for the many pleasant mornings, but we both always knew this could never work. Farewell letter. If she could have heard him say the words aloud, she would have known better what he meant by them. She could hear his voice speaking as she read the letter. Sometimes his tone sounded hopeful and a bit bittersweet. Other times it hung heavy with regret and parting. Her lips twisted to the side. She just wasn't sure. Jocelyn ran her hand over the bench again. Whatever he felt for her, she was glad she'd always have the token of their time together in London. It seemed this bench was all she would ever have. Chapter 22 Felix stood outside his father's bookroom. So far in the past month, he'd spoken with every other member of Lord's. When he'd first started this one-man crusade, he had a clear picture of what he hoped to accomplish. By the time he left London at the end of the season, he wanted Lord's to be more open to the idea of truly listening to those in commons. It was a hard accomplishment to measure, to be sure but it would be necessary if ever the rift between the two sides of Westminster was to be breached. What he hadn't exactly pictured was when, along the way, he was going to speak to the Marquis of Ramport. Somehow, his father kept making his way further and further down Felix's list. Now, he was the only member whom Felix had not spoken to. Felix wrapped his fingers against his thigh. His time was up. This had to happen. Lifting his chin, Felix rapped thrice on the door. Come in. Felix opened the door and strode inside, before he had the time to think up some excuse to leave instead. The Marquis of Ramport glanced up and then did a double take. Leaning back in his chair, he looked at Felix in silence. Normally father greeted him openly, if not always cheerfully. This silence was new. No doubt father had heard of Felix's other conversations. Or perhaps it was simply Felix's own expression that silenced him. Either way, Felix stood across the desk from his father, waiting to see if he would speak first. Felix placed his hands behind his back. He would see this through, and if his father forever thought less of him for what he had to say, so be it. Sir, Felix started. I was hoping you had a moment to speak with me. Ramport still did not say anything, but nodded toward one of the chairs across from him. Felix sat, but didn't relax. I am sure you have heard that I've been speaking with other members of Lords. Only a nod. I know I do not yet hold a seat personally, 
But that hasn't stopped me from taking a great deal of interest in Parliament's current issues. Another nod. Father was not going to make this easy. I cannot help but be left uneasy. Felix sat up straighter, feeling the familiar burn he felt every time he spoke these words. How can we truly expect to leave a better England for our children if we aren't even willing to listen to one another? Half of Westminster says one thing, half says another. The answer must lie in the middle somewhere. But if no one is willing to consider the other's thoughts, we won't get anywhere. Felix continued, outlying the various specifics. Differences between the two sides, as well as areas in which they agreed. They fought more often than they did anything else, but lords and commons didn't need to be enemies. We only need to take the time to truly listen, Felix said, wrapping up his argument. We all want the same things, and we all have different experiences which have helped us understand different aspects of what that better future should look like. Without all of our experiences, we won't be able to find that future. Ramport still had not said anything. Felix, finished with all he had to say, leaned back in his chair. They returned to staring at one another. Did Father agree with anything he had said? Gotten so mad that he was going to disinherit Felix? He didn't think it would go that far, but the idea had crossed Felix's mind before today. Most fathers did not tolerate their sons varying from their own political stance. Ramport finally opened his mouth. Is that what you've been telling all my fellow members of Lords? Yes, sir. It was, and Felix wasn't going to back down from his opinions. Well, in this, the papers were more wrong than normal. Was that it? That was all he had to say. Excuse me? Surely Father had more to say than that. Father leaned forward, resting his arms against the desk. I heard about our new little stable boy. I must say I was a little surprised. His voice dropped, growing sincere. You showed wisdom in how you handled that, both in how you unearthed the truth and in how you reacted afterward. I'm proud of you. Felix sat there, wordless. This wasn't at all how he had expected the conversation to go. Last time he and his father had truly spoken, they had been yelling at each other. Now? Father was proud of him? I mean it, Felix. Father smiled softly. And now this strategy to bring both sides of Westminster closer together. He shook his head slowly back and forth. It's bold. But you're also right. We've been staring at our differences for too long. It's time we remember the ways we're the same. Felix ran a hand down his face. I never thought you'd agree with me on this. I've watched you closely this season. You've grown a lot. You aren't the same man you were before, and I'm fairly sure I know who deserves the credit. Felix knew who to give credit to as well, but was Father thinking of the same woman? Because he wasn't sure Father fully understood what Jocelyn had come to mean to him, or in how many ways she'd changed him. I think, Father said, this time his tone lighter. You should quit London early this year. No doubt the hunting will be good this autumn. You may want to get a head start on thinning the herds up north. Felix rocked forward in his chair. Surely Father wasn't saying what Felix thought he was saying. Then I have your blessing. Ramport laughed. He actually laughed. I never thought you needed it before now, but yes... If it puts your mind at ease, you have my blessing. Felix stood, his hands opening and closing. A sudden rush to be leaving surged over him. Of course he needed to leave London. Jocelyn wasn't here any more. Why he had ever stayed so long, he suddenly couldn't understand. The family had a hunting lodge up north. He'd stay there and be within reasonable distance from her. Felix blinked. His father's closed bookroom door was directly in front of him. He'd walked away without really being aware. Felix turned. 
If you will excuse me, father, I believe I am needed in a different part of England. Ramport laughed again. Don't worry about London. I'll make sure she doesn't burn to ash while you're gone. Felix felt himself smiling. Waves of excitement rushed over him. He was going north. He was going to be with his Jocelyn again. Just don't do what I did with Penelope and beat about the bush, father said, pointing his finger at Felix. Be straight with her and her father. If you can convince Hunt you love his daughter half as much as you actually do, I don't think you'll have any problems. Ah, Lud, Hunt. Felix had momentarily forgotten that obstacle. But it didn't matter. He'd figure out a way. Thank you, father. Now get out of here and don't return without that beautiful young lady on your arm. Chapter 23 Jocelyn slowly lowered the cross stitch she held in her hands, resting it on her lap. She eyed Mama, resting in her bed. At least the fever was a little lighter today. Not fully gone, but certainly less. Moreover, she wasn't tossing and turning as she had so many times over the past month and a half. She seemed to be resting comfortably. No sweat stuck her hair to her neck. Mama had a bit of colour in her cheeks. One would not even know for certain she was sick, except for the warmth of her forehead. Father had noticed it that morning as well. Neither of them had said as much aloud, for neither of them dared get their hopes up. But Jocelyn had noticed the shift in Father's eyes when he'd entered the room an hour ago. She'd noticed how the tension along his brow eased ever so slightly. Since then, they'd both sat in silence, Father on Mama's left and Jocelyn on her right. A knock sounded at the door. The sudden break in the long stretch of silence made Jocelyn jump. Sucking in a deep breath, she moved her needlepoint to the nearby bedside table. At least she hadn't accidentally stabbed herself with the needle in her shock. The butler entered. Pardon me, sir, but there is a gentleman here to see you. Who on earth would have come to call? Father's raised brow proved he was wondering the same thing. Jocelyn only shrugged. They'd attended church services since returning home but no other social gatherings. Several ladies in the neighbourhood had come and called during the first few weeks Jocelyn was here, but they all seemed to sense that the Hunt family wanted time alone. No one had come by in over two weeks. Father turned back toward the butler. Please send him away. We are not at home for visitors this morning. If I may beg pardon, sir, he said it was most important. The butler held out a small calling card. Jocelyn sat up taller, trying to see over the top and read the name thereon, but she couldn't quite make it out. The card didn't look familiar. It was unadorned with either flowers or birds, but it still seemed stylish in its simplicity. Father's eyes widened ever so slightly, and his gaze jumped to her. Clearly the name meant something to him. Who is it? Jocelyn asked. Father stood with a grunt. Business with commons is all. Stay with your mamma for me, will you? Of course. Father seemed stressed suddenly. Perhaps the vote had taken a turn for the worse and someone had come to consult with him. London was several days' journey. No one would come from there unless the situation were dire. Perhaps it was someone from the local village. But who around these parts would need to speak with father on an urgent matter? Father bent down and kissed Mama on her forehead. He stroked her cheek with his thumb quickly and then, not bothering to bid Jocelyn farewell, hurried out of the door. Jocelyn's lips pulled to one side. He certainly seemed on edge, but she couldn't imagine what the problem could be. Felix turned away from the window in Hunt's study and paced towards the fireplace. He'd only reached the Northumberland area less than ten hours prior. Ragged from his hasty journey, he'd slept for a few hours and then rushed through his morning washing and dressing. To get here as early as could be considered proper, he ran a hand down his chin. What would Hunt say? Felix had not had much cause to speak with the man in the past. 
Most of what Felix knew of Hunt he'd heard at either White's or Almax. Most of what Hunt knew about Felix was most likely learned the same way. That could prove a problem. It's not as though the newspapers had been particularly kind. The door opened and Hunt strode in. Felix turned, standing straight, his coat tail smacking against the fireplace grate. Hunt walked by Felix, shaking his head and most pointedly not acknowledging Felix. Sir, Felix bowed deeply. Please accept my deepest condolences on the illness of your wife. Hunt rounded the long desk on the far side of the room, then scowled at Felix as he sat. What the blazes are you doing here, Suppy? I have come to speak with you, sir. I wish for your daughter's hand in marriage. Hunt didn't move, didn't so much as lift an eyebrow or rock back in his seat. Apparently, he'd either ascertained the full extent of Felix and Jocelyn's relationship, or he was a master of inscrutability. You have not even begun to court her properly, Hunt said. Felix purposefully kept his gaze away from the chair directly across the desk from Hunt. If the man had wanted him to sit, he would have offered. Felix was on shaky enough ground as is. He wasn't going to insinuate Hunt had fallen short of his hosting duties. More still, he wasn't going to be a pompous pop in jay and sit without being invited. Instead, Felix approached the desk and remained standing, hands behind his back. Then allow me to begin at once. Hunt shook his head. I'll save you the trouble and give you the answer now. No. Please, sir. Felix resisted the urge to lean over the top of the desk. I am a member of the upper echelon. I will be a marquise one day. Your daughter will never want for society or safety or anything. So? Hunt huffed. Leaning back in his chair, his scowl never lessening. There are a dozen men who could give her as much, and none of them have subjected her to ridicule. Felix felt that blow. It was true. Thanks to him, Jocelyn's name had been bandied about in the unkindest of ways in London. Her chances of making a match had been damaged. Her standing in society had been called into question. So tell me, Suppy. Why should I allow you to wed my daughter? Felix met his gaze and spoke the first thing that came to mind. Because I love her. Ah! Hunt waved a hand through the air. You are too young. Your life has been too easy for you to know about love. Felix felt his face grow hot and he clenched his hands tighter behind his back. He could not lose his temper in front of Hunt. That would do nothing but lose his case for him. With all respect, sir, I do love your daughter. Because she is beautiful. Because she would be a trophy to brag about to your friends. Taking your enemy's daughter and all that sort of thing. Is that what Hunt thought of his attentions? I would say not, sir. Did he truly see Felix as that petty? I love her because she is brilliant. She is kind and cares deeply. She is willing to speak her mind and debate those things which are important to her. Yes, she mentioned your debates. She's not a woman to be ignored or placed in a glass cage and set out for display. I will never treat her as such. And that, Felix lifted a finger and shook it, emphasizing his point, is not something just any man can claim. Hunt pursed his lips. He watched Felix, then slowly rocked forward and opened a desk drawer. He pulled out a folded sheet of paper. I've heard rumours of your recent actions in London. Felix didn't respond right away, but let Hunt continue. It seems you have caused a bit of a stir in Westminster, spoken to every seat in Lords. I've heard it from several of my fellow members of Commons, but I was surprised to get a letter from the opposite side of Westminster. Hunt lifted the sheet of paper between two fingers and unfolded it slightly. Sir? Felix had no idea whom the letter might be from, or why it mattered. Hunt rested the letter down on the desk, open this time. This gentleman is from Lords, 
he said, tapping the bottom signature, and has written, asking to meet with me when next I am in London, so that we might better understand each other's thoughts on tax reform. Felix leaned forward and caught sight of the signature, Lord Heath Lockhart, Marquis of Ramport, his own father. Why, if this letter was already in Hunt's possession, the Marquis must have written it before Felix had left London. Before Felix had spoken with his father, even. Satisfaction at having made his father proud swelled in his chest. Tell me, Suppy, is his lordship the type of man who would wall off all my attempts if I refuse his son my daughter? No, sir. Felix's voice was hard. It was one thing to stand here and listen to Hunt's vitriol against him, but Felix would not stand by and listen to the man speak ill of his father. The Marquis is a man of honour in every regard. If he wrote to you, asking for a meeting, that request will stand regardless of what happens between me and Jocelyn. Good. Hunt picked up the letter and began folding it. Because my answer to you is still no. This was getting ridiculous. He'd done everything right. Well, besides leading Jocelyn to ridicule. But he loved her and could more than care for her. He respected Jocelyn and had even been a strong advocate for Hunt's own cause. Sir, I believe... Do you want to know why? Hunt interrupted. Felix snapped his mouth shut. He would not lose his temper. He would not lose his temper. Instead, Felix only nodded. It's because I don't like you, Hunt said. You grew up with the world at your feet. Everything you could ever want was easily bestowed upon you. And you don't want such a life for your daughter? I will give her away to a man who I am confident will provide her with a good life, but to a man who had to work for what he has. My daughter grew up in a home where nothing was guaranteed. I worked hard to give her and her mother the life they enjoy. Jocelyn saw that. It helped shape who she is. You may think you're in love now, but... He shook his head. The day will come when you both wake up and realize you're just too different. Your lives up to now have been too different. You won't be able to relate. Your priorities won't align. I won't subject my daughter to such a future. Hunt stood and started around the desk toward Felix. Apparently, the meeting was over. Felix had pled his case and lost. Hunt would not be budged. Good morning to you, Suppy, Hunt said, striding toward the door. I trust you will not make your presence known to my daughter. She's going through much right now. He opened the door wide. Felix ached, thinking of Jocelyn worrying over her ailing mother, and he not able to comfort her. Hunt skewered Felix with a stare. I am certain, as a gentleman, you do not wish to cause her any more harm than you already have, and so will stay away from her. Slowly, Felix walked toward the door. If that is your wish, sir. Felix knew better than to blatantly go against Hunt. If Felix ever hoped to win Jocelyn's hand, he'd first have to win Hunt. He passed through the door and out into the hallway. It was devoid of servants or maids, or Jocelyn. He had hoped that he might accidentally cross paths with her. Apparently, such was not to be. Where was Jocelyn right now? In her sitting room? Beside her mother? Sir, Felix turned back to Hunt. Were the lilies still in bloom when you first arrived? Hunt's brow dropped in confusion. Were they what? Jocelyn often mentioned how much she missed lilies while in London. I had thought that, if hers was still in bloom here, it might have brought her some comfort. Hunt eyed him, but his brow didn't lift. Goodbye, Suppy. Next time you refer to my daughter, you will remember she is Miss Hunt. Chapter 24 no, do it again. Felix tugged out his cravat. His valet stepped forward and attempted tying it for a third time. If ever there was a time for a perfect cravat, this was it. 
Felix tried to stand still as the man worked, but he was finding it increasingly difficult not to tap his foot or wrap his fingers against his thigh. He was determined to try pleading his case before Hunt again today. Hunt may have denied him two days ago when they last spoke, but Felix wasn't going to throw his hands up in defeat. Not now, not ever. His valet stepped back, the cravat tied once again and Felix stared at himself in the full-length mirror. For a short moment, Felix imagined himself forty years older, grey and wrinkled, still dressing in the first stare of fashion, to go plead his case to Hunt. Well, if that's what it took, that's what he'd do. That will do nicely. Felix nodded once toward his valet. Has my phaeton been readied? Yes, my lord. Excellent. Felix hurried out of the door, wanting to be nowhere else besides Bridgecross. Asking for Jocelyn's hand outright didn't work. But if Hunt thought Felix was done trying, he was most assuredly wrong. Today, Felix was going to try a slower approach. Hunt had mentioned that Felix hadn't courted Jocelyn. He refused to think of her as Miss Hunt. Properly. Today, he would call and simply ask to be allowed to take Jocelyn out for a turn. Surely with all the worry and concern at home, Jocelyn could use some fresh air and an excuse to be out of doors. Felix hurried out the front door and alighted into the small carriage. Taking the reins in a single hand, he started the phaeton moving forward. The real question that bothered Felix was whether or not Hunt would respond to Felix consistently, pleading his case. Or would Hunt be more likely to acquiesce given time and space to think between Felix's visits? In speaking with the various members of Lords, Felix had learned a thing or two. Some gentlemen were swayed with constant persuasion. Others needed time and space to think things through and see the validity of Felix's arguments. Felix urged the horse pulling him first round one corner and then down another. If he pushed Hunt too fast, he would succeed in doing no more than getting the man's back up. If Felix pushed too slow, Hunt might assume Felix was insincere. It was a delicate situation. Down the road, he made out the outline of the roof of the Hunt estate. Though they weren't in London, Felix chose to arrive at the fashionable hour anyway. He hoped that showing up at such a proper time might help impress upon Hunt that Felix was nothing short of a gentleman and someone he could trust his daughter with. It was a small thing, but Felix would take all the help he could get. He pulled up in front of the estate. No one was about, no groomsmen or manservants. If he didn't know better, he might have assumed the family was not at home. Felix stepped down. Jocelyn would certainly enjoy a ride. A chance to get away from the melancholy that hung about this place. If only for a moment. He hurried up the steps and knocked loudly. Felix waited. And waited. Brow dropping, he leaned in closer toward the door. There was a sound of feet hurrying about. Several people, if he wasn't mistaken. Felix knocked again. There was a shout from within side. As quiet as the house was without... It clearly wasn't quiet within. Finally, the door swung open. The same butler who'd opened to him two days ago stood there, shoulders filling the opening and blocking his entry. Was he not even allowed to enter now? Felix pulled out his calling card and presented it to the butler. With Hunt's permission. A large, elderly woman bustled over to the butler. Jim said Blackstar won't cooperate, so he's going to saddle Honeysuckle. The butler addressed the elderly woman, but didn't move enough to allow Felix admittance. Hunt expressly said to send his fastest horse. Tell Jim. Tell him yourself, the woman huffed. Then she turned and hurried deeper into the house. Felix peered around the tall butler and caught sight of two younger maids rushing up the stairs. Their arms full of white, lightweight blankets. Something was amiss. The butler stepped outside, forcing Felix to take a step backward. Quite a bold butler he was, and shut the door behind himself. Pardon me, Felix said, sticking close to the butler. Would you mind explaining what has this house in an uproar? The butler hurried down the stairs and moved around toward the back of the house. 
I am not confident I am at liberty to say, your lordship. The man didn't slow, but still executed a proper bow when he said, your lordship. A cold fear crept down Felix's back. Jocelyn is fine, isn't she? Nothing has happened to her. Miss Hunt is in fine health at the moment. So not Jocelyn, then. Felix mulled over the butler's response. Someone else in the house is not in fine health, then? Mrs. Hunt, has she taken a turn for the worse? Standing just outside the open stable doors, the butler stopped and turned toward Felix. Normally I would say nothing, only... His gaze wandered toward the gardens behind Felix. Felix turned, trying to pick out what it was the butler was looking at. There, among tall green stalks which probably had been in bloom not too long ago, was the small white bench he and Jocelyn always shared. She'd received it. She'd placed it among her flowers. The sight poured radiant joy through him. The butler spoke again, his voice much lower than before. Yes, your lordship, Mrs. Hunt took a severe turn for the worse not more than a quarter of an hour ago, and if that mull-brained Jim would ever get a horse saddled, we could send someone for the doctor. Well, bold and outspoken. In the back of his mind, Felix wondered if the butler had influenced Jocelyn, or she him. For they both were not in positions where society expected to hear their opinions openly stated, and yet... State them, they did. It ain't me fault. A man, leathery and grey, stepped out from the stable. It's the stable hand. He's the one who messed up with Blackstar's feed bag. Either way, the butler began. Felix cut them both off. Don't bother your horses. I'll ride for the doctor. He spun on his heel and began hurrying back the way he'd come. My lord. The butler caught up to him easily. The man had nearly as long of legs as Felix did. Are you quite sure? Certainly. Anything for the hunts? Anything for Jocelyn? If her mother needed a doctor brought, then that's what Felix would do. My Phaeton's readied, and I can bring him here straight away without needing to wait for Dr. Wynne to saddle his horse as well. It would be much appreciated. Felix listened as the butler told him where the doctor might be found then leapt up onto the Phaeton's bench and took the reins in both hands. I'll be back post-haste. He cracked the reins over the horse's head. The well-trained horse jumped forward and bolted down the path. Chapter 25 Felix thrummed his fingers against his thigh and pushed back further into the large chair near the hearth. He'd been in the hunt's southmost drawing room for nearly twenty-four hours. Morning would be here soon. He hadn't slept a bit either. He stilled his fingers, but his foot began to tap against the floor instead. He was brimming with agitated waiting, yet, after a night of no sleep, he was also thoroughly exhausted, too tired to get up and pace, too restless to sit still and doze. A maid walked quickly into the room, a log in her arms. Silently, she added it to the small fire in the hearth and then stirred up the embers. She looked as tired as he felt. The maid turned toward Felix, gave him a small curtsy, and then moved out of the door. The whole house was up, waiting, wondering how Mrs. Hunt was faring, hoping for the best, worried it would be the worst. Felix placed his hands against his knees and pushed himself up to standing. He pulled back on his shoulders, stretching his back. How was Jocelyn holding up? She was close to her mamma. How long would such a wound take to heal should her mother pass? Hopefully, Mr. Hunt would allow Felix to stand by Jocelyn for the duration. He slowly looked about the empty room, other than a maid or manservant here and there. Felix had been the only occupant in this room for so many hours, he'd lost count. Hunt and Jocelyn had been beside Mrs. Hunt for the entire time, as far as Felix knew. Retrieving the doctor had been no problem. He had packed and joined Felix in his phaeton without question. Felix had never been so grateful for good horses who could gallop fast. Felix paced over toward a window. The sun had not yet crested above the treetops, but the darkness was easing. 
Yellow and pink clouds rested against the horizon. How long until he heard news? He turned to his right. A lovely pianoforte took up a place of prominence alongside this side of the drawing room. Felix had noticed it when he was first shown into the room, after pacing the formal parlour for most of yesterday. The maid who had showed him back to this room had only said it was more comfortable, and then left him as alone in here as he had been before. It had been growing close to midnight then, and he didn't think a sonata would have been very welcomed. But now, with the sky lightening and the assumption that no one in the house had truly slept, perhaps a song wouldn't be too intrusive. Felix moved over to the instrument and lightly ran his fingertips over the keys. It would certainly soothe his own nerves. It felt like it had been ages since he last played. Felix pulled the bench out and sat, then readjusted it so that he was the perfect distance from the instrument. He struck a note, and then another. Beethoven's Les Adieux flowed out of his fingers. It was the same song he'd played the night he met Jocelyn. Hadn't she said it was her mamma's favourite? Lud, what a couple of tomcats they'd been that night. The first movement started slow and soft, simple chords building up. High notes sung above the rest, but quickly dropped low. Beethoven's work had changed lately, but this one still held echoes of his earliest work. It was fitting, really, as this song meant farewell. Felix hit the next several chords hard, the music ringing out at the pianoforte and filling the space. Complicated scales ran up the keyboard, followed by a series of repeating, inverted arpeggios. The main melody came through finally. It was one of Beethoven's more complicated pieces, made all the more so because if one only played the notes, they would lose the song entirely. But was that not life itself? If one only went through the motions, the music was lost. Felix moved through the second movement, titled L'Absence, or The Absence. It was the third movement, though, that he most longed to play, L'Ogator, the return. The happy, quick notes seemed at odds with his mood, but he needed that upbeat surge of hope. The song grew soft again, but still cheerful, almost reminiscent. Then the sudden, brilliant and loud finish. He pounded out those last few measures, willing the notes to fill the house. It wasn't much in the way of support, but it was one thing that Felix, the man, not the heir apparent, could do. Jocelyn turned over where she lay. The couch at the foot of Mama's bed wasn't the most comfortable. It was barely long enough for her to fit if she tucked her feet in a bit. It certainly didn't provide enough room to truly stretch out. Still, it was close to Mama, and that was all she wanted for the moment. Jocelyn didn't open her eyes, but listened to the noises in the room, the crackling half, father's deep, even breathing, Mama's lighter, more haggard breath, the soft footfalls of a maid moving about the room, birds chirping at the sunrise, branches gently knocking against the side of the house, the lilting notes of the pianoforte. That's what it had woken her. But who was playing? Jocelyn knew that the pianoforte in the servants' quarter could not be heard from Mama's bedchamber. It had to be the one in the southern drawing room. Her brow dropped. Who could be playing? The music continued. Jocelyn blinked her eyes open and pushed an elbow into the cushion, rising to sit. Father was sleeping, chin on his chest, in the great armchair beside Mama's bed. The doctor... Awake, sat in a simpler chair on Mama's other side. He caught her eye. Good morning, he whispered. Good morning. She lowered her legs to the ground. How is she? No better, no worse. Jocelyn's gaze returned to her pale Mama. She'd been doing better ever since she and father had returned home. It truly seemed as though having family around was making a difference. Then, 
The previous day, Mama had awoken with a higher than normal fever, and it had progressively gotten worse. The doctor was summoned, and neither she nor father had left Mama's side since. Louder, full strains of music drifted up from the floor below. Jocelyn stood. It wasn't worth waking father over, but she was full, brimming with curiosity. Several of the maids played quite well, but they never used the pianoforte in the southern drawing room. The doctor pulled out his pocket watch. With a sigh, he replaced it and then removed the cork in the bottle of medicine he'd brought. Even as he poured Mama another spoonful, and slowly drizzled it down Mama's throat, Jocelyn noiselessly moved toward the door. Let us hope she fights off this fever on her own soon, the doctor said. I can't give her much more of this stuff. Jocelyn stopped halfway out the door. Worry bit against her chest. Mama would pull through, right? When the doctor had arrived yesterday. He'd said Mama had had a few worse than normal fevers like this before, but they never lasted more than twenty-four hours. In every situation, the sooner he'd arrived and began giving her the medicine, the quicker she'd recovered. Thank you for coming so quickly, Jocelyn said, her own voice barely more than a whisper. Father was still sleeping. I must say, the doctor replied. I've never ridden with a man who drives so fast nor so carefully. I would have been a full half hour later, maybe more, with any other driver. The Hunt Estate had a few oddities, like the overly outspoken butler. Truth was, though, Jocelyn was quite fond of the staff. Jim is a good man. The doctor looked over his shoulder at her, an eyebrow raised. Oh. It was no groomsman who drove me. It hadn't been Jim, but father had specifically given orders that Jim ride for the doctor. Jocelyn had heard it herself. The music, floating up from below, shifted, growing light again. It couldn't be. Jocelyn's heart leapt, going from relaxed to crazed, staccato pumping instantly. He wasn't here. He was in London. Jocelyn hurried out of the room, not bothering to respond to the doctor's last words. Holding her skirt tightly in both hands, she took the stairs as quickly as she dared. Surely, if he'd come, he would have called on her. Then again, if he had come to call on her, would father had allowed her to see him? After all that had happened in London and the nature of things when they'd left, there was a good chance he would not have. The music grew louder. As she moved away from the formal rooms and toward the back of the house, to the rooms usually reserved for the family, to the southern drawing room, and there he was. He sat, hands dancing across the keys, his back toward her. She was strongly put to mind of the night they first met. He was even playing the same song. Jocelyn's steps slowed as she came around to face him. Gracious. He was every bit as handsome as she remembered. He caught sight of her, and his hand stopped. His whole face brightened seeing her. It made her heart warm. Now that he was here, only an arm's length away, she suddenly didn't know what to say or how to act. Felix stood and moved out from behind the keys. I've missed you. It was exactly what she wanted to hear. Jocelyn rushed forward and threw her arms around him. Felix hugged her back. He smelled as he always did, and his arms around her felt as they always had. There was something about being so close to him that felt like home. I am so sorry about your mother, he whispered. All the fear for Mama rushed through and then let out of her as his words. She was so happy to see him, and yet she was crying, crying large hiccuping tears. He only pulled her yet closer. This is what she'd needed all these weeks. She'd needed her Felix beside her as she watched and worried over Mama. I hope the noise wasn't unwelcome. I just. He turned back towards the pianoforte, shrugging the rest of his explanation. You remembered. 
That it's your mother's favorite, of course. Felix's tone softened. How is she? Jocelyn sighed and squeezed her eyes shut, wishing she could squeeze the helplessness and despair out as easily as she could the light. The doctor isn't sure. Felix kissed the top of her head. You smell of soap. You expected something different. You normally smell of flowers and the garden. It was probably true. I haven't been out much as of late. Her heart felt heavy. She'd missed most of the spring blooms, and it seemed she would miss most of the summer blooms too. Don't worry, my dear, Felix said, keeping her close to his chest. You and I shall take a turn about later today, or any time you wish. Perhaps once, Mama, after the fever comes down again. The lack of certainty in her own voice troubled her. Would Mama's fever ever come down again, or was this the last? Felix hugged her tightly. Whatever happens, I'll be here. You won't face it alone. Jocelyn nodded, her head pressed against his chest. She needed him here right now. More tears swelled up over her lashes. For a moment, she attempted to keep her crying to soft, ladylike tears. But soon, the hiccup started again, and she sobbed against him. They stood for a while, her crying, him rubbing her back. Even after Jocelyn had run out of tears, he simply led her to the couch, and they sat together, neither speaking. Despite the gloom, the morning still came. The sun broke over the tops of the trees and sent rays dancing through the drawing room windows. Heavy footsteps brought Jocelyn's head up. Felix too sat up straighter, though he didn't release her. Father appeared in the doorway. His shirt was wrinkled, his cravat had been pulled out and hung limp around his neck, and the top button was undone. He placed a hand against the door frame and leaned. His eyes were bloodshot and even a little puffy. He looked absolutely haggard. Father lifted a hand. Jocelyn, come here, sweetie. There was a weight to his voice. The same worry that had bit earlier now returned, harder and strong. Papa? He only waved her forward. Lifting her skirt, Jocelyn stood and took a few steps his direction. What would she do once she heard what he had to say? He beckoned again until she was directly next to him. Then he wrapped his arms around her and held her close. Behind her, she heard Felix stand and his footfalls echoed about the room. He seemed to understand and respect her and father's need. Right now for a little space. With a loud sigh, father pulled back and placed a hand on either one of Jocelyn's shoulders. This was it. He opened his mouth to speak. Her fever broke. Jocelyn cried out in shock. Mama's fever was down. She'd been so certain he was here to tell her the end had finally come. There are no guarantees, he continued quickly. But the doctor says this is the best he's seen her the last three months. The doctor has returned home for some much-needed sleep and will check in again before nightfall. She's resting peacefully right now. Jocelyn shook her head, new tears rolling down her cheeks. But beneath them, she knew she was smiling too. May I go up and see her? Jocelyn asked. Hunt took her hand and looped it under his arm. She was asking to speak with you. She's awake. Jocelyn glanced over at Felix. This was more than she'd even hoped for only minutes ago. You, father continued, nodding. And Lord Sutby. Me, sir? Felix was clearly as surprised as she was. Yes, father said, though he didn't move to leave the room. I understand that we have you to thank for getting the doctor here so quickly. He said it as though asking a question. Felix shrugged. 
I only want to be of service. Father eyed him pointedly as well as silently. Jocelyn looked over at her father. What was he thinking just now? Normally she could tell, but at that moment she was completely lost. She looked over at Felix, but he seemed as unsure as she. Very well then, father said. You both had better come with me. Chapter 26 Felix followed just behind Hunt and Jocelyn. It felt strange being led to the family wing of the large estate, while he was certain. Hunt still disliked him so strongly. Felix tried to appear relaxed. He was the son of a marquise, after all, but his stomach was in knots. Mrs. Hunt's room was decorated in elegant creams and light pinks. She was resting in a four-poster bed with white, gauzy curtains drawn about each post. Numerous pillows piled behind her, lifting her head up somewhat, while still allowing her to recline. She didn't move as they walked toward her, but her eyes followed Felix. Her cheeks were shallow and her hands spindly. Clearly her fight with this fever had been long and arduous. Still, her eyes were sharp. It was clear she was fully awake, and fully aware of what was happening in her house. Hunt moved around to a large, well-used armchair on the far side of her bed. Jocelyn stayed next to him. Felix waited for a moment, but when Mrs. Hunt didn't say anything, he decided to start. I am Lord Felix Lockhart, Earl Sutby, and the heir apparent to the Marquis of Ramport. It is an honour to meet you, Mrs. Hunt. She didn't respond, but didn't look away either. Was she too exhausted to speak? Too weak from fighting the infection? Felix was suddenly put to mind of the many times Venetia took ill, and was in bed for several days. She always awoke thirsty. May I pour you a drink, ma'am? He asked. Slowly, she closed her eyes and nodded once. There was a tea service on the bedside table. Felix reached for the teapot. It was cold to the touch. Turning halfway around, Felix called to the maid, adding wood to the hearth. Please have a hot pot of tea brought up for Mrs. Hunt immediately. Yes, your lordship. With a curtsy, the girl left. Felix turned back to Mrs. Hunt. She was still watching him as closely as ever. Her husband often did the same thing, was doing the same thing, watching him closely, taking into account everything he said, every step he took, every comment he uttered. At least with him, Felix knew a bit of where he stood. When it came to Mrs. Hunt, Felix wasn't even sure how much of his and Jocelyn's history she knew. Felix poured some of the cold tea into a cup and held it out to her. The fresh stuff is on its way, but if you prefer not to wait and don't mind it being room temperature, you could have a sip now. Mrs. Hunt blinked, then reached out with an overly thin hand and took the teacup. Her hand shook as she tried to bring it to her mouth. Felix reached out and helped steady the cup. She glowered at him. Felix released the cup and stood up straight, giving her the space she clearly wanted. He wasn't certain, but he thought he heard Jocelyn laugh softly from where she stood near his elbow. Mrs. Hunt lowered the cup down, but didn't reach out to place it back on the tray. You are here to court my daughter. Apparently, the frail woman's husband wasn't the only one who believed in bluntness in this household. Yes, ma'am. I love her and I wish to have her to wife. He heard Jocelyn draw in a deep breath, but she didn't speak. Wait, had he never said so much aloud to her before? Well, there had been that moment in the hothouse when they'd kissed. Now he couldn't recall the exact words. Blast, had he left her all this time, not knowing how he truly felt? He was a cad. He'd have to make up for that bit of folly as soon as he was allowed time alone with her. Many men think they are in love. Many more say they are in love. Few truly are. Huh. What was a man to say about that? He would have thought she'd spoken from bitterness if all of London wasn't fully aware. 
of Hunt's clear adoration for his wife. Still, her statement didn't exactly leave him many options. If he continued to proclaim his love, she'd only ride it off as either infatuation or outright lies. Felix spotted a couple of simple chairs a pace away. Reaching over, he dragged one close to her bed and motioned for Jocelyn to take it. You know, I've learned a bit the past few months, he began, bringing over the second and sitting in it himself. Most of those lessons are thanks to your daughter, and the one he'd learned more than any other was the importance of listening. Tell me, what makes you think that I am either not as in love as I believe, or worse, that I may be lying to you? For a full half hour, Mrs. Hunt questioned and drilled Felix. Sometimes she ranted about the many rakes she'd seen Jocelyn's friends be courted by. Sometimes she pressed him for questions regarding anything from his own childhood to Penelope's preference for strawberry jam over blackberry. Felix did his best to listen and understand. One message he heard more than any other, Mrs. Hunt was scared. She was scared Jocelyn would be used as a political pawn. She was scared Jocelyn would be stuck in a loveless marriage. She was scared no one would care for her daughter when she left. Those were the statements Felix tried his best to respond to. In the end, it really wasn't about Jocelyn's friends, his own childhood, or Penelope's preference for strawberries. Mrs. Hunt was a mother who was concerned for her daughter. Jocelyn spoke up now and then, but much to Felix's surprise, Hunt only listened. Eventually, the story turned towards Felix and Jocelyn's embarrassment in London and little Eli. Jocelyn asked several questions, everything from what the boy had been wearing that day Felix caught him, to which horse was his favourite now. He had a rough go of it at first, Felix recounted. I had hoped that he would see the blessing his punishment was, but he actually tried to run away a couple of times. Why? Jocelyn seemed as surprised as he'd felt. Felix shrugged, the conversation turning more and more to a dialogue, only between the two of them. I don't know. Maybe it was all too new. Maybe he didn't trust the situation to be as good as it is. It was as though both he and Jocelyn were waiting for the right time to once more become who they had been, to speak freely and openly as they did in the hothouse. But like it or not, they still had two grizzly bears watching their every move. But he's still working for you now? Jocelyn asked. Yes, he's calmed down a bit, it seems. The groomsmen say he even shows more than a little aptitude in working with horses. Though Mrs. Hunt was offering fewer and fewer comments, Felix kept a close eye on her. She was looking quite tired, though not too pale. That, at least, was encouraging, especially after the night she'd had. I hope he stays around long enough to make a trade of it. Jocelyn agreed, her gaze following his to her mother. I do as well. If he ever truly decided to disappear... London has far too many young boys running around it for him to ever be found. Mrs. Hunt's eyes were slowly fluttering closed. Felix reached for Jocelyn's hand and mouthed, Should we go? She nodded. As they stood, she kept hold of his hand. Felix tried to keep an eye on Hunt without looking at him directly. If the man was opposed to their show of affection, well, he'd have to order them specifically to stop. Jocelyn wasn't letting go of him, and he certainly had no intention of letting go of her. Hunt stood, his head lowered and face impassive. He turned to the side. Felix assumed he was heading out with him and Jocelyn, when Mrs. Hunt's hand came up quite suddenly and grabbed hold of her husband's arm. Hunt spun back around. Darling, are you all right? Mrs. Hunt kept her eyes closed. Does she love him? Her voice was so soft. Felix wasn't sure he'd heard her correctly. Jocelyn's hand tightened around Felix's. Hunt's voice was equally soft. She believes she does.
Do you not think it so? A pause. Jocelyn and Felix both waited silently. Felix's gaze kept jumping from mother to father and back again. Had he passed Mrs. Hunt's questionnaire then? Finally, Hunt spoke. Yes, I do think she loves him deeply. Is he a gentleman of good standing? Yes. Lud, that was much higher praise than he ever expected to get from Hunt. Honorable? Mrs. Hunt pressed. Hunt seemed more and more reluctant with each answer. Yes. Then you need to give them your blessing, dear. Hunt harumphed. Felix kept his smile under control, but risked a glance at Jocelyn. She, too, was fighting a broad grin. Oh, darling, can you not think of even a single shred of proof that he will treat her well? Mrs. Hunt asked, her eyes still closed. Hunt's gaze moved up and met Felix's. His mouth was pressed into a tight line. Felix could almost see tendons sticking out along the man's neck. With a loud sigh, he returned to watching his wife. <sighs> Sutby knew to ask about Jocelyn's garden. The lilies, specifically. A small smile spread across Mrs. Hunt's face. He'll make her happy. Hunt's mouth moved from one side to the other. I know, I know. He glanced from Felix to his daughter and back to Felix. When he spoke, he clearly was addressing Jocelyn, though he eyed Felix with a sceptical brow. Are you quite sure, my dear, that you want a nincompoop like him? Jocelyn let out a chuckle, and Felix felt himself smile as well. Yes, Papa, I want him with all my heart. That certainly made Felix's smile grow. It made his own chest ignite as well. Hunt only shook his head, but didn't seem too upset this time. You know, we'll probably fight over everything. Jocelyn laughed more. I told you that's how things started between Felix and myself. She turned, facing her father more fully. Give him half a chance, and I promise you'll see what a good gentleman he is. Hunt let out a small huff. It seems I'm not being given much choice in the matter. He pursed his lips and paused. Then, oh, all right, you two have my blessing. Jocelyn squealed and threw her arms around Felix. He held her close. She was his. This fiery, opinionated, gorgeous woman was his. They had Hunt's blessing. They had Ramport's blessing. Soon they would be wed. I promise I'll treat her right, he said over Jocelyn's shoulder. Hunt seemed to be smiling in spite of himself. You two head back down to the south drawing room. I want a minute with Jocelyn's mother. With Jocelyn hanging on his arm, they quickly made their way to the door. Sutby? Hunt's voice held more than a small amount of warning. I'll be joining you both in the southern drawing room very shortly. Felix fully understood Hunt's warning. If he walked in and caught them doing anything untoward, engaged or not, there would be a father's protective hand to answer to. Still, Felix couldn't seem to shrink the large smile on his face. Understood, sir. Together, he and Jocelyn hurried down the steps toward the back of the house. Felix paused partway toward the drawing room. Come with me. They took a right turn and hurried out of a side door. Felix didn't know the grounds well, but he had a general idea of where he wanted to be. The small, white bench, their bench, was easy to find. With an overly elegant wave of his hand, he motioned towards it while bending at the waist. Your seat, my lady. With a laugh, she sat, placing a hand against her collarbone, and pushing her nose up into the air as though she were a monarch. Felix laughed too. Moments ago, nothing seemed right, and now he couldn't tear his eyes away from her smile. Now he had her. Felix dropped to one knee. Jocelyn, dearest, you are the loveliest creature I have ever known. She stilled, 
He reached out and took hold of her hand. Neither of them wore gloves. Not after the harrowing night they'd had. Her hand against his felt amazing. And, oh, so very right. Marry me, my love. He whispered. Of course. Despite me being a future member of Lord's, I wouldn't have it any other way. He slipped up onto the bench next to her. And I'll buy you flowers. No, better yet, I'll build you your own hothouse. Felix pulled Jocelyn up close, this time not resisting the urge to kiss her cheek. You'll have lilies and daisies, then down her neck, then back toward her ear, and foxglove and honeysuckle all year round. And roses? she asked, pulling back just enough that their noses brushed. Even roses. We'll get a cook who prepares everything spicy. Spicy dishes and hubris. But we'll only serve the hubris to our guests. Felix shrugged. They would be expecting nothing less. Most assuredly. And we'll have several cows so that neither of us perspire while we hog the spicy dishes. For ourselves. She laughed, and with her so close... He felt it as much as he heard it. I love you, Jocelyn Hunt. I love you, Felix Lockhart, Earl of Sutby and future Marquis of Ramfort. She blinked and rocked back slightly. Gracious, that's quite a mouthful. And a lovely mouth speaking it too. Felix bent down and kissed her, not tentative as last time, but a deep, full, Enduring kiss. She would be his, and he would be hers. The ton may never understand, but that didn't matter, as though this would only be one of many kisses shared. This was the one he hoped would prove to her how intently he did love her. This was the one that marked the beginning of their forever. Breathless and a little unsteady, they finally pulled away. Now, my love, Felix asked, basking in her smile. I believe we should head back into the drawing room before your father arrives and finds us not there. She nodded. I heard once that you rather like your face the way it is. How about you? He asked. Do you like my face the way it is? Jocelyn placed a hand against his cheek. Yes, I must admit that I most certainly do. Turning his head slightly, he pressed a kiss to her palm and then stood. Hand in hand, they hurried through the garden and back toward the house and toward their future. Epilogue the back door opened, and Lady Cassandra Lockhart quickly moved out of sight behind a large bush. Felix and Jocelyn stepped into the garden. Cassandra tried to still her rapid breathing. Did those two ever spend time together somewhere other than the garden? That had been far too close. If they'd come out of doors merely a moment earlier, she would have been seen. The announcement of their engagement here at Ramport Manor several weeks ago had been uneventful in their eyes, and the eyes of their families. However, it had been life-altering for Cassandra. Now, only a couple of weeks before the wedding, Cassandra's world was hanging by a thread, and almost no one knew. Only Quentin, the youngest of the three Lockhart brothers, was aware just how perilous a situation she was in. Cassandra pressed her hand against her dress pocket, and the several morsels of food inside. If ever word got out what she'd done the night Felix's engagement was announced, nothing would save her from absolute ruin. Jocelyn laughed at something Felix said, the sound carried by a soft summer breeze. Cassandra peered around the corner of a bush. A small, contented thrill coursed through her every time she saw them together. So obviously in love, so obviously happy and well-suited. She was eminently glad that Felix had found someone that fit him so well. Though Cassandra wouldn't have admitted so to anyone but herself, 
The truth was, she hadn't cared much for Jocelyn when they'd first met. But after seeing the way she made Felix laugh and think, and generally be a better man, she couldn't help but love her future sister-in-law. Right now, though, she mostly loved the way neither saw anything, or anyone else, when they were in each other's company. That would play to Cassandra's benefit. She watched them closely as she slipped away from the bush and toward the thin dirt path, neither so much as glanced her way. When she felt certain she was far enough away, she turned and hurried yet faster down the path. The small outbuilding at the end of it had once been a tool shed, but she'd commandeered it nearly six years ago and claimed it as her own space for hanging herbs and drying flowers and the like. Now, though, she was using it to house something far more serious than rosemary or sage. She knocked at the door. No sound came from inside. Southcott, it's me. She opened the door and stepped into the room. Lord Southcott, his stomach still wrapped up in thick bandages from that fateful night, stood, his back pressed up against the wall just to the side of the single window. What are you doing up? She huffed, her blonde curls bouncing. He was never going to get better if he insisted on pushing the limits of what his body could handle. Can't a man stand every now and then? His large form and dark hair and eyes had intimidated her slightly when Felix had first introduced them, at a supper party while in London. Now, though, after seeing him several times a day for two weeks, the intimidation was well past gone. Not when he almost died two weeks ago, Cassandra said. Now lie back down before you pull your stitches open. She turned toward the table across the room from him. He needed to get better and then leave before anyone found him here. She pulled some bread out from her pocket and began spreading a bit of butter across it. From behind her back, Southcott grumbled something unintelligible, and she heard him slide down the wall. She glanced over her shoulder at him. He sat at the base of the wall, his legs stretched out. All the way down, she said. She'd cared for Venetia enough times to know there was a stark difference between sitting down to rest and lying down to rest. He repositioned himself and lay fully down, head on the pillow she'd fashioned for him from a folded blanket. He let out a loud sigh. Cassandra tried to hide her glee at the momentary victory. No doubt he was realizing now he was far more worn out than he'd originally believed. It didn't matter if he was willing to admit it aloud or not. She knew the truth. What's for breakfast? He asked, sounding as grumpy as ever. Breakfast now, noon meal later, then supper after that. And all the while, each and every time she ventured out this way, she risked being found out. More and more guests were showing up every day in preparation for the upcoming wedding. With so many people about... She must be touched in the head to think she could keep Southcott hidden. I don't know how much longer I can do this, she said. Don't feel like playing nursemaid anymore. Her gaze snapped to him, a sudden heat flooding her face. I was almost caught this morning. Do you have any idea what it could mean for me? You aren't the only one hiding at this point. She let out a huff of frustration. She was putting everything on the line. Her reputation, her chances at a good marriage, her entire future. And he thought she was complaining about playing at nursemaid. Insufferable man. She moved toward him, knelt down, and spread a handkerchief out. She fought against the urge to slam the buttered bread and meat down onto it. Southcott pushed himself back up into a seating position. She supposed he couldn't eat lying down. If only she could be sure he was healing, and that this ordeal would all end soon. Sorry I can't provide you with more variety, she said, waving toward the food. There's a lot of things not well suited to being hidden in my dress pockets. He didn't reach for any of the food. Though she didn't look at him, she could tell he was watching her. Thank you, he said. She let out a tired sigh and shrugged. <sighs> Like I said, I'm sorry it's not more. I'm not talking about the food. Reaching forward, he took hold of her hand. 
his bare hand wrapping around her gloved one. His touch simultaneously calmed her frantic nerves, while sending her heart racing. I mean, for all of it, he said. Yes, I do understand what this would mean for you were we caught, which is why we're going to do everything possible to make sure that doesn't happen. He pulled away and picked up a piece of bread. Cassandra's cheeks felt warm, but not from anger as they'd been moments ago. His words were comforting. But could she trust them? He ate and she sat. He was getting better, but he was still far from well enough to travel. And what of the man who'd attacked Southcott in the first place, landing him in Cassandra's care? Would he try again? There were so many ways this could go wrong, so many chances that they would be found out. With the deck stacked against them, what chance did she have that something this big would end well? The End The romance continues with Cassandra's story in A Heart in the Balance. This has been Lily for My Enemy, a Lockhart Sweet Regency romance. Written by Laura Rollins. Narrated by Catherine Vinclair. Copyright 2020 by Laura Rollins. Production copyright by Laura Rollins.